This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Reese. Chapter 16. The day fixed for the trial of Frederick Birchill was wet, dismal, and dreary. The rain pelted intermittently through a hazy, chilly atmosphere, filling the gutters and splashing heavily on the slippery pavements. But in spite of the rain, a long queue, principally of women, assembled outside the portals of the Old Bailey, long before the time fixed for the opening of the court. At the private entrance to the courthouse arrived fashionably dressed ladies, accompanied by well-groomed men. They had received cards of admission and had seats reserved for them in the body of the court. Many of them had personally known the late Sir Horace Fewbanks, and their interest in the trial of the man accused of his murder was intensified by the rumors afloat that there were to be some spicy revelations concerning the dead judge's private life. The arrival of Mr. Justice Hodson, who was to preside at the trial, caused a stir among some of the spectators, many of whom belonged to the criminal class. Sir Henry Hodson had presided at so many murder trials that he was known among them as the hanging judge. Among the spectators were some whom Sir Henry had put into mourning at one time or another. There were others whom he had deprived of their breadwinners for specified periods. These spectators looked at him with curiosity, fear, and hatred. Mr. Holymead, K.C., drove up in a taxicab a few minutes later, and his arrival created an impression akin to admiration. In the eyes of the criminal class, he was an heroic figure who had assumed the responsibility of saving the life of one of their fraternity. The eminent counsel's success in the few criminal cases in which he had consented to appear had gained him the respectful esteem of those who considered themselves oppressed by the law, and the spectators on the pavement might have raised a cheer for him if their exuberance had not been restrained by the proximity of the policeman guarding the entrance. When the court was opened, Inspector Chippenfield took a seat in the body of the court behind the barrister's bench. He ranged his eye over the closely packed spectators in the gallery and shook his head with manifest disapproval. It seemed to him that the worst criminals in London had managed to elude the vigilance of the sergeant outside in order to see the trial of their notorious colleague, Fred Burchill. He pointed out their presence to Rolfe, who was seated alongside him. There's that scoundrel Bob Rogers who slipped through our hands over the Ealing case, and his pal, Breaker Jim, who's just on seven years, looking down and grinning at us, he angrily whispered. I'll give them something to grin about before they're much older. You'd think Breaker would have had enough of the old Bailey to last him a lifetime. And look at that row alongside of them. There's Morris, Hart, Harry the Hooker, and that chap Willis who murdered the pawnbroker in Commercial Road last year. Only we could never sheet it home to him. And two rows behind them is old Charlie, the Covenant Garden drop with Holder Jack and Kemp, Birchill's mate. Why, they're everywhere. The inquest was nothing to this, Rolf. Kent must be thanking his lucky stars he wasn't in that Riversbrook job with Fred Birchill, said Rolf, for they usually work together. And there's Crewe up in the gallery. Where, exclaimed Inspector Chippenfield with an indignant start. Up there behind that pillar there. No, the next one. See, he's looking down at you. Crewe caught the inspector's eye and nodded and smiled in a friendly fashion. But Inspector Chippenfield returned the salutation with a haughty glare. The impudence of that chap is beyond belief, he said to his subordinate. One would have thought he'd have kept away from court after his wild goose chase to Scotland and piling up expenses, but not him. Brazen impudence is the stock and trade of the private detective. If Scotland Yard had a little more of the impudence of the private detective, Rolf, we should be better appreciated. I suppose he's come in the hopes of seeing the jury acquit Birchill, said Rolf. No doubt, replied Inspector Chippenfield, but he's come to the wrong shop. A good jury should convict without leaving the box if the case is properly put before them by the prosecution. 
Crewe would like to triumph over us, but it is our turn to win. But Inspector Chippenfield was wrong in thinking that Crewe's presence in court was due to a desire for the humiliation of his rivals. Crewe had spent most of the previous night reading and revising his summaries and notes of the Riversbrook case, and in minutely reviewing his investigations of it. Over several pipes in the early morning hours, he pondered long and deeply on the secret of Sir Horace Fewbanks's murder, without finding a solution which satisfactorily accounted for all the strange features of the case. But one thing he felt sure of was that Birchill had not committed the murder. He based that belief partly on the butler's confession and partly on his own discoveries. He believed Hill to be a cunning scoundrel who had overreached the police for some purpose of his own by accusing Birchill, and who, to make his story more probable, had even implicated himself in the supposed burglary as a terrorized accomplice. And Crewe had been unable to test the butler's story or to find out what game he was playing because of the assiduity with which the principal witness for the prosecution had been nursed by the police from the moment he made his confession. Crewe bit hard into his amber mouthpiece in vexation as he recalled the ostrich-like tactics of Inspector Chippenfield who, having accepted Hill's story as genuine, had officially balked all his efforts to see the man and question him about it. He had come to court with the object of witnessing Birchill's behavior in the dock and the efforts of any of his criminal friends to communicate with him. As a man who had had considerable experience in criminal trials, he knew the irresistible desire of the criminal in the gallery of the court to encourage the man in the dock to keep up his courage. Communications of this kind had to be made by signs. It was Crewe's impression that by watching Birchill in the dock and Birchill's friends in the gallery, he might pick up a valuable hint or two. It was also his intention to study closely the defense which counsel for the prisoner intended to put forward. It was therefore with a feeling of mingled annoyance and surprise that Crewe, looking down from his point of vantage at the bevy of fashionably dressed ladies in the body of the court, recognized Mrs. Holymead, Mademoiselle Chiron, and Miss Fewbank seated side by side, engaged in earnest conversation. Before he could withdraw from their view behind the pillar in front of him, Miss Fewbanks looked up and saw him. She bowed to him in a friendly recognition, and Crewe saw her whisper to Mrs. Holymead, who glanced quickly in his direction and then as quickly averted her gaze. But in that fleeting glance of her beautiful dark eyes, Crewe detected an expression of fear, as though she dreaded his presence. And, he noted, that she shivered slightly as she turned to resume her conversation with Miss Fewbanks. His Honor, Mr. Justice Hodson, entered, and the persons in the court scrambled hurriedly to their feet to pay their tribute of respect to British law, as exemplified in the person of a stout, red-faced old gentleman, wearing a scarlet gown and black sash, and attended by four of the sheriffs of London in their fur-trimmed robes. The judge bowed in response and took his seat. The spectators resumed theirs, craning their necks eagerly to look at the accused man, Birchill, who was brought into the dock by two warders. The work of impaneling a jury commenced, and when it was completed, Mr. Walters, K.C., opened the case for the prosecution. Mr. Walters was a long-winded counsel who had detested the late Mr. Justice Fewbanks because of the latter's habit of interrupting the addresses of counsel with the object of inducing them to curtail their remarks. This practice was not only annoying to counsel, who necessarily knew better than the judge what the jury ought to be told, but it also tended to hold counsel up to ridicule in the eyes of ignorant jurymen as a man who could not do his work properly without the watchful correction of the judge. But Mr. Walters, whose legal training had imbued him in a respect for Latin tags, subscribed to the adage, De mortuus nil nisi bonum. Therefore he began his address to the jury with a glowing reference to the loss, he might almost say the irreparable loss, which the judiciary had sustained. He would go so far as to say the loss which the nation had sustained by the death, the violent death, in short, the murder of an eminent judge of the high court bench, 
whose clear and vigorous intellect, whose marvelous mastery of the legal principles laid down by the judicial giants of the past, whose inexhaustible knowledge drawn from the storehouses of British law, whose virile interpretations of the principles of British justice, whose unfailing courtesy and consideration to counsel, the memory of which would long be cherished by those who had had the privilege of pleading before him, had made him an acquisition and an ornament to a bench which in the eyes of the nation had always represented, and at no time more than the present, at this point Mr. Walters bowed to the presiding judge, the embodiment of legal knowledge, legal experience, and legal wisdom. After this tribute to the murdered man and the presiding judge, Mr. Walters proceeded to lay the facts of the crime before the jury, who had read all about them in the newspapers. With methodical care he built up the case against the accused man, classifying the points of evidence against him in categorical order for the benefit of the jury. The most important witness for the prosecution was a man known as James Hill, who had been in Sir Horace Fewbanks's employ as a butler. Hill's connection with the prisoner was in some aspects unfortunate for himself, and no doubt counsel for the defense would endeavor to discredit his evidence on that account. But the jury, when they heard the butler tell his story in the witness box, would have little difficulty in coming to the conclusion that the man Hill was the victim of circumstances and his own weakness of temperament. However much they might be disposed to blame him for the course he had pursued, he was innocent of all complicity in his master's death, and had done his best to help the ends of justice by coming forward with a voluntary confession to the police. Mr. Walters made no attempt to conceal or extenuate the black page in Hill's past, but he asked the jury to believe that Hill had bitterly repented of his former crime, and would have continued to lead an honest life as Sir Horace Fewbanks's butler, if ill fate had not forged a cruel chain of circumstances to link him to his past life, and drag him down by bringing him in contact with the accused man Birchill, whom he had met in prison. Sir Horace Fewbanks was the self-appointed guardian of a young woman named Doris Fanning, the daughter of a former employee on his country estate, who had died leaving her penniless. Sir Horace had deemed it his duty to bring up the girl and give her a start in life. After educating her in a style suitable to her station, he sent her to London and paid for music lessons for her in order to fit her for a musical career, for which she showed some aptitude. Unfortunately, the young woman had a self-willed and unbalanced temperament, and she gave her benefactor much trouble. Sir Horace bore patiently with her until she made the chance acquaintance of Birchill, and became instantly fascinated by him. The acquaintance speedily drifted into intimacy, and the girl became the pliant tool of Birchill, who acquired an almost magnetic influence over her. As the intimacy progressed, she seemed to have become a willing partner in his criminal schemes. When Sir Horace Fewbanks heard that the girl had drifted into an association with a criminal like Birchill, he endeavored to save her from her folly by remonstrating with her, and the girl promised to give up Birchill, but did not do so. When Sir Horace found out that he was being deceived, he was compelled to renounce her. Birchill, who had been living on the girl, was furious with anger when he learnt that Sir Horace had cut off the monetary allowance he had been making her, and on discovering by some means that his former prison associate, Hill, was now the butler, at Sir Horace Fewbanks' house, he planned his revenge. He sent the girl Fanning to Riversbrook with a message to Hill, directing him, under threat of exposure, to see him at the Westminster flat. Hill, who dreaded nothing so much as an exposure of that past life of his, which he hoped was a secret between his master and himself, kept the appointment. Birchill told him he intended to rob the judge's house in order to revenge himself, on Sir Horace for cutting off the girl's allowance, and he asked Hill to assist him in carrying out the burglary. Hill strenuously demurred at first, but weakly allowed himself to be terrorized in to compliance under Birchill's threats of exposure. 
Hill's participation in the crime was to be confined to preparing a plan of Riversbrook as a guide for Birchill. Birchill said nothing about murder at the time, but there is no doubt he contemplated violence when he first spoke to Hill. When Hill, alarmed by his master's return on the actual night for which the burglary had been arranged, hurried across to the flat to urge Birchill to abandon the contemplated burglary. Birchill obstinately decided to carry out the crime and left the flat with a revolver in his hand, threatening to murder Sir Horace if he found him, because of his harsh treatment, as he termed it, of the girl Fanning. Birchill left the flat at nine o'clock, continued Mr. Walters, who had now reached the vital facts of the night of the murder. I asked the jury to take careful note of the time and the subsequent times mentioned, for they have an important bearing on the circumstantial evidence against the accused man. He returned, according to Hill's evidence, shortly after midnight. Evidence will be called to show that Birch Hill, or a man answering his description, boarded a tram car at Euston Road at 9.30 p.m. and journeyed in it to Hampstead. He was observed both at Euston Road and the Hampstead Terminus by the conductor, because of his obvious desire to avoid attention. There were only two other passengers on the top of the car when it left Euston Road. The conductor directed the attention of the driver to his movements, and they both watched him till he disappeared in the direction of the heath. In fairness to the prisoner, it is necessary to point out, however, that neither the conductor nor the driver can identify him positively as the man they had seen on their car that night but both will swear that, to the best of their belief, Birchill is the man. Assuming that it was the prisoner who traveled to Hampstead by the Euston Road tram, a route he would probably prefer because it took him to Hampstead by the most unfrequented way, he would have a distance of nearly a mile to walk across Hampstead Heath to Tanton Gardens, where Sir Horace Fewbanks' house was situated. The evidence of the tram man is that he set off across the heath at a very rapid rate. The tram reached Hampstead at four minutes past ten, so that, by walking fast, it would be possible for a young, energetic man to reach Riversbrook before a quarter to eleven. Another five minutes would see an experienced housebreaker like Birchill inside the house. At twenty minutes past eleven, a young man named Ryder, who had wandered into Tanton Gardens while endeavoring to take a shortcut home, heard the sound of a report, which at the time he took to be the noise of a door violently slammed, coming from the direction of Riversbrook. A few moments afterwards he saw a man climb over the front fence of Riversbrook to the street. He drew back cautiously into the shade of one of the chestnut trees of the street avenue and saw the man plainly as he ran past him. Ryder will swear that that man he saw was Birchill. It's a lie, it's a lie. You're trying to hang him, you wicked man. Oh, Fred, Fred. The cry proceeded from the girl Doris Fanning. Her unbalanced temperament had been unable to bear the strain of sitting there and listening to Mr. Walter's cold, inexorable construction of a legal chain of evidence against her lover. She rose to her feet, shrieking wildly and gesticulating menacingly at Mr. Walter's. The society ladies turned eagerly in their seats to take in through their lorgnon every detail of the interruption. Remove that woman, the judge sternly commanded. Several policemen hastened to her, and the girl was partially hustled and partially carried out of the court, shrieking as she went. When the commotion caused by the scene subsided, the judge irritably requested to be informed who the woman was. I don't know, my lord, replied Mr. Walters. Perhaps. He stopped and bent over to Detective Rolfe, who was pulling at his gown. Er, uh, yes, I'm informed by Detective Rolfe of Scotland Yard, my lord, that the young woman is a witness in the case. Then why was she permitted to remain in court? asked Sir Henry Hodson angrily. It is a piece of gross carelessness. I do not know, my lord. I was unaware she was a witness until this moment, returned Mr. Walters with a discreet glance in the direction of Detective Rolfe, as an indication to his honor that the judicial storm might safely veer in that direction. Sir Henry took the hint and administered such a stinging rebuke to Detective Rolfe 
that that officer's face took on a much redder tint before it was concluded. Then the judge motioned to Mr. Walters to resume the case. Counsel, with his index finger still in the place in his brief where he had been interrupted, rose to his feet again and turned to the jury. Burchill returned to the flat at Westminster shortly after midnight, he continued. Hill had been compelled by Burchill's threats to remain at the flat with the girl while Burchill visited Riversbrook, and the first thing Burchill told him on his return was that he had found Sir Horace Fewbanks dead in his house when he entered it. On his way back from committing the crime, belated caution had probably dictated to Burchill the wisdom of endeavoring to counteract his previous threat to murder Sir Horace Fewbanks. He probably remembered that Hill, who had heard the threat, was an unwilling participator in the plan for the burglary, and might therefore denounce him to the police for the greater crime if he, Burchill, admitted that he had committed it. In order to guard against this contingency, still further Burchill forced Hill to join in writing a letter to Scotland Yard, acquainting him with the murder and the fact that the body was lying in the empty house. Burchill's object in acting thus was a twofold one. He dared not trust Hill to pretend to discover the body the next day and give information to the police for fear he should not be able to retain sufficient control of himself to convince the detectives that he was wholly ignorant of the crime, and he also thought that if Hill had a share in writing the letter, he would feel an additional complicity in the crime and keep silence for his own sake. Burchill was right in his calculations, up to a point. Hill was, at first, too frightened to disclose what he knew. But as time went on, his affection for his murder master and his desire to bring the murderer to justice overcame his feelings of fear for his own share in bringing about the crime. And he went and confessed everything to the police, regardless of the consequences that might recoil upon his own head. The case against Birchill depends largely on Hill's evidence, and the jury, when they have heard his story in the witness box, and bearing in mind the extenuating circumstances of his connection with the crime, will have little hesitation in coming to the conclusion that the prisoner in the dock murdered Sir Horace Fewbanks. The first witness called was Inspector Selden, who gave evidence as to his visit to Riversbrook shortly before 1 p.m. on the 19th of August, as a result of information received, and his discovery of the dead body of Sir Horace Fewbanks. He described the room in which the body was found, the position of the body, and he identified the blood-stained clothes produced by the prosecution as being those in which the dead man was dressed when the body was discovered. In cross-examination by Holymead, he stated that Sir Horace Fewbanks was fully dressed when the body was found. The witness also stated in cross-examination that none of the electric lights in the house were burning when the body was discovered. The next witness was Dr. Slingsby, the pathological expert from the home office who had made the post-mortem examination, and who was much too great a man to be kept waiting while other witnesses of more importance to the case, but of less personal consequence, went into the box. Dr. Slingsby stated that his examinations had revealed that the death had been caused by a bullet wound which had penetrated the left lung causing internal hemorrhage. Mr. Finnis, the junior counsel for the defense, suggested to the witness that the wound might have been self-inflicted, but Dr. Slingsby permitted himself to be positive that such was not the case. With professional caution, he assured Mr. Finnis, who briefly cross-examined him, that it was impossible for him to state how long Sir Horace Fewbanks had been dead. Rigor mortis in the case of the human body set in from eight to ten hours after death, and it was between three and four o'clock in the afternoon of the day the crime was discovered that he first saw the corpse. The body was quite stiff and cold then. Is it not possible for death to have taken place nineteen or twenty hours before you saw the body? asked Mr. Finnis eagerly. Quite possible, replied Dr. Slingsby. Is it not also possible from the state of the body when you examined it that death took place within sixteen hours of your examination of the body, asked Mr. Walters, 
as Mr. Finnis sat down with the air of a man who had elicited an important point. Quite possible, replied Dr. Slingsby, with the prim air of a professional man who valued his reputation too highly to risk it by committing himself to anything definite. Dr. Slingsby was allowed to leave the box, and Inspector Chippenfield took his place. Inspector Chippenfield did not display any professional reticence about giving his evidence, at least not on the surface, though he by no means took the court completely into his confidence as to all that had passed between him and Hill. On the other hand, he told the judge and jury everything that his professional experience prompted him as necessary and proper for them to know in order to bring about a conviction. In the course of his evidence, he made several attempts to introduce damaging facts as to Birchill's past, but Mr. Holymead protested to the judge. Counsel for the defense protested that he had allowed his learned friend in opening the case a great deal of latitude as to the relations which had previously existed between the witness Hill and the prisoner, because the defense did not intend to attempt to hide the fact that the prisoner had a criminal record, but he had no intention of allowing a police witness to introduce irrelevant matter in order to prejudice the jury against the prisoner. His honor told the witness to confine himself to answering the questions put to him and not to volunteer information. After this rebuke, Inspector Chippenfield resumed giving evidence. He related what Birch Hill had said when arrested and declared that he was positive that the footprints found outside the kitchen window were made by the boots produced in court, which Birch Hill had been wearing at the time he was arrested. He produced a jemmy which he had found at Fanning's flat and said that it fitted the marks on the window at Riversbrook, which had been forced on the night of the 18th of August. Inspector Chippenfield's evidence was followed by that of the two tramway employees who declared that, to the best of their belief, Birch Hill was the man who boarded their tram at half-past nine on the night of the 18th of August and rode to the terminus at Hampstead, which they reached at 10.04 p.m. Both the witnesses showed a very proper respect for the law and were obviously relieved when the brief cross-examination was over, and they were free to go back to their tram car. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Hampstead Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur Rees Chapter 17 James Hill, called the court crier. The butler stepped forward, mounted the witness stand, and bowed his head deferentially towards the judge. He was neatly dressed in black, and his sandy grey hair was carefully brushed. His face was as expressionless as ever, but a slight oscillation of the court Bible in his right hand as he was sworn indicated that his nerves were not so calm as he strove to appear. He looked neither to the right nor left, but kept his glance downcast. Only once, as he stood there waiting to be questioned, did he cast a furtive look towards the man whose life hung on his evidence. But the malevolent, vindictive gaze Birchill shot back at him caused him to lower his eyelids instantly. Hill commenced his evidence in a voice so low that Mr. Walters stopped him at the outset and asked him to speak in a louder tone. It soon became apparent that his evidence was making a deep impression on the court. Sir Henry Hodson listened to him intently and watched him keenly 
as Hill, with impassive countenance and smooth, even tones, told his strange story of the night of the murder. When he had drawn to a conclusion, he gave another furtive glance at the dock, but Birchill was seated with his head bowed down, as though tired and with one hand supporting his face. Mr. Walters methodically folded up his brief and sat down with a sidelong glance in the direction of Mr. Holymead as he did so. Every eye in court was turned on Holymead as the great K.C. settled his gown on his shoulders and got up to cross-examine the principal crown witness. His cross-examination was the admiration of those spectators whose sympathizers were on the side of the man in the dock as one of themselves. Hill was cross-examined as to the lapse from honesty which had sent him to jail, and he was reluctantly forced to admit that so far from the theft being the result of an impulse to save his wife and child from starvation, as the counsel for the prosecution had indicated, it was the result of the impulse of cupidity. He had robbed a master who had trusted him and had treated him with kindness. Having extracted this fact in spite of Hill's evasion and twistings, Holymead straightened himself to his full height, and shaking a warning finger at the witness, said, "'I put it to you, witness, that the reason Sir Horace Fewbanks engaged you as a butler in his household at Riversbrook was because he knew you to be a man of few scruples, who would be willing to do things that a more upright, honest man would have objected to. That is not true, replied Hill. Is it not true that your late master frequently entertained women of doubtful character at Riversbrook? thundered the K.C. Hill gasped at the question. When he had first heard that his late master's old friend, Mr. Holymead, was to appear for Birchill, he had immediately come to the conclusion that Mr. Holymead was taking up the case in order to save Sir Horace's name from exposure by dealing carefully with his private life at Riversbrook. But here he was ruthlessly tearing aside the veil of secrecy. Hill hesitated. He glanced round the curious crowded court and saw the eager glances of the women as they impatiently awaited his reply. He hesitated so long that Holymead repeated the question. "'Women of a doubtful character?' faltered the witness. "'I do not understand you.' "'You understand me perfectly well, Hill. I do not mean women off the streets, but women who have no moral reputation to maintain.' women who do not mind letting confidential servants see that they have no regard for the conventional standard of life i mean witness that your late master frequently entertained at riversbrook women i will not call them ladies who were not particular at what hour they went home sometimes one or more of them stayed all night and you were entrusted with the confidential task of smuggling them out of the house without other servants knowing of their presence. Is not that so? I, I, answer the question without equivocation, witness. Yes, sir. There was a slight stir in the body of the court, due to the fact that Miss Fewbanks and Mrs. Holymead had risen and were making their way to the door. The fashionably dressed women in the court stared with much interest at the daughter of the murdered man, whom most of them knew in order to see how she was taking the disclosures about her dead father's private life. "'And sometimes there were quarrels between your late master and these visitors,' "'Were they not?' continued Holymead. "'Quarrels, sir? "'Surely you know that under the influence of wine "'some people become quarrelsome.' "'Yes, sir. "'Well, did your late master's nocturnal visitors "'ever become quarrelsome?' "'Sometimes, sir.' 
in the exercise of your confidential duties did you sometimes see quarrelsome ladies off the premises sometimes sir and it was no uncommon thing for them to say things to you about your master eh sometimes they didn't care what they said quite so commented counsel dryly they indulged in threats not all of them replied hill who at length saw where the cross-examination was tending i do not suggest that all of them did only that the more violent of them did so quite so sir so we may take it that the quarrel between your late master and miss fanning was not the only quarrel of the kind which came under your notice there were not many others said hill it was not the only one persisted counsel no sir in your evidence in chief you said nothing about miss fanning using threats against your master when you were showing her out no sir she did not use any not in my hearing sir there was a pause at this stage while mr holymead consulted the notes he had made of mr walter's cross-examination of the witness what o'clock was it when you left riversbrook on the eighteenth of august after your master's return from scotland about half past seven sir and what time did sir horace arrive home about seven o'clock sir what were you doing between seven and seven thirty i unpacked his bags and got his bedroom ready i took him some refreshment up to the library and he told you he wouldn't want you again until the following night about eight o'clock yes sir he said he thought he would be going back to scotland by the night express and i was to get his bag packed and lock up the house you told counsel for the prosecution in the course of your evidence that you were afraid of birchill continued holymead yes sir were you afraid of physical violence from him or only that he would expose your past to the other servants i was afraid of him both ways said hill was it because of this fear that you made out for him a plan of riversbrook to assist him in the burglary yes sir when did you make out this plan the day after sir horace left for scotland was that on your first visit to miss fanning's flat in westminster after the prisoner had sent her to riversbrook to tell you that he wanted to see you yes sir did birchill stand over you while you made out this plan yes sir would you know the plan again if you saw it yes sir mr finnis who had been hiding the plan under the papers before him handed a document up to his chief mr holymead unfolded it and with a brief glance at it handed it up to the witness is that the plan he asked hill was somewhat taken aback at the production of the plan it was drawn in ink on a white sheet of paper of foolscap size with a slightly bluish tint the paper was by no means clean for birchill had carried it about in his pocket the witness reluctantly admitted that the plan was the one he had given to Birchill. To his manifest relief, counsel asked no further questions about it. In a low tone, Mr. Holymead formally expressed his intention to put the plan in as evidence. He handed it to Mr. Walters, who, after a close inspection of it, passed it along to the judge's associate for his honour's inspection. The rest of Hill's cross-examination concerned what happened at the flat on the night of the burglary. He adhered to the story he had told, and could not be shaken in the main points of it. 
but mr holymead made some effective use of the discrepancy between the witness's evidence at the inquest as to his movements on the night of the murder and his evidence in court he elicited the fact that the police had discovered his evidence at the inquest was false and had forced him to make a confession by threatening to arrest him for the murder Mr. Holymead signified that he had nothing further to ask the witness, and Mr. Walters called his last witness, a young man named Charles Ryder, a resident of Liverpool, who had spent a week's holiday in London from the 14th to the 21st of August. Ryder had stayed with some friends at Hampstead, and when making his way home on the night of the 18th of August, had walked down Tanton Gardens in the belief that he was taking a shortcut. The time was about 11.20. He saw a man running towards him along the footpath from the direction of Riversbrook. He caught a good glimpse of the man who seemed to be very excited. He was sure the prisoner was the man he had seen. In cross-examination by Mr. Holymead, he was far less positive in his identification of the prisoner, and finally admitted that the man he saw that night might be somebody else who resembled the prisoner in build. End of chapter 17 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 18 of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees. Chapter 18. The second day of the trial began promptly when Mr. Justice Hodson took his seat. Mr. Holymead's opening statement to the jury was brief. He reminded them that the life of a fellow creature rested on their verdict. If there was any doubt in their minds whether the prisoner had fired the shot which killed Sir Horace Fewbanks, the prisoner was entitled to a verdict of not guilty. It was obligatory on the prosecution to prove guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. He submitted that the prosecution had not established their case. After hearing the case for the prosecution, the jury must have grave doubts as to the guilt of the prisoner, and it was his duty as counsel for the prisoner to put before the jury facts which would not only increase their doubts, but bring them to the positive conclusion that the prisoner was not guilty. He was not going to attempt to deny that the prisoner went to Riversbrook on the night of the murder. He went there to commit a burglary. But so far from Hill being terrorized into complicity in that crime, it was he who had first suggested it to Birchall, and had arranged it. Material evidence on that point would be submitted to the jury. Hill was a man who was incapable of gratitude. His disposition was to bite the hand that fed him. After being well treated by Sir Horace Fewbanks, he had made up his mind to rob him as he had robbed his former master, Lord Melhurst. He knew that Sir Horace had quarrelled with this girl Fanning because of her association with Birchill, and he went to Birchill and put before him a proposal to rob Riversbrook. Birchill consented to the plan, and when on the night of the 18th of August he broke into the house, he found the murdered body of Sir Horace in the library. That was the full extent of the prisoner's connection with the crime. To the superficial and suspicious mind, it might seem an improbable story, but to an earnest mind it was a story that carried conviction because of its simple straightforwardness, its crudity, if the jury liked to call it that. It lacked the subtlety and the finish of concocted story. The murder took place before Birchill reached Riversbrook on his burglarious errand. It is my place, added Mr. Holymead, in concluding his address, to convince you that my client is not guilty, 
or, in other words, to convince you that the murder was committed before he reached the house. It is only with the greatest reluctance that I take upon myself the responsibility of pointing an accusing finger at another man. In crimes of this kind you cannot expect to get anything but circumstantial evidence. But there are degrees of circumstantial evidence, and my duty to my client lays upon me the obligation of pointing out to you that there is one person against whom the existing circumstantial evidence is stronger than it is against my client. Crewe, who had secured his former place in the gallery of the court, looked down on the speaker. He had carefully followed every word of Holymead's address, but the concluding portion almost electrified him. He flattered himself that he was the only person in court who understood the full significance of the sonorous sentences with which the famous K.C. concluded his address to the jury. As his eyes wandered over the body of the court below, Crewe saw that Mrs. Holomide and Mademoiselle Chiron were sitting in one of the back seats, but that they were not accompanied by Miss Fewbanks. It was evident to him by the way in which Mrs. Holomead followed the proceedings, that her interest in the case was something far deeper than wifely interest in her husband's connection with it as counsel for the defence. Leaning forward in her seat, with her hands clasped in her lap, she listened eagerly to every word. During the day his gaze went back to her at intervals, and on several occasions he became aware that she had been watching him while he watched her husband. The first witness for the defence was Doris Fanning. The drift of her evidence was to exonerate the prisoner at the expense of Hill. She declared that she had not gone to Riversbrook to see Hill after the final quarrel with Sir Horace. Hill had come to her flat in Westminster of his own accord and had asked for Birchill. She went out of the room while they discussed their business, but after Hill had gone, Birchill told her that Hill had put up a job for him at Riversbrook. Birchill showed her the plan of Riversbrook that Hill had made, and asked her if it was correct, as far as she knew. Yes, she was sure she would know the plan again, if she saw it. The judge's associate handed it to Mr. Holymead, who passed it to the witness. Is this it? he asked. Yes, she replied emphatically, almost without inspecting it. I want you to look at it closely, said counsel. When Birchill showed you the plan immediately after Hill's departure, what impression did you get regarding it? She looked at him blankly. I don't understand you, she said. You can tell the difference between ink that has been newly used and ink that has been on the paper some days. Was the ink fresh? No, it was old ink, she said. How do you know that? Because ink doesn't go black till a long while after it is written. At least the letters I write don't. She shot a veiled, conquetish glance at the big K.C. from under her long eyelashes. The K.C. returned the glance with a genial smile. "'What do you write your letters on, Miss Fanning?' She almost giggled at the question. "'I use a writing tablet,' she replied. "'Ruled or unruled?' "'Ruled.' I couldn't write straight if there weren't lines, she smiled again. And what color do you affect? Gray, rose, pink, or white paper? Always white. Is that all the paper you have at your flat for writing purposes? Yes. Then what did Birchill write on when he wanted to write a letter? He used mine. Are you sure of that? Yes, when he wanted to write a letter, he used to ask me for my tablet, and an envelope, and generally he used to borrow a stamp as well. She pouted slightly, with another coquettish glance. Look at that plan again, said the K.C. Have you ever had paper like it at your flat? She shook her head. Never. 
Have you ever seen paper of that kind in Birchill's possession before he showed you the plan? Never. When he showed you the plan, had the paper been folded? Yes. The K.C. took the witness, now very much at her ease, to the night of the murder. She denied strenuously that Hill tried to dissuade Birchill from carrying out the burglary because Sir Horace Fewbanks had returned unexpectedly from Scotland. It was Birchill who suggested postponing the burglary until Sir Horace left, but Hill urged that the original plan should be adhered to. He declared that Sir Horace would remain at home at least a fortnight, and perhaps longer. His master was a sound sleeper, he said, and if Birchill waited until he went to bed, there would be no danger of awakening him. She contradicted many details of Hill's evidence as to what took place when the prisoner returned from breaking into Riversbrook. It was untrue, she said, that there was a spot of blood on Birchill's face, or that his hands were smeared with blood. He was a little bit excited when he returned, but after one glass of whisky he spoke quite calmly of what had happened. The next witness was a representative of the firm of Holmes and Jackson, paper makers, who was handed the plan of Riversbrook, which Hill had drawn. He stated that the paper on which the plan was drawn was manufactured by his firm and supplied to His Majesty's stationery office. He identified it by the quality of the paper and the watermark. In reply to Mr. Walters, the witness was sure that the paper he held in his hand had been manufactured by his firm for the government. It was impossible for him to be mistaken. Other firms might manufacture paper of a somewhat similar quality and tint but it would not be exactly similar. Besides, he identified it by his firm's watermark, and he held the plan up to the light and pointed it out to the court. Counsel for the defense called two more witnesses on this point, one to prove that supplies of the paper on which the plan was drawn were issued to legal departments of the government, and an elderly man named Cobb, Sir Horace Fewbanks' former tipstaff, who stated that he took some of the paper in question to Riversbrook on Sir Horace's instructions. And then, to the astonishment of junior members of the bar who were in court watching his conduct of the case in order to see if they could pick up a few hints, he intimidated that his case was closed. It seemed to them that the great K.C. had put up a very flimsy case for the defence, and that, in spite of the fact, that the prosecutor's case rested mainly on the evidence of a tainted witness, Holymead would be very hard put to it to get his man off. "'Isn't my learned friend going to call the prisoner?' suggested Mr. Walters, with a cunning design of giving the jury something to think of when they were listening to his learned friend's address. "'It's scarcely necessary,' said Mr. Holymead, who saw the trap and replied in a tone which indicated that the matter was not worth a moment's consideration. He began his address to the jury by emphasizing the fact that a fellow creature's life depended on the result of their deliberations. The duty that rested upon them of saying whether the prosecution had established beyond all reasonable doubt that the prisoner shot Sir Horace Fewbanks was a solemn and impressive one. He asked them to consider the case carefully, in all its bearings. He could not claim for his client that he was a man of spotless reputation. The prisoner belonged to a class who earned their living by warring against society. But that fact did not make him a murderer. On what did the case for the prosecution rest? On the evidence of Hill and three other witnesses who, on the night of the murder, had seen a man somewhat resembling the prisoner in the vicinity of Riversbrook, or making towards the vicinity of that house. But so far from wishing to emphasize the weakness of identification, he admitted that the prisoner went to Riversbrook with the intention of committing a burglary. We admit that he went there the night Sir Horace Fewbanks returned from Scotland, he continued. Counsel for the prosecution will make the most of those admissions in the course of his address to you. 
but the point to which i wish to direct your attention is that we make this damaging admission so that you may decide between the prisoner and the man who led him into a trap by instigating the burglary now we come to the evidence of hill I know you will not convict a man of murder on the unsupported evidence of a fellow criminal, but I want to point out to you that even if Hill's evidence were true in every detail, even if Hill had not swerved one iota from the truth, there is nothing in his evidence to lead to the positive conclusion that the prisoner murdered Hill's master, Sir Horace Fewbanks. What does Hill's evidence against the prisoner amount to? Let us accept it for the moment as absolutely true. Later on I will show you plainly that the man is a liar, that he is a cunning scoundrel, and that his evidence is utterly unreliable. But accepting for the moment his evidence as true, the case against the prisoner amounts to this. By threats of exposure, Birchill compelled Hill to consent to Riversbrook being robbed while the owner was in Scotland. Hill's complicity, according to his own story, extend only to supplying a plan of the house and giving Birchill some information as to where various articles of values would be found. On the 18th of August, Hill went to Riversbrook to see that everything was in order for the burglary that night. While he was there, his master returned unexpectedly. Hill then went to the flat in Westminster and told Birchill that Sir Horace had returned. His own story is that he tried to get Birchill to abandon the idea of the burglary, but that Birchill, who had been drinking, swore that he would carry out the plan, and that if he came across Sir Horace, he would shoot him. What grudge had Birchill against Sir Horace Fewbanks? The fact that Sir Horace had discarded the woman Fanning because of her association with Birchill. Gentlemen, does a man commit a murder for a thing of that kind? Let us test the credibility of the man who has tried to swear away the life of the prisoner. You saw him in the witness box, and I have no doubt formed your own conclusion as to the type of man he is. Did he strike you as a man who would stand by the truth above all things, or a man who would lie persistently in order to save his own skin? That the man cannot be believed even when on his oath has been publicly demonstrated in the courts of the land. The story he told the court yesterday in the witness box of his movements of the day of the murder is quite different to the story he told on his oath at the inquest on the body of Sir Horace Fewbanks. Let me read to you the evidence he gave at the inquest. Mr. Finnis handed to his leader a copy of Hill's evidence at the inquest, and Mr. Holymead read it out to the jury. He then read out a shorthand writer's account of Hill's evidence on the previous day. Which of these accounts are we to believe? he said, turning to the jury. The latter one, the prosecution says, but why, I ask, because it tallies with the statement exhorted from Hill by the police under the threat of charging him with a murder. Does that make it more credible? Is a man like Hill, who is placed in that position, likely to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? It is an insult to the jury, as men of intelligence, to ask you to believe Hill's evidence. I do not ask you to believe the story he told at the inquest in preference to the story he told here in the witness box yesterday. I ask you to regard both stories as the evidence of a man who is too deeply implicated in this crime to be able to speak the truth. I will prove to you, gentlemen of the jury, that the man is a criminal by instinct and a liar by necessity. The necessity of saving his own skin. He robbed his former master, Lord Melhurst, and he planned to rob his late master, Sir Horace Fewbanks. But knowing that his former crime would be brought against him when the police came to investigate a robbery at Riversbrook, he was too cunning to rob Riversbrook himself. He looked about him for an accomplice, and he selected Birchill. You heard him say in the witness box that he drew Birchill a plan of Riversbrook. 
the plan I now hold in my hand. I will ask you to inspect the plan closely. Hill told us that Birchill terrorized him into drawing this plan by threats of exposure. Exposure of what? His master, Sir Horace Fewbanks, knew he had been in jail, so what had he to fear from exposure? His proper course, if he were an honest man, would have been to tell his master that Birchill was planning to rob the house and had endeavoured to draw him into the crime. But he did nothing of the kind, for the simple reason that the plan to rob Riversbrook was his own, and not Birchill's. Now, gentlemen, you have all seen the plan which this tainted witness declares was drawn by him because Birchill terrorized him and stood over him while he drew it. Is there anything in that plan to suggest that it was drawn by a man in a state of a nervous terror? Why, the lines are as firmly drawn as if they had been made by an architect working at his leisure in his office. Was this plan drawn by a man in a state of nervous terror, with his tormentor standing threateningly over him, or was it drawn by a man working at leisure, free not only from terror, but from interruption? The answer to that question is supplied in the evidence given by three witnesses as to the paper used. Hill says the plan was drawn at the flat. Two other witnesses swore that it was paper supplied exclusively for government departments, and another witness swore that he had taken such paper to Riversbrook for the use of Sir Horace Fewbanks, who, like every one of His Majesty's judges, found it necessary to do some of his judicial work at home. What is the inevitable inference? I ask you if you can have any doubt after looking at that plan and after hearing the evidence given today about the paper that the proposal to rob Riversbrook was Hill's own proposal, that Hill drew a plan of the house on paper he abstracted from his master's desk, paper which this confidential servant was apparently in the habit of using for private purposes, and that he gave it to Birchill when he asked Birchill to join him in the crime. When one of the main features of Hill's story is proved to be false, how can you believe any of the rest? In the light in which we now see him, with his cunning exposed, what significance is to be attached to his statement that Birchill, in his presence, threatened to shoot Sir Horace Fewbanks if the master of Riversbrook interfered with him? Such a threat was not made, but why should Hill say it was made? for the same reason that he lied about the plan, to save his own skin. I submit to you, gentlemen, that when Hill went to see Birchill at the Westminster flat on the night arranged for the burglary, Sir Horace Fewbanks was dead, murdered, and that Hill knew he was murdered. His own story is that he tried to persuade Birchill to abandon the proposed burglary, but, according to the witness Fanning, he did all in his power to induce Birchill to carry out the original plan when he saw that Birchill was disposed to postpone the burglary in view of the return of the master of Riversbrook. Why did he want Birchill to carry out the burglary? Because he knew that his master's murdered body was lying in the house, and he wanted to be in the position to produce evidence against Birchill as the murderer if he found himself in a tight corner as the result of the subsequent investigation of the police. Remember that the body of the victim was fully dressed when it was discovered by the police, and that none of the electric lights were burning. Does not that prove conclusively that the murder was not committed by Birchill, that Sir Horace Fewbanks was dead when Birchill broke into the house. Birchill, an experienced criminal, would not break into the house while there was anybody moving about. He would wait until the house was in darkness and the inmates asleep. To do otherwise would increase enormously the risks of capture. But the fact that the police found the body of the murdered man fully dressed shows that Sir Horace was murdered before he went to bed, before Birchill broke into the house. 
It shows conclusively that the murder was committed before dusk. Your only alternatives to that conclusion are that the murdered man went to bed with his clothes on, or that the murderer broke into the house before Sir Horace had gone to bed, and after killing Sir Horace went coolly round the house, turning out the lights, instead of fleeing in terror at his deed, without even waiting to collect any booty. I am sure that as reasonable men you will reject both these alternatives as absurd. No evidence has been produced to show that anything has been stolen from the place. It was evidently the theory of the prosecution that the prisoner, after shooting Sir Horace, had fled. The evidence of Hill was that he arrived at Fanning's flat in a state of great excitement. His excitement would be consistent with his story of having discovered the body of a murdered man, but not consistent with the conduct of a cold-blooded, calculating murderer who had broken into the house before Sir Horace had undressed for bed, had shot him, and had then gone round the house turning out the lights without having any apparent object in doing so. Gentlemen, I think you will admit that the crime must have been committed before dusk, before any lights were turned on. I do not ask you to say that Hill is guilty. The responsibility of saying what man other than the prisoner shot Sir Horace Fewbanks does not rest with you. But I do urge you to ask yourselves whether, as between Hill and the prisoner, the probability of guilt is not on the side of this witness who lied to the coroner's court about his movements on the night of the murder, and who lied to this court about the plan for the robbery of Riversbrook. I have shown you that Hill was the master mind in planning the burglary, and that being so, would not Birchill have consented to the postponement of the burglary if Hill had urged him to do so when he visited the flat after the unexpected return of the master of Riversbrook? Is not the evidence of the witness Fanning that Hill urged Birchill to carry out the burglary after Sir Horace had gone to sleep more credible than Hill's statement that he endeavoured to induce Birchill to abandon the proposed crime? Knowing what you know of Hill's past as a man who will rob his master, knowing that he attempted to deceive you with regard to this plan of Riversbrook, in order that you might play your part in his cunning scheme, I urge you to ask yourselves whether it is not more probable that Hill fired the shot which killed Sir Horace Fewbanks than that the prisoner did so. Is it not extremely probable that the unexpected return of Sir Horace upset Hill, who was giving a final look round the house before the burglary took place. That, instead of answering his master with a suave, obsequious humility of the well-trained servant, he revealed the baffled curiosity of a criminal whose carefully arranged plan seemed to have miscarried that his master angrily rebuked him, and Hill, losing control of himself, sprang at Sir Horace, and the struggle ended with Hill drawing a revolver and shooting his master. The rest of the story from that point can be constructed without difficulty. The murderer's first thought was to divert suspicion from himself, and the best way to do that was to divert suspicion elsewhere. He locked up the house and went to see Birchill. He urged Birchill to break into Riversbrook, in which the dead body of the murdered man lay. It is true that he need not have told Birchill that Sir Horace had returned unexpectedly, but his object in doing so was to make Birchill search about the house until he inadvertently stumbled across the dead body. Had Birchill been under the impression that he had broken into an entirely empty house, he would have collected the valuables and might not have entered the library in which the dead body lay. It was necessary for Hill's purpose that Birchill should come across the corpse. Then he would be vitally interested in diverting suspicion from himself, Birchill, and that is why he cunningly revealed to Birchill that Sir Horace had returned. I put it to the jury 
that such is a more probable explanation of how Sir Horace met his death than that he was shot down by Birchill. I ask you again to remember that the body was fully dressed when it was found by the police. I put it to you that in this matter the prisoner walked into a trap prepared by his more cunning fellow criminal. I urge you with all the earnestness it is possible for a man to use when the life of a fellow creature is at stake, not to be led into a trap, not to play the part this cunning criminal Hill has designed for you, in the sacrifice of the life of an innocent man for the purpose of saving himself from his just deserts. Looking at the whole case, as you will not fail to do, with the breadth of view of experienced men of the world, with some knowledge of the working of human nature, with a natural horror of the depth of cunning of which some natures are capable, with a deep sense of the solemn responsibility for a human life upon you, I confidently appeal to you to say that the prisoner was not the man who shot Sir Horace Fewbanks, and to bring in a verdict of not guilty." A short discussion arose between the bench and bar on the question of adjourning the court or continuing the case in the hope of finishing it in a few hours. Sir Henry Hodson wanted to finish the case that night, but counsel for the prosecution intimidated that his address to the jury would take nearly two hours. As it was then nearly five o'clock, and his honour had to sum up before the jury could retire, it was hardly to be hoped the case could be finished that night, as the jury might be some time in arriving at a verdict. His honour decided to adjourn the court and finish the case next day. End of chapter 18 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 19 of The Hampstead Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Chapter 19 Mr. Walters began his address to the jury on orthodox lines. He referred to the fact that his learned friend had warned them that the life of a fellow-creature rested on their verdict. It was right that they should keep that in mind. It was right that they should fully realize the responsible nature of the duty they were called upon to perform but it would be wrong for them to overestimate their responsibility, or to feel weighed down by it. It would be wrong for them to be influenced by sentimental considerations of the fact that a fellow creature's life was at stake. Strictly speaking, that had nothing whatever to do with them. Their responsibility ended with their verdict. If their verdict was guilty, the responsibility of taking the prisoner's life would rest upon the law, not on the jury, not on his honour who passed the sentence of death, not on the prison officials who carried out the execution. The jury would do well to keep in mind the fact that their responsibility in this trial, impressive and important as every one must acknowledge it to be, was nevertheless strictly limited as far as the taking of the life of the prisoner was concerned. He then went over the evidence in detail, building up again the case for the prosecution, where Mr. Holomid had made breaches in it, and attempting to demolish the case for the defence. Hill, he declared, was an honest witness. The man had made one false step, but he had done his best to retrieve it, and with the help he had received from his late master, Sir Horace Fewbanks, he would have buried the past effectively if it had not been for the fact that the prisoner, who was a confirmed criminal, 
had determined to drag him down. There was no doubt that Hill's association with Birchill had been unfortunate for him. It had dragged his past into the light of day, and he stood before them a ruined man. He had tried to live down the past, and but for Birchill he would have succeeded in doing so. But now no one would employ him as a house servant after the revelations that had been made in this court. They had seen Hill in the witness box, and he would ask the jury whether he looked like the masterful cunning scoundrel which the defence had described, or a weak creature who would be easily led by a man of strong will such as the prisoner was. As to what took place at the flat, they had a choice between the evidence of Hill and the evidence of the girl Fanning. Hill had told them that he had tried to dissuade the prisoner from going to Riversbrook to burgle the premises because his master had returned unexpectedly. Fanning had told them that the prisoner was in favour of postponing the crime, but that Hill had urged him to carry it out. Which story was the more probable? What reliance could they place on the evidence of Fanning? He did not wish to say that the witness was utterly vicious and incapable of telling the truth, a description that the defence had applied to Hill. But they must take into consideration the fact that Fanning was the prisoner's mistress. Was it likely that a woman knowing her lover's life was at stake would come here and speak the truth? if she knew the truth would hang him. He was sure that the jury, as men who knew the world thoroughly, would not hesitate between the evidence of Hill and that of Fanning. The case for the defence depended to a great extent on the plan of Riversbrook, which Hill candidly admitted he had drawn. His learned friend had called evidence to show that the paper on which the plan was drawn was of a quality which was not procurable by the general public. That might be so, but what his learned friend had not succeeded in doing, and could not possibly have hoped to succeed in doing, was to show that Birchill could not have obtained possession in any other way of a paper of that kind. Yet it was necessary for the defence to prove that, in order to prove that the plan was not drawn at Fanning's flat by Hill under threats from Birchill, but that Hill had drawn it at Riversbrook, and that he gave it to Birchill in order to induce him to consent to the proposal to break into the house. There were dozens of ways in which paper of this particular quality might have got to the flat. Might not Birchill have a friend in His Majesty's stationery office? Was it impossible that a witness Fanning had a friend in that office, or in one of the government departments to which the paper was supplied? Was it impossible, in view of her relations with the victim of this crime, for Fanning to have obtained some of the paper at Riversbrook, and to have taken it home to her flat? She had sworn in the witness box that she had not had paper of that kind in her possession. But with her lover's life at stake, was she likely to stick at a lie if it would help to get him off? Counsel for the defence had endeavoured to make much of the fact that the dead body of Sir Horace Fewbanks was fully dressed when the police discovered it. He endeavoured to persuade them that such a fact established the complete innocence of the prisoner, and that because of it they must bring in a verdict of not guilty. He asked them to accept it as evidence not only that Sir Horace Fewbanks was dead when the prisoner broke into the house, but that he was dead when Hill left Riversbrook at 7.30 p.m. to meet Birchill at Fanning's flat. With an ingenuity which did credit to his imagination, he put before them as his theory of the crime that a quarrel took place between Sir Horace Fewbanks and Hill at Riversbrook that Hill shot his master, and then went to Fanning's flat, so as to see that Birchill carried out the burglary as arranged, and at the same time found Sir Horace's dead body, and thus directed suspicion to himself. The only support for this far-fetched theory was that the body, when discovered by the police, was fully dressed, and that none of the electric lights were burning. 
Counsel for the defence contended that these two facts established his theory that the murder was committed before dusk. They established nothing of the kind. There were half a dozen more credible explanations of these things than the one he asked the jury to accept. What mystery was there in a man being fully dressed in his own house at midnight? The defence had been at great pains to show that Sir Horace Fewbanks was a man of somewhat irregular habits in his private life. Did not that suggest that he might have turned off the lights and gone to sleep in an armchair in the library with the intention of going out in an hour or two to keep an appointment? If he had an appointment, and his sudden and unexpected return from Scotland would suggest that he had a secret and important appointment, he would be more likely to take a short nap in his chair than to undress and go to bed. Might not the prisoner, who was a bold and reckless man, have broken into the house when the lights were burning and his victim was awake and fully dressed? In that case, what was to prevent his turning off the lights before leaving the house, instead of leaving them burning to attract attention? What was to prevent the prisoner turning off the lights in order to convey the impression that the crime had been committed in daylight? I want you to keep in mind, when arriving at your verdict, that there are certain material facts which have been admitted by the defence, said Mr. Walters in concluding his address to the jury. It has been admitted that the prisoner was a party to a proposal to break into Riversbrook. As far as that goes, there is no suggestion that he walked into a trap. Whether he arranged the burglary and compelled Hill to help him, or whether Hill arranged it and sought out the prisoner's assistance is, after all, not very material. What is admitted is that the prisoner went to Riversbrook with the intention of committing a crime. It is admitted that the he knew Sir Horace Fewbanks had returned home. In that case, is it not reasonable to suppose that the prisoner would arm himself? I do not say with the definite intention of committing murder, but for the purpose of threatening Sir Horace, if necessary, in order to make good his escape. What is more likely than that Sir Horace heard the burglar in the house, crept upon him, and then tried to capture him? There was a struggle, and the prisoner, determined to free himself, drew his revolver and shot Sir Horace. Is not such a theory of the crime, that Sir Horace was shot while trying to capture the prisoner, more probable than the theory of the defence that Hill, the weak-willed, frightened-looking man you saw in the witness-box, was a masterful, cunning criminal who for some inexplicable reason had turned ferociously on the master who had befriended him and given him a fresh start in life? had killed him and left the body in the house, and had then managed to direct suspicion to the prisoner. The theory of the defence does great credit to my learned friend's imagination, but it is one which I am sure the jury will reject as too highly coloured. Looking at the plain facts of the case, and dismissing from your minds the attempt to make them fit into a purely imaginative theory, I am sure that you will come to the conclusion that Sir Horace Fewbanks met his death at the hands of the prisoner. The junior bar agreed that the case was one which might go either way. If they had possessed any money, the betting market would have shown scarcely a shade of odds. Everything depended on the way the jury looked at the case, on the particular bits of evidence to which they attached most weight. On the view, the most argumentative, positive-minded members of the jury adopted, for they would be able to carry the others with them. In the opinion of the junior bar, the summing up of Mr. Justice Hodson would not help the jury very much in arriving at a verdict. There were some judges who summed up for or against a prisoner according to the view they had formed as to the prisoner's guilt or innocence. There were other judges who summed up so impartially and gave such even balanced weight to the point against the prisoner and to the points in his favour as to make on the minds of the jurymen 
the impression that the only way to arrive at a well-considered verdict was to toss a coin another type of judge conveyed to the jury that the prosecution had established an unanswerable case but the defence had shown equal skill in shattering it and therefore he did not know on which side to make up his mind and fortunately english legal procedure did not render it necessary for him to do so the prisoner might be guilty and he might be innocent some of the jury might think one thing and the rest of the jury might think another but it was the duty of the jury to come to an unanimous verdict it did not matter if they looked at some things in different ways but their final decision must be the same mr justice hodson belonged to the impartial impersonal type of judge he had no personal feelings or conviction as to the guilt or innocence of the prisoner it was for the jury to settle that point and it was his duty to assist them to the best of his ability he went over his notes carefully and dealt with the evidence of each of the witnesses it was for the jury to say what evidence they believed and what they disbelieved there was a pronounced conflict of evidence between hill and fanning they were the chief witnesses in the case but the guilt or innocence of the prisoner did not rest entirely upon the evidence of either of these witnesses hill might be speaking the truth and the prisoner might be innocent though the presumption would be if hill's evidence were truthful in every detail that the prisoner was guilty fanning's evidence might be true as far as it went but it would not in itself prove that the prisoner was innocent hill had admitted that he had drawn the plan of riversbrook to assist birchill to commit burglary it was for the jury to determine for themselves whether he had been terrorized into drawing the plan for birchill or whether he was the instigator of the burglary the defence had contended that hill had drawn the plan at his leisure at a time when he had access to a special quality of paper supplied to his master if that were so hill's version of how he came to draw the plan was deliberately false and had been concocted for the purpose of exculpating himself but they would not be justified in dismissing hill's evidence entirely from their minds because they were satisfied he had perjured himself with regard to the plan they would be justified however in viewing the rest of his evidence with some degree of distrust counsel for the defence had made an ingenious use of the facts that the body of the victim was fully dressed when discovered and that none of the electric lights in the house were burning these facts lend support to the idea that the murder was committed in daylight but they by no means established the theory as unassailable they did not establish the innocence of the prisoner although to some extent they told in his favour counsel for the prosecution had put before them several theories to account for these two facts consistent with his contention that the murder had been committed by the prisoner the jury must give full consideration to these theories as well as to the theory of the defence they were not called upon to say which theory was true except in so far as their opinions might be implied in the verdict they gave the defence continued his honour was that hill had committed the murder and had then decided to direct suspicion to the prisoner if the jury acquitted the prisoner their verdict would not necessarily mean that they endorsed the theory of the defence it might mean that but it might mean only that they were not satisfied that the prisoner had committed the murder if the jury were convinced beyond all reasonable doubt that the prisoner had committed the murder they must bring in a verdict of guilty and if they were not satisfied they must bring in a verdict of acquittal the jury filed out of their apartment and as they retired to consider their verdict the judge retired to his own room the prisoner was removed from the dock and taken down the stairs out of sight there was an immediate hum of voices in the court 
Inspector Chippenfield approached the table and whispered to Mr. Walters. The latter nodded affirmatively and left the courtroom in company with Mr. Holymead. The sibilant sound of whispering voices died down after a few minutes and then began the long, tedious wait for the return of the jury. The occupants of the gallery, who had no difficulty in coming to an immediate decision on the guilt or innocence of the prisoner, could not understand what was keeping the jury away so long. They failed to understand the jury's point of view. These gentlemen had sat in court for three days, listening intently to proceedings concerning a matter in which their degree of personal interest was only a form of curiosity. And now the end of the case had been reached, except for the climax, which was in their control. To arrive at an immediate decision in a case that had occupied the court for three days would indicate they had no proper realization of the responsibilities of their position. A verdict was a thing that had to be nicely balanced in relation to the evidence. Where the case against the prisoner was weak or overwhelmingly strong, the jury might arrive at a verdict with great speed as an indication that too much of their valuable time had already been wasted on the case. But where the evidence for and against the prisoner was fairly equal, it behooved the jury to indicate by the time they took in arriving at their verdict that they had given the case the most careful consideration. Two hours and twenty minutes after the jury had retired, the prisoner was brought back into the dock. This was an indication that the jury had arrived at their verdict and were ready to deliver it. The prisoner looked worn and anxious, but he received encouraging smiles from his friends in the gallery. A minute later the judge entered the court and resumed his seat. The jury filed into court and entered the jury box. Amid the noise of barristers resuming their seats and court officials gliding about, the judge's associate called over the names of the jurymen. The suspense reached its climax as the associate put the formal questions to the foreman whether the jury had agreed on their verdict. "'What say you? Guilty or not guilty?' asked the associate in a hard metallic voice which there was no trace of interest in the answer not guilty replied the foreman there was a muffled cheer from the gallery which was suppressed by the stentorian cry of the ushers silence in the court a pack of damned fools said the exasperated inspector chippenfield Rolf understood that his chief referred to the jury, and he nodded the assent of a subordinate. End of chapter 19 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 20 of The Hampstead Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Chapter 20 Hill has bolted. Rolf flung the words at Inspector Chippenfield in a tone which he was unable to divest entirely of satisfaction. Fancy his being the guilty party after all, he added, with a tone of satisfaction still more evident in his voice. I often thought that he was our man and uh, that he was playing with you, I mean with us. Inspector Chippenfield had betrayed surprise at the news by dropping his pen on the official report he was preparing. But it was in his usual tone of cold official superiority that he replied, 
"Do you mean that Hill, the principal witness in the Riversbrook murder trial, has disappeared from London?" "Disappeared from London! He's bolted clean out of the country by this time, I tell you cleared out for good and left his unfortunate wife and child to starve." "How have you learnt this, Rolfe?" "His wife told me herself. I went to the shop this afternoon to have a few words with Hill and see how he felt after the way Holymead had gone for him at the trial. His wife burst out crying when she saw me, and she told me that her husband had cleared out last night after he came home from court. The hardened scoundrel took with him the few pounds of her savings which she kept in her bedroom, and had even emptied the contents of the till of the few shillings and coppers it contained. All he left were the halfpennies in the child's money-box. He cleared out in the middle of the night after his wife had gone to bed. He left her a note telling her she must get along without him. I have the note here. His wife gave it to me. Rolfe took a dirty scrap of paper out of his pocket-book and laid it before Inspector Chippenfield. The paper was a half-sheet torn from an exercise book, and its contents were written in faint lead pencil. They read, Dear Mary, I've got to leave you. I have thought it out, and this is the only thing to do. I'm too frightened to stay after what took place in the court today. I'll make a fresh start in some place where I'm not known, and as soon as I can send a little money, I will send for you and Daphne. Keep your heart up, and it will be all right. Keep on the shop. Your loving husband. The poor little woman is heartbroken, continued Rolf, when his superior officer had finished reading the note. She wants to know if we cannot get her husband back for her. She says the shop won't keep her and the child. Unless she can find her husband, she'll be turned into the streets, because she's behind with the rent, and Hill's taken every penny she'd put by. "'Then she'd better go to the workhouse,' retorted Inspector Chippenfield brutally. "'We'd have something to do if Scotland Yard undertook to trace all the absconding husbands in London. We can do nothing in the matter, and you'd better tell her so.' Inspector Chippenfield handed back Hill's note as he spoke. Rolf eyed him in some surprise. "'But surely you're going to take out a warrant for Hill's arrest,' he said. "'Certainly not,' responded Inspector Chippenfield impatiently. "'I've already said that Scotland Yard has something more to do than trace absconding husbands. There's nothing to prevent you giving a little of your private time to looking for him, Rolf, if you feel so tender-hearted about the matter. But officially, no.' I'm astonished at your suggesting such a thing. It isn't that, replied Rolf, flushing a little, and speaking with slight embarrassment. But surely after Hill's flight you'll apply for a warrant for his arrest on the other ground. On what other ground? asked his chief coldly. Why, on a charge of murdering Sir Horace Fewbanks, Rolf burst out indignantly. "'Doesn't this flight point to his guilt?' "'Not in my opinion,' Inspector Chippenfield's voice was purely official. "'Why, surely it does!' Rolf's glance at his chief indicated that there was such a thing as carrying official obstinacy too far. "'This letter he left behind suggests his guilt clearly enough.' "'I didn't notice that.' replied Inspector Chippenfield impassively. Perhaps you'll point out the passage to me, Rolf. Rolf hastily produced the note again. Look here, his finger indicated the place. I'm frightened to stay after what took place in the court today. Doesn't that mean clearly enough that he'll realize the acquittal pointed to him as the murderer, and he determined to abscond before he could be arrested? "'So that's your way of looking at it, eh, Rolf?' said Inspector Chippenfield quizzically. "'Certainly it is,' responded Rolf, not a little nettled by his chief's contemptuous tone. "'It's as plain as a pike staff that the jury acquitted Birchill because they believed Hill was guilty. Holymead made out too strong a case for them to get away from. Hill's lies about the plan and the fact that the body was fully dressed when discovered.' 
"'You're a young man, Rolfe,' responded Inspector Chippenfield in a tolerant tone. "'But you'll have to shed this habit of jumping impulsively to conclusions, "'and generally wrong conclusions, if you want to succeed in Scotland Yard. "'This letter of Hill's only strengthens my previous opinion "'that a damned muddle-headed jury let a cold-blooded murderer loose on the world "'when they acquitted Fred Birchill of the charge of shooting Sir Horace Fewbanks. "'Why, man alive, Holymead no more believes Hill is guilty than I do. "'He set himself to bamboozle the jury, and he succeeded.' If he had to defend Hill tomorrow, he would show the jury that Hill couldn't have committed the murder, and that it must have been committed by Birchill, and no one else. He's a clever man, far cleverer than Walters, and that is why I lost the case. He led Hill into a trap about the plan of Riversbrook, said Rolfe. When I saw that Hill had been trapped on that point, I felt we had lost the jury. "'Only because the jury were a pack of fools who knew nothing about evidence. "'Granted that Hill lied about the plan, that he drew it up voluntarily in his spare time to assist Birchill. "'It proves nothing. "'It doesn't prove that Hill committed the murder. "'It only proves that Hill was going to share in the proceeds of the burglary, "'that he was a willing party to it.' The one big outstanding fact in all the evidence, the fact that towered over all the others, is that Birchill broke into the house on the night Sir Horace Fewbanks was murdered. The defence made no attempt to get away from that fact, because they couldn't do so. But Holymead vamped up all sorts of surmises and suppositions for the purpose of befogging the jury and getting their minds away from the outstanding feature of the case for the prosecution. We prove that Birchill was in the house on a criminal errand. What more could they expect us to prove? They couldn't expect us to have a man looking through the window or hiding behind the door when the murder was committed. If we could get evidence of that kind, we could do without juries. We could hang our man first and try him afterwards. I don't think a verdict of acquittal from a befogged jury would do so much harm in such a case. "'You're still convinced that Birchill did it?' said Rolf questioningly. "'I have never wavered from that opinion,' said his superior. "'If I had, this note of Hill's would restore my conviction in Birchill's guilt.' "'Why? How do you make out that?' replied Rolf blankly. "'Hill says he's clearing out of the country because he's frightened. "'What's he frightened of?' his own guilty conscience and the long arm of the law? Not a bit of it. Hill's an innocent man. If he had been guilty, he'd never have stood the ordeal of the witness-box and the cross-examination. Hill's cleared out because he was frightened of Birchill. Of Birchill? Yes. Didn't Birchill tell Hill just before he set out for Riversbrook on the night of the murder that if Hill played him false, he'd murder him? Hill did play him false. Not then, but afterwards, when he made his confession and Birchill was arrested for the murder in consequence. When Birchill was acquitted at the trial, his first thought would be to wreak vengeance on Hill. A man with one murder on his soul would not be likely to hesitate about committing another. He knew this, and fled to save his life when Birchill was acquitted. That's the explanation of his letter, Rolf. So that's the way you look at it, said Rolf. Of course I do. It's the only way Hill's flight can be looked at in the light of all that's happened. The theory dovetails in every part. I'm more used than you to putting these things together, Rolf. Hill's as innocent of the murder as you are. And where do you think Hill's gone to? Certainly not out of London. He's too much of a cockney for that. Besides, he's a man who is fond of his wife and child. He's hiding somewhere close at hand. "'And I shouldn't wonder if the whole thing's a plant between him and his wife. 
Have you forgotten how she tried to hoodwink us before? I'll go to the shop tomorrow and see if I can't frighten the truth out of her. Meanwhile, you'd better put the Camden Town Police on to watching the shop. If he's hiding in London, he is bound to visit his wife sooner or later. Or she'll visit him, so we ought not to have much difficulty in getting on to his tracks again. Rolf departed to do his chief's bidding, a little crestfallen. He was at first inclined to think that he had made a bit of a fool of himself in his desire to prove to Inspector Chippenfield that he had been hoodwinked by Hill into arresting Birchill. But that night, as he sat in his bedroom, smoking a quiet pipe and reviewing this latest phase of the puzzling case, the earlier doubts which had assailed him on first learning of Hill's flight recurred to him with increasing force. If Hill were innocent, he would have been more likely to seek police protection before flight. Hill's flight was hardly the action of an innocent man. It pointed more to a guilty fear of his own skin, now that the man he had accused of the murder was free to seek vengeance. Chippenfield's theory seemed plausible enough at first sight, but Rolf now recalled that he knew nothing of the missing letters and Hill's midnight visit to Riversbrook to recover them. Rolf had concealed that episode from his superior officer because he lacked the courage to reveal to him how he had been hoodwinked by Mrs. Holymead's fainting fit the morning he was conducting his official inquiry at Riversbrook into the murder. "'It's an infernally baffling case,' muttered Rolf, refilling his pipe from a tin of tobacco on the mantelpiece, and walking up and down the cheap lodging-house drudget with rapid strides. "'If Birchill is not the murderer, who is? Is it Hill?' He lit his pipe, closed the window, opened his pocket-book, and sat down to peruse the notes he had taken during his investigation of Sir Horace Fewbanks' murder. He read and re-read them, earnestly searching for a fresh clue in the penciled pages. After spending some time in this occupation, he took a clean sheet of paper and a pencil, and copied afresh the following entries from his notebook. August 19. Went Riversbrook. Saw Sir H. F.'s body. Discovered fragment of lady's handkerchief clenched in right hand. August 22. Made inquiries, handkerchief, unable find where purchased. September 8. Found Hill at Riversbrook, searching Sir H. F.'s paper. Told me about bundle of ladies' letters tied up with pink ribbon, which had been taken from secret drawer. Says they disappeared morning after murder, when investigation was taking place. Sees visitors that day. Dr. Slingsby. Selden to arrange inquest, newspaper men, undertaker's representatives, crew, see saw one visitor alone, Hill says, Mrs. H., who fainted, see fetched glass of water, leaving her alone in room, Hill suggests her letters indicate friendly relations between her and Sir H. F., Sir H. F. expected visit, probably from Lady, night of murder, hurried Hill off when he returned from Scotland. Mem, inadvisable disclose this to see. Underneath his entries of the case Rolf had written finally, points to be remembered. 1. Crewe said before the trial that Birchill was not the murderer and would be acquitted. Birchill was acquitted. 2. Crewe suggested we had not got the whole truth out of Hill. Hill disappears the night after the trial. Is Hill the murderer? 3. The handkerchief and the letters point to a woman in the case, although this was not brought out at the trial. Is it possible that a woman is Mrs. H.? Rolf realized that the chief pieces of the puzzle were before him but the difficulty was to put them together. He felt sure there was a connection between these facts, which, if brought to light, would solve the Riversbrook mystery. 
Without knowing it, he had been so influenced by Crewe's analysis of the case that he had practically given up the idea that Birchill had anything to do with the murder. His real reason for going to Hill's shop that morning was to try and extract something from Hill which might put him on the track of the actual murderer. He believed Hill knew more than he had divulged. Hill, before his disappearance, had placed in his hands an important clue. If he only knew how to follow it up. That incident of the missing letters must have some bearing on the case. If he could only elucidate it. Should he disclose to Chippenfield Hill's story of the missing letters? Rolf dismissed the idea as soon as it crossed his mind. He knew his superior officer sufficiently well to understand that he would be very angry to learn that he had been deceived by Mrs. Holymead, and, as she was outside the range of his anger, he would bear a grudge against his junior officer for discovering the deception which had been practised on him, and do all he could to block his promotion in Scotland Yard in consequence. Apart from that, he could offer Chippenfield no excuse for not having told him before. Should he consult Crewe? Rolf dismissed that thought also, but more reluctantly. Hang it all! It was too humiliating for an accredited officer of Scotland Yard to consult a private detective. Rolf had acquired an unwilling respect for Crewe's abilities during the course of the investigations into the Riversbrook case, but he retained all the intolerance which regular members of the detective force feel for the private detectives who poach on their preserves. Rolf's professional jealousy was intensified in Crewe's case because of the brilliant success Crewe had achieved during his career at the expense of the reputation of Scotland Yard. Rolf had an instinctive feeling that Crewe's mind was of a finer quality than his own and would see light where he only grouped in darkness. If Crewe had been his superior officer in Scotland Yard, Rolf would have gone to him unhesitatingly and profited by his keener vision, but he could not do so in their existing relative positions. He ransacked his brain for some other course. After long consideration, Rolf decided to go and see Mrs. Holymead and question her about the packet of letters which Hill declared she had removed from Riversbrook after the murder. He realized that this was rather a risky course to pursue for Mrs. Holymead was highly placed and could do him much harm if she got her husband to use his influence at the home office, for then he would have to admit that he had gone to her without the knowledge of his superior officer, on the statement of a discredited servant who had arranged a burglary in his master's house the night he was murdered. Nevertheless, Rolf decided to take the risk. The chance of getting somewhere nearer the solution of the Riversbrook mystery was worth it, and what a feather in his cap it would be if he solved the mystery. He was convinced that Chippenfield had shut out important light on the mystery by doggedly insisting, in order to buttress up his case against Birchill, that the piece of handkerchief which had been found in the dead man's hand was a portion of a handkerchief which had belonged to the girl Fanning and had been brought by Birchill from the Westminster flat on the night of the murder. It was more likely, in view of Hill's story of the letters, that the handkerchief belonged to Mrs. Holymead. Rolf had not made up his mind that Mrs. Holymead had committed the murder, but he was convinced that she and her letters had some connection with the baffling crime, and he determined to try and pierce the mystery by questioning her. Having arrived at this decision, he replaced his notebook in his coat pocket, knocked the ashes out of his pipe, and went to bed. End of chapter 20 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter Twenty One of The Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Carl, St. Louis, Missouri. 
June 2008. The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Rees. Chapter 21. Rolf went to Hyde Park next day and walked from the tube station to Holymead's house at Princess Gate. The servant who answered his ring informed him, in reply to his question, that Mrs. Holymead was not at home. "'Do you know when she will be home?' persisted Rolf, forestalling an evident desire on the servant's part to shut the door in his face. The man looked at Rolf doubtfully. Well-trained English servant though he was, and used to summing up strangers at a glance, he could not quite make out who Rolf might be. But before he could come to a decision on the point, a feminine voice behind him said, "'What is it, Trepon?' The servant turned quickly in the direction of the voice. "'It's a er, party who wants to see Madame, Mademoiselle,' he replied. "'Parti? What mean you by parti? Explain yourself, Trepon.' "'A person, a gentleman, Mademoiselle,' replied Trepon, determined to be on the safe side. Open the door, Trapon, that I may see this gentleman. Trapon somewhat reluctantly complied, and a young lady stepped forward. She was tall and dark, with charming eyes, which were also shrewd. She had a fine figure, which a tight-fitting dress displayed rather too boldly for good taste, and she was sufficiently young to be able to appear quite girlish in the half-light. You wish to see Madame Holymead? she said to Rolf. Her manner was engagingly pleasant and French. Rolf felt it incumbent upon him to be gallant under the presence of the fair representative of a nation whom he vaguely understood placed gallantry in the forefront of the virtues. He took off his hat with a courtly bow. "'I do, mademoiselle,' he replied, "'and my business is important. Then, monsieur, step inside if you will be so good, and I will see you.' She led Rolf into a small, prettily furnished room at the end of the hall, and carefully shut the door. Then she invited Rolf to be seated, and asked him to state his business. But this was precisely what Rolf was not anxious to do, except to Mrs. Holymead herself. "'My business is private, and must be placed before Mrs. Holymead,' he said firmly. "'I wish to see her.' "'I regret, monsieur, but Madame Holymead is out of town. She went last week. If you had only come before she went, Mademoiselle Chiron looked genuinely sorry. Rolf was a little taken aback at this intelligence, and showed it. Out of town, he repeated. Where has she gone to? She looked at him almost timidly. But, monsieur, I do not know if I ought to tell you without knowing who you are. You are a friend of madame's? My name is Detective Rolf. I come from Scotland Yard, replied Rolf in the authoritative tone of a man who knew that the disclosure was sure to command respect, if not a welcome. "'Scotland? You come from Scotland? Madame will regret much that she has missed you.' "'Scotland Yard,' I said, corrected Rolf, not Scotland. "'Is it not the same?' Mademoiselle Chiron looked at him helplessly. "'Scotland Yard, is it not in Scotland? What is the difference?' Rolf, with a Londoner's tolerance for foreign ignorance, painstakingly explained the difference. She looked so puzzled that he felt sure she did not understand him, but that, he reflected, was not his fault. "'So you see, mademoiselle, my business with Mrs. Holymead is important. Therefore I'll be obligated if you will tell me where I can find her,' he said. "'In what part of the country is she?' Mademoiselle Chiron looked distressed. "'Really, monsieur, I cannot tell you. She is monitoring.' I should have been with her, but did I have one cross room? She produced a tiny scrap of lace handkerchief and held it to her nose as though in support of her statement. And she rings me on the telephone from different places and tells me the things she does need, and I do send them on to her. Where does she ring you from? asked Rolf, eyeing Mademoiselle's handkerchief intently. From Brighton, from Eastbourne, wherever she stops. What place was she stopping at when you heard from her last? Eastbourne, monsieur. And when will she return here? That, monsieur, I do not know. Tonight, tomorrow, next week, she does not tell me. If monsieur will leave me a message, I will see that she gets it. 
for it is always me she wants, and it is always me that talks to her. What shall I tell her when she next rings the telephone? If monsieur will state his business, I will tell madame what he tells me. I am madame's cousin by marriage. In me she has confidence. She spoke in a tone which invited confidence, but Rolf was not prepared to go to the length of trusting the young woman he saw before him, despite her assurance that she was in the confidence of Mrs. Holymead. He rose to his feet with a keen glance at Mademoiselle Chiron's handkerchief, which she had rolled into a little ball in her hand. "'I cannot disclose my business to you, Mademoiselle,' he said courteously. "'I must see Mrs. Holymead personally, so I shall call again when she has returned.' "'But, monsieur, why will you not tell me?' she asked coaxingly. "'You are a police agent. Have you therefore come to see madame about the case?' Rolf showed that he was taken aback by the direct question. "'The case?' he stammered. "'What case? Why, monsieur, what case could it be but that of which I have so often heard madame speak? Le judge, the good friend of monsieur and madame Holymead, who was killed by the base assassin. Madame is disconsolate about his terrible end. Mademoiselle Chiron here applied the handkerchief to her eyes on her own account. Have you come to tell her that you have caught the wicked man who did assassinate him? Madame will be overjoyed. Why, hardly that, replied Rolf, completely off his guard. But we're on the track, Mademoiselle, we're on the track. And is that... "'And is it that you wanted me to tell madame?' persisted Mademoiselle Chiron. "'I wanted to ask her a question or two about several things,' said Rolf, who had determined to disclose his hand sufficiently to bring Mrs. Holymead back to London, if she had anything to do with the crime. "'I want to ask her about some letters that were stolen—no, I won't say stolen—letters that were removed from Riversbrook.' I have been informed that even if these letters are no longer in existence, she can give the police a good idea of what was in them. The telephone bell in the corner of the room rang suddenly. Mademoiselle Chiron ran to answer it, and accidentally dropped her handkerchief on the floor in picking up the receiver. Mademoiselle Chiron began speaking on the telephone, but she stopped suddenly, staring with frightened eyes into the mirror at the other side of the room. The glass reflected the actions of Rolf at the table. Seated with his back towards her, he had taken advantage of her being called to the telephone to examine her handkerchief, which he had picked up from the floor. He had produced from his pocket-book the scrap of lace and muslin which he had found in the murdered man's hand. He had the two on the table side by side, comparing them. And Mademoiselle Chiron noticed a smile of satisfaction flit across his face as he did so. While she looked, he restored the scrap to his pocket-book, and the pocket-book to his pocket. Hastily she turned to the telephone again, and continued, in a voice which a quick ear would have detected was slightly hysterical. Then she hung up the receiver and turned to Rolf. "'But, monsieur, you were saying?' Rolf handed the handkerchief to its owner with a courtly bow, which he flattered himself was equal to the best French school. I picked this up off the floor, mademoiselle, it is yours, I think. This? Mademoiselle Chiron touched the handkerchief with a dainty forefinger. It is my handkerchief, I dropped it. It is very pretty, said Rolf, with simulated indifference. I suppose you bought that in Paris. It does not look English. But no, monsieur, it is quite English. I bought it in the shop. Indeed, a London shop, inquired Rolf, with equal indifference. The lingerie shop in Oxford Street, what do you call it, Hobson's? I'm sure I don't know. These ladies' things are a bit out of my line, said Rolf, rising as he spoke with a smile, in which there was more than a trace of self-satisfaction. He felt that he had acquitted himself with an adroitness which Crewe himself might have envied. He had made an important discovery, and extracted the name of the shop where the handkerchief had been bought without, so he flattered himself, arousing any suspicions on the part of the lady. Rolf knew from his inquiries in West End shops that handkerchiefs of that pattern and quality were stocked by many of the good shops, but the fact that he had found a handkerchief of this kind in the house of a lady who had abstracted secret letters from the murdered man's desk, and had, moreover, discovered the name of the shop where she bought her handkerchiefs, convinced him that he had struck a path which must lead to an important discovery. 
Mademoiselle Chiron followed Rolf into the hall and watched him depart from a front window. When she saw his retreating figure turn the corner of the street, she left the window, ran upstairs quickly, and knocked lightly at the closed door. The door was opened by Mrs. Holymead, who appeared to be in a state of nervous agitation. Her large brown eyes were swollen and dim with weeping. Her hair had become partly unloosed. Her face was white, and her dress disordered. She caught the Frenchwoman by the wrist and drew her into the bedroom, closing the door after her. "'What did he want, Gabrielle?' she gasped. "'What did he say? Had he come about that?' Gabrielle nodded her head. "'Gabrielle!' Mrs. Holymead's voice rose almost to a cry. "'Oh, what are we to do? Did he come to arrest?' "'No, no. He was not so bad. He did not come to do dreadful things, but just to have a little talk.' "'A little talk? What about?' He wanted to see you and ask you one or two little questions. I put him off. He was like a wax in my hands. Poof! He was gone. So why trouble? But he will come again. He is sure to come again. No doubt. He says he will come again, in a week, when you return. Mrs. Holymead wrung her hands helplessly. What are we to do then? she wailed. We will look the tragedy in the face when it comes. Ma foi! What have you been doing to yourself? There are nothing is it worth to look like that. With deft and loving fingers, Gabrielle began to arrange Mrs. Holymead's hair. We will have everything right before this little police agent returns. We will show him that he is the complete fool for suspecting you about the murder. But what can you do, Gabrielle? asked Mrs. Holymead. She looked at Gabrielle with her large brown eyes, as though she were utterly dependent on the other's stronger will for support and assistance. Mademoiselle Chiron stopped in her arrangement of Mrs. Holymead's hair, and, bending over, kissed her affectionately. Ma petite, she said, do not worry. I have thought of a plan, oh, most excellent plan, which I myself execute to-morrow, and then shall all your troubles be finished, and you will be happy again. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Hampstead Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Rees. Chapter 22 A lady to see you, sir. What sort of lady, Joe? Furren, I should say, sir, by the way she speaks. I asked you her if she had an appointment, and she said no, but she said she wanted to see you on a very urgent and particular business. I told her most people says that what comes to see you, but she says hers was really important. Ask me to tell you, sir, that it was about the Riversbrook case. The Riversbrook case? I see her, Joe. Has not Stork returned yet? No, sir. Tell him to go to his dinner when he comes back. Show the lady in, Joe. Crewe regarded his caller keenly as Joe ushered her in placed a chair for her, and went out, closing the door noiselessly behind him. She was a tall, well-dressed, graceful woman, fairly young, with dark hair and eyes. She looked quickly at the detective as she entered, and Crewe was struck by the shrewd penetration of her glance. "'You are Monsieur Crewe, the great detective, is it not so?' she asked as she sat down. The glance she now gave the detective at closer range from her large dark eyes was innocent and ingenuous, with a touch of admiration. The contrast between it and her former look was not lost on Crewe, and he realized that his visitor was no ordinary woman. "'My name is Crewe,' he said, ignoring the compliment. "'What do you wish to see me for?' The visitor did not immediately reply. She nervously unfastened a bag she carried, and taking out a singularly unfeminine-looking handkerchief, a large cambric square, almost masculine in its proportions, and guiltless of lace or perfume, held it to her face for a moment. 
but Crewe noticed that her eyes were dry when she removed it to remark, "'What I say to you, monsieur, is in strictest confidence as sacred as the confession?' "'Anything you say to me will be in strict confidence,' said Crewe a little grimly. "'And the boy, can he not hear through the keyhole?' Crewe's visitor glanced expressively at the door by which she had entered. "'You are quite safe here, madame. Mademoiselle, I should say,' he added with a quick glance at her left hand, from which she slowly removed the glove as she spoke. "'Mademoiselle Chiron, monsieur,' said Gabrielle, flashing another smile at him. "'I am Madame Holymead's relative, her cousin. I come to see you about the dreadful murder of the judge, madame's friend.' "'You come from Mrs. Holymead?' said Crewe quickly. Then Mademoiselle Chiron before. No, no, monsieur, no. Her agitation was unmistakably genuine. I do not come from Madame Holymead. I am her relative, it is true, but I come, how shall I say it, from myself. I mean, she does not know of my visit to you, monsieur. I quite understand, replied Crewe. Monsieur Crewe, said Gabrielle hurriedly, although I have not come from Madame Holymead, it is for her sake that I come to see you, to save her from the persecution of one of your police agents who wants to ask her questions about this so sordid, so terrible a crime. He has come once, this agent, last night. He came and he told me he wanted to question Madame Holymead about the murder of her dear friend the judge. I do not want Madame worried with these questions. So I told him Madame was away in the motor in the country, but he says he will come again and again till he sees her. Madame is distracted when she learns of his visit. It opens up her bleeding heart afresh, for she and her husband were intim with this dead judge, and deeply, terribly, they deplore his so dreadful end. I see Madame cry, and I say to myself, I will not let this little police agent spoil her beauty and give her the migraine. His visits must be, shall be, prevented. I have heard of the so great and good Monsieur Crewe, and I will go and see him. We will, as you say in your English way, put our heads together, this famous detective and I, and we will find some way of, how do you call it, circumventing this police agent so that my dear madame shall cry no more monsieur crewe i am here and i beg of you to help me crewe listened to this outburst with inward surprise but impassive features apparently the police had come to the conclusion that they had blundered in arresting birchill for the murder of sir horace fewbanks and had recommended inquiries with a view to bringing the crime home to somebody else he did not know whether their suspicions were now directed against mrs holymead but they had conducted their preliminary inquiries so clumsily as to arouse her fears that they did so much was apparent from Madame Chiron's remarks, despite the interpretations she thought to place on Mrs. Holymead's fears. He wondered if the police agent was Rolfe or Chippenfield. It was obvious that the cool proposal that he should help to shield Mrs. Holymead against unwelcome police attentions covered some deeper move, and he shaped his conversation in the endeavour to extract more from the Frenchwoman. "'I'm very sorry to hear that Mrs. Holymead has been subjected to this annoyance,' he said wearily. "'This police agent, did he come by himself?' "'But yes, monsieur, I've already said it. "'I know, but I thought he might have had a companion waiting for him in a taxicab outside. "'Scotland Yard men frequently travel in pairs.' "'He had no taxicab,' declared Mademoiselle Chiron positively. He walked away on foot by himself. I watched him from the window. Crewe registered a mental note of this admission. If she had watched the detective's departure from the window, she evidently had some reason for wanting to see the, the last of him. Aloud, he said, I expect I know him. What was he like? Tall, as tall as you, only bigger, much bigger and he had the great moustache which he caressed again and again with his fingers. 
Gabrielle daintily imitated the action on her own short upper lip. "'I know him,' declared Crewe with a smile. "'His name is Rolf. There should be nothing about him to alarm you, mademoiselle. Why, he is quite a ladies' man.' Gabrielle shrugged her shoulders disdainfully. "'That may be,' she replied. "'But I like him not, and I do not wish him to worry, Madame Holymead.' "'But why not let him see Mrs. Holymead?' suggested Crewe, after a short pause. "'As he only wants to ask her a few short questions, it seems to me that would be the quickest way out of the difficulty, and would save you all the trouble and worry you speak of.' "'I tell you I will not,' declared Gabrielle vehemently. "'I will not have Madame Holymead worried and made ill with a terrible ordeal.' bah what do you men so clumsy know of the delicate feelings of a lady like madame holymead the least subcon of excitement and she is disturbed distrait for days after last night after the visit of the police agent she was quite hysterical why should she be when she had nothing to be afraid of rejoined crewe he spoke in a tone of simple wonder but Gabrielle shot a quick glance at him from under her veiled lashes as she replied, "'Bah! What has that to do with it? I repeat, Monsieur Crewe, you men cannot understand the feelings of a lady like Madame Alamede in a matter like this. She and her husband were, as I have said before, intim with the great judge. They visited his house, they dined with him, they met him in society.' Behold, he is brutally, horribly killed. Madame, when she hears the terrible news, is ill for days. She cannot eat, she cannot sleep, she can interest herself in nothing. She is forgetting a little when the police agents, they catch a man and say he is the murderer. Then comes the trial of this man at the court with so queer a name, Old Bailey. The papers are full of the terrible story again of the dead man how he looked killed, how he lay in a pool of blood, how they cut him open. Madame Holymead cannot pick up a paper without seeing these things, and she falls ill again. Then the jury say the man the police agents caught is not the murderer. He goes free, and once more the talk dies away. Madame Holymead once more begins to forget when this police agent comes to her house to remind her once more all about it. "'It's too cruel, monsieur, it's too cruel!' Gabrielle's voice vibrated with indignation as she concluded, and Crewe regarded her closely. He decided that her affection for Mrs. Holymead was not simulated, and that it would be best to handle her from that point of view. "'I'm sorry,' he said coldly, "'but I do not see how I can help you.' "'Monsieur,' said the Frenchwoman, clasping her hands, I entreat you not to say so. It would be so easy for you to help. Not me, but madame. How? You know this police agent. You also are a police agent, though so much greater. Therefore you whisper just one little word in the ear of your friend the police agent, and he will not bother Madame Holymead again. I think you could do this, and if you need money to give to the police agent, why, I have brought some. She fumbled nervously at her handbag. Stay, said Crewe. What you ask is impossible. I have nothing whatever to do with Scotland Yard. I could not interfere in their inquiries, even if I wished to. They would only laugh at me. Gabrielle's dark eyes showed her disappointment, but she made one more effort to gain her end. She leant nearer to Crewe and laid a persuasive hand on his arm. "'If you would only make the effort,' she said coaxingly, "'my beautiful Madame Holymead would be for ever grateful.' "'Mademoiselle, once more I repeat that what you ask is impossible,' returned Crewe decisively. I repeat, I cannot see why Mrs. Holymead should object to answering a few questions the police wish to ask her. She is too sensitive about such a trifle. Gabrielle shrugged her shoulders slightly in tacit recognition of the fact that the man in front of her was too shrewd to be deceived by subterfuge. There is another reason, monsieur, she whispered. You had better tell it to me. 
if you had been a woman you would have guessed the great judge who was killed was in his spare moments what you call a gallant he did love my sex in france this would not matter but in england they think much of it so very much madame holymead is frightened for fear the least breath of scandal should attach to her name if the world knew that the police agent had visited her house on such an errand madame is innocent it is not necessary to assure you of that but the prudish dames of england are censorious the scotland yard people are not likely to disclose anything about it said crewe that may be so but these things come out retorted gabrielle monsieur she added after a pause and speaking in a low tone i know that you can do much very much if you will and can stop madame holymead from being worried would you do so if you were told who the murderer was i mean he who did really kill the great judge crewe was genuinely surprised but his control over his features was so complete that he did not betray it do you know who sir horace fewbanks murder is he asked in quiet even tones monsieur i do i will tell you the whole story in secret how do you say in confidence if you promise me you will help madame holymead as i have asked you i cannot enter into a bargain like that rejoined crewe i do not know whether mrs holymead may not be implicated concerned in what you say monsieur she is not flashed gabrielle indignantly she knows nothing about it what i have to tell you concerns myself alone in that case rejoined crewe i think you had better speak to me frankly and freely and if i can i will help you you are perhaps right she replied i will tell you everything provided you give me your word of honour that you will not inform the police of what i will tell you if you bind me to that promise i do not see how i can help you in the direction you indicate said crewe after a moment's thought if the police are asked to abandon their inquiries about mrs holymead they will naturally wish to know the reason you are quite right said gabrielle i did not think of that but if i tell you everything and you have to tell the police agents so as to help madame will you promise that the police agents do not come and arrest me provided you have not committed murder or been in any way accessory to it i think i can promise you that rejoined crewe monsieur i do not understand you but i can almost divine your meaning your promise is what you call a guarded one nevertheless i like your face and i will trust you Gabrielle relapsed into silence for some moments, looking at Crewe earnestly. Monsieur, she said at length, it is a terrible story I have to relate, and it is difficult for me to tell a stranger what I know. Nevertheless, I will begin. I knew the great judge well. You knew Sir Horal Fewbanks? exclaimed Crewe. He was my lover, monsieur. She brought the last two words out defiantly, with a quick glance at Crewe to see how he took the avowal. She seemed to find something reassuring in his answering glance, and she continued in more even tones. I had often seen him at the house of Madame Holymead when I came to London to visit her. I admired Sir Horace when I saw him. Often he used to call and dine, for he was the friend of Monsieur Holymead but madame told me that the great judge was what in england you call a lover of the ladies that he was dangerous so i must be careful of him i used to look at him when he called and thought he was handsome in the english way and sometimes he looked at me when he was unobserved and smiled at me but madame did not like me looking at him she said i was foolish she warned me to be careful gabrielle shrugged her shoulders expressively of what use was madame's warning it did but make me wish to know more this great lover of my sex he saw that and made the opportunity and made love to me he was so ardent so fervid a lover that i was conquered 
After we had been lovers I told him my secret, that I was married. Pierre Simon, my husband, was a bad man, and so I left him. But madame must not know that I was married, for that is my secret. It does not do to tell everything, besides it would have distressed her. Monsieur, I was happy with my lover, the great judge. He was charming. He had that charm of manner which you English lack. Faithful? I do not know. Often we were together, and often we wrote letters, when to me it was impossible. He kept my letters. They amused him so, he said, that they were so French, so piquant, so different to English ladies' letters. Alas, monsieur, there had been others, many others there must have been, for he understood my sex so well. One afternoon I was out for a walk, looking in the great shops in Regent Street, when I felt a hand placed on my shoulder, and looking round I saw Pierre, my husband. He was pleased at the meeting, but I was not pleased. He took me to a cafe where we could talk. It was what he always did talk about, money, money, money. He always wanted money. He said I must find him some, and when I told him I had none, he said I must find some way of getting it or he would come to the house and expose my secret. I walked away out of the cafe and left him there, but I soon saw him again and again. He followed me and talked to me against my will. Monsieur, I was very much distressed, and for a long time I tried to think of a way to get rid of Pierre, for I was afraid that he would come to the house and tell Madame Holymead I was married. Then I thought of the great judge, my lover, he would know how to send Pierre away, for Pierre would be frightened of him. But Sir Horace was in Scotland shooting the poor birds. But I wrote to him and asked him for my sake to come up at once, because I was in distress and needed help. Monsieur, he came, but he came to his death. He sent me a letter to meet him at Riversbrook at half-past ten o'clock. He was sorry it was so late, but he thought it would be safer not to come to the house till after dark, in the long summer evening, for people were so censorious. I was to tell Madame Olimy that I was going to the theatre with a friend. I was so pleased to think that I would get rid of Pierre, that on the morning, when he stopped me to ask me again about the money, I showed him the letter of the great judge and told him I would make the judge put him in prison if he did not go away and leave me alone. "'He is your lover,' said Pierre. "'I will kill him.' But I laughed, for I knew Pierre did not care if I had many lovers. I said to him, "'Pierre, you would extort the money, blackmail, the English call it, do they not, Monsieur Crewe? But you would not kill.' Sir Horace is not afraid of you. If you go near him, he would have you taken off to jail. But Pierre, he was deep in thought. Several times he said, I want money. Each time I said to him, Then you must work for it. That is no way to get money, he answered. This great judge, he has much money, is it not so? I left him, monsieur, thinking of money. But I did not know how bad his thoughts were. I returned home, and I told Madame Holymead I would go to the theatre that night. I left the house at eight o'clock, and after walking along Piccadilly and Regent Street, took the train to Hampstead. Then I walked up to the house of Sir Horace, so as not to be too early. The gate was opened, and I thought that strange, but I had no thought of murder. As I walked up the garden, I heard a shot two shots, and then a cry, and the sound of something falling on the floor. The door of the house was open, and the light was burning in the hall. Upstairs I heard the noise of footsteps, quick footsteps, and then I heard them coming down the staircase. I was afraid, and I hid myself behind the curtains in the hall. The footsteps came down, and nearer and nearer, and when they passed me I looked out to see. Monsieur, it was Pierre. I called to him softly, Pierre, Pierre. He looked round, and his face, it was so different, so dreadful. He did not know my voice, and he ran away from me with a cry. Monsieur, my heart is a brave one. I have not what you call nerves. 
but when i knew i was alone in the great house with i knew not what a great fear clutched me i stood still in the hall with my eyes fixed on the stairs above at first all was silent then i heard a dreadful sound a groan i wanted to run away then monsieur but the good god commanded me to go up and into the room where a fellow creature needed me i went upstairs and along to the door of a room which was half open i pushed it wide open and went in mon dieu the judge was alone there dying pierre had shot him he lay along the floor gasping groaning and the blood dripping from his breast when i saw this i ran forward and took his poor head on my knee and tried to stop the blood with my handkerchief but as i did the judge groaned once more he knew me not though i called him by name in terrible agony he writhed his head off my breast his hand clutched at the hole in his breast closing on my handkerchief and so he died monsieur strange it may seem but i do assure that i became calm again when he was dead i rose to my feet and looked around me in the room on the floor near him i saw a revolver i picked it up and hid it in my bag the tube of it was warm then i sat down in a chair and thought what i must do the police must not know i was there they must not know he was my lover i thought of my letters that i wrote to him he had them hidden in a little drawer at the back of his desk a secret drawer often he had shown me my letters there and once he had showed me where to find the spring that opened the drawer so i searched for the spring and i found it the drawer opened and there were my letters tied together i took them all and hid them in my bag and then i closed the hiding place there remained but the handkerchief which my lover held in his hand i tried to get it out but i could not in my hurry i dragged it out it came away then but left a little bit in his hand it did not show i dared not wait longer i turned out the light and hurried out of the room and downstairs again i turned out the light and closed the door and hurried away that monsieur is my story end of chapter twenty two of the hampstead mystery by john r watson and arthur j rees read by lars rolander Chapter Twenty Three of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees. Chapter Twenty Three. As Gabrielle finished her story, she cast a quick glance at Crewe's face, as though seeking to divine his decision, but apparently she could read nothing there, and with an imperious gesture she exclaimed, "'You will do what I ask now, that I have exposed my secret, my shame to you, and told everything? You will save Madame Holymead from being persecuted by these police agents?' I must ask a few questions first. The contrast between the detective's quiet English tones and the Frenchwoman's impetuous appeal was accentuated by the methodical way in which Crewe slowly jotted down an entry in his open notebook. Her dark eyes sparkled in an agony of impatience as she watched him. Ask them quick, monsieur, for I burn in the suspense in the first place then have you any hold monsieur i know what you would ask you would say if i have any proofs stupid that i am to forget things so important i have brought you the proofs she fumbled at the clasp of her handbag as she spoke and before she had finished speaking she had torn it open and emptied its contents on the table in front of crew a dainty handkerchief and a revolver see si, monsieur she cried here is the handkerchief of which i told you it is that which the judge seized when i tried to stop the blood flowing in his breast 
Look at the corner and you will see that a little bit has been torn off by his almost dead hand. And the revolver, it's that which I picked up on the floor near him. I've had it locked up ever since. Crewe examined both articles closely. The revolver was a small nickel-plated weapon with a silver chasing, with a murdered man's initials engraved in the handle. It had five chambers and one of the cartridges had been discharged. The other four chambers were still loaded. Crewe carefully extracted the cartridges and examined them closely. One of them he held up to the light in order to inspect it more minutely. "'Did you do this?' he asked. "'Have you been trying to fire off the revolver?' "'No, no, monsieur,' she exclaimed quickly. "'I would not fire. I do not understand it. I have been careful not to touch the little thing that sets it going.' "'The trigger,' said Crewe. He again studied the cartridge that had attracted his attention. It had missed fire, for on the cap was a dint where the hammer had struck it. He placed the four cartridges on the table, and turning his attention to the handkerchief, examined it minutely. It was one of those filmy scraps of muslin and lace, which ladies call a handkerchief, an article whose cost is out of all proportion to its usefulness. Gabriel, who was watching him keenly as he examined it, exclaimed, "'The handkerchief, a box of them, were given me by Sir Horace because he knew I love pretty things.' She laid a finger on the missing corner, which might indeed have been torn off in the manner described. A scrap of the lace was missing, and it was evident that it had been removed with violence, for the lace around the gap was loosened, and the muslin slightly frayed. "'You say that the corner was torn off when you wrenched the handkerchief from the dead man's hold?' said Crewe but it was not found in his hand by the police or anyone else, and he was not buried with it, for I examined the body carefully. What became of it? Gabrielle looked at him quickly, as though she suspected some trap. You would play with me, she said at length. What became of it? Why, you must surely know that the police of Scot Scotland Yard have it. The police agent who called on Madame had it. What is his name? rudolph rolf exclaimed crewe has he got it yes she replied he did not show it to me but i saw it nevertheless i dropped my handkerchief when i spoke at the telephone and monsieur rolf picked it up quickly he studied my handkerchief not this one monsieur but one of the same kind and from his pocket-book he took out the missing piece that was in the dead man's hand and he studied them side by side he thought I did not see, that my back was turned, but I saw in the mirror which hung on the wall. Then when I finished my telephone he bowed and said, "'Your handkerchief, mademoiselle? It was not so badly done for a clumsy police agent.' She was not able to recognize how keen was Crewe's interest in her statement, but she saw that she had pleased him. "'It is because of this man that he will come again.' she continued. It is because of this that he would question Madame Holymead. And then what will happen? I do not know. The police make so many mistakes, blunders, you English call them. Would they arrest her with their blunders? That is why I come to ask you to save her. May I have the revolver and the handkerchief? asked Crewe. I will take great care of them. They are at your disposal, for you will use them to confront the police agent. Crewe again examined the articles in silence before taking them to his secretary and locking them up in one of the pigeonholes. Then he turned to Gabrielle, whose large, luminous eyes met his unhesitatingly. She even smiled slightly, a frank, engaging smile, as he remarked. And now, monsieur, any more questions? Crewe smiled back at her. You have told a remarkable story, mademoiselle, and corroborated it with two important pieces of evidence, which are in themselves almost sufficient to carry conviction, he said. But the Scotland Yard police are a suspicious lot, and it is necessary for me to have further information in order to convince them, if I am able to help you as you wish. Gabrielle flashed a look of gratitude at Crewe. 
she understood from his words that he believed her story and was disposed to help her although the police of scotland yard might prove harder to convince than him bah those police agents they are the same everywhere she exclaimed they deal so much with crime that their minds get the taint and between the false and true they cannot tell the difference que voulez vous they are but small in brains with you the case is different you have it here and there she touched her temple slightly with a finger of each hand proceed monsieur ask me what questions you will i shall endeavour to answer them you said that as you were hiding behind the curtains of the stairway landing pierre your husband rushed down past you you are quite sure it was he of that monsieur unfortunately there is no doubt i saw his face quite distinctly when he passed me and when he turned round the light would be shining from behind and would not reveal his face very closely suggested crewe nevertheless monsieur it was quite sufficient for me to see pierre clearly his head was half turned as he ran as though he was looking back expecting to see the judge rise up and punish him for his dreadful deed and i saw him en silhouette oh most distinctly impossible him to mistake i called softly pierre just like that and he turned his face right round and then with a cry he disappeared along the path about what time was this the time it was half past ten for that was the time i was to be there according to the letter the judge sent me but are you sure it was half past ten weren't you early wasn't it just about ten o'clock no monsieur she replied sadly if it had been ten o'clock i would have been in time to save the life of my lover to prevent this great tragedy which brings grief to so many crewe looked at her sharply and then nodded his head in acquiescence of the fact that much misery would have been adverted if she had been in time to save the life of sir horace fewbanks when you went into the room sir horace fewbanks you say was lying on the floor dying whereabouts in the room was he if he had been in this room he would have been lying in just behind you with his head to the wall and his feet pointing towards that window he struggled and groaned after i went in and altered his position a little but not much he died so crewe rapidly reviewed his recollection of the room in which the judge had been killed once again gabrielle's statement tallied with his own reconstruction of the crime and the manner of its perpetration if the murder had been committed in his office the second bullet would have gone through the window instead of embedding itself in the wall and the judge would have fallen in the spot where she indicated and where was the writing desk from where you got your letters was crewe's next question it was over there almost by that your little bookcase there she pointed to a small oaken bookstand which stood slightly in advance of the more imposing shelves in which reposed the portentous volumes of newspaper clippings and photographs which constituted crewe's rouge library now we come to the letters you took them from the secret drawer in the desk why did you remove them because i would not have the police agents find them for then they would want to know so much and what did you do with them monsieur crewe i destroyed them when i got home i burnt them all i was so frightened you mean you were frightened to keep them in your possession after the judge was killed yes what place had i to keep them safe from prying eyes so monsieur i burnt them all one by one and the charred fragments i kept and took into the park next day where i scattered them unobserved and what became of the letter you wrote to sir horace fewbanks at Craylaith hall asking him to come to london and save you from your husband's persecutions she looked at him earnestly in the endeavour to ascertain if he had lain a trap for her sir horace destroyed it in scotland i suppose if the police did not find it strange that he should have kept all your other letters so carefully and destroyed that one perhaps it was in his pocket-book that was stolen 
I do not know. What does it matter? It has gone. She shrugged her shoulders lightly and indifferently. Do you know who stole the pocketbook? No, monsieur. I thought it was stolen in the train. That is the police theory, replied Crewe. But let that go. Have you since the night of the murder seen anything of Pierre? Monsieur, I have not. It is as though the earth has him swallowed. He keeps silent with the silence of the grave. He is wise to do so, responded Crewe. Now, mademoiselle, I have no more questions to ask you. Your confidence is safe. You need be under no apprehensions on that score. I care not for myself, Monsieur Crewe, so long as Madame Holymead is freed from the persecutions of the police agents, replied Gabrielle, rising from her seat as she spoke. If, after hearing my story, you could but give me the assurance. I think I can safely promise you that Mrs. Holymead will not be troubled with any further police attentions, said Crewe after a moment's pause. Gabrielle broke into profuse expressions of gratitude as she turned to go. For the rest, then, I care not what happens. I am, how do you say it? I am overjoyed. Je vous remercie, monsieur. I beg you not. I can find my way out unattended. But Crewe showed her to the stairs, where again he had to listen to her profuse thanks before she finally departed. He watched her graceful figure till it was lost to sight in the winding staircase, and then he turned back to his office. In the outer office he stopped to speak to Joe, who, perched on an office footstool, was tapping quickly on the office table with his penknife, swaying backwards and forwards dangerously on his perch in the intensity of his emotions, as he played the hero's part in the drama of saving the runaway engine from dashing into the 440 express by calling up the Red Gulch station on the wire. "'Joe,' said Crewe, "'I'll see nobody for an hour at least. Nobody!' you understand joe came out of the cinema world long enough to nod his head in an emphatic understanding of the instructions in his own room crewe pulled out his notebook and once more gave himself up to the study of the baffling riversbrook mystery in the new light of gabrielle's confession part of her story he reflected must be true she had produced sir horace's revolver and still more important a handkerchief which he had clutched in his dying struggles. It was obvious that she or some other woman had been at Riversbrook the night of the murder, and in the room with the murdered man before he died. That tallied with Birchill's statement to Hill that he had seen a woman close the front door and walk along the garden path while he was hiding in the garden. Crewe, recalling Gabrielle's description of the room, came to the conclusion that it was probably she who had been with the judge in his dying moments. No one but a person who had actually seen it could have described the room with such minuteness. She had been in the room, then. For what object? For the reason stated in her confession? Crewe shook his head doubtfully. She evaded the trap about the pocket-book. But she made one bad mistake, he mused. The letters in the secret drawer were taken away, and I have no doubt were burnt, as she says. But were they her letters? Was Sir Horace her lover? At any rate, she did not get hold of them in the way she said. They were not taken away on the night Sir Horace was murdered, for the simple reason that they were not in the secret drawer at that time. End of chapter 23 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 24 of The Hampstead Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde the Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Rees. Chapter 24 
Rolf was spending a quiet evening in his room after a trying day's inquiries into a confidence trick case, inquiries so fruitless that they had brought down on his head an official reproof from Inspector Chippenfield. Rolf had left Scotland Yard that evening in a somewhat despondent frame of mind in consequence, but a brisk walk home and a good supper had done him so much good that with a tranquil mind and his pipe in his mouth he was able to devote himself to the hobby of his leisure hours with keen enjoyment. This hobby would have excited the wondering contempt of Joe Lever, whose frequent attendance at cinema theatres had led him to the conclusion that police detectives, who, unlike his master, had to take the rough with the smooth, spent their spare time practicing revolver-shooting, and throwing daggers at an ace of hearts on the wall. Rolf's hobby was nothing more exciting than stamp-collecting. He was deeply versed in the lore of stamps, and his private ambition was to become the possessor of a blue meridius. His collection, though extensive, was by no means of fabulous value, being made up chiefly of modest purchases from the stamp-collecting shops, and finds in the waste-paper baskets at Scotland Yard, after the arrival of foreign mails. That day he had made a particularly good haul from the waste-paper baskets, for his catch included several comparatively good specimens from Japan and Fiji. He sat gloating over these treasures, examining them carefully and holding each one up to the light as he separated it from the piece of paper to which it had been affixed. He pasted them one by one in his stamp album with loving, lingering fingers, adjusting each stamp in its little square in the book with meticulous care. He was so absorbed in this occupation that he did not hear the ascending footsteps drawing nearer to his door, and did not see a visitor at the door when the footsteps ceased. It was Crewe's voice that recalled him back from the stamp collector's imaginary world. "'Why, Mr. Crewe,' said Rolf, with evident pleasure, "'who'd have thought of seeing you?' "'Your landlady asked me if I'd come up myself,' said Crewe, in explaining his intrusion. "'She's too much worried and put about to say nothing of having a bad back.' To show me upstairs. I've never known her to be well, said Rolf with a laugh. Every morning when she brings up my breakfast, I've got to hear details of her bad back which should be kept for the confidential ear of the doctor. But she regards me as a son, I think. I've been here so long. But now you are here, Mr. Crewe. Rolf waited in polite expectation that his visitor would disclose the object of his visit. But Crewe seemed in no hurry to do so. He produced his cigar-case and offered Rolf a cigar, which the latter accepted with a pleasant recollection of the excellent flavor of the cigars the private detective kept. When each of them had his cigar well alight, Crewe glanced at the open stamp album and commenced talking about stamps. It was a subject which Rolf was always willing to discuss. Crewe declared that he was an ignorant outsider as far as stamps were concerned, but he professed to have a respectful admiration for those who immersed themselves in such a fascinating subject. Rolf, with the fervid egoism of the collector, talked about stamps for a half an hour, without recalling that his visitor must have come to talk about something else. "'I've got a small stamp collection in my office,' said Crewe, when Rolf paused for a moment. "'It belonged to that Jewish diamond merchant who was shot in Hatton Gardens two years ago. You remember his case?' "'Rather. That was a smart bit of work of yours, Mr. Crewe, in laying your hands on the woman who did it and getting back the diamond?' Crewe smiled in response. "'The Jew was very grateful, poor fellow.' He died in the hospital after the trial, so she was lucky to escape with twelve years. He left me a diamond ring and a stamp album that had come into his possession. "'I should like to see it,' said Rolf eagerly. "'It is more than likely that there are some good specimens in it. 
The Jews are keen collectors. If you let me have a look at it, I'll tell you what the collection is worth. You can have it altogether, said Crewe. I'll send my boy Joe around with it in the morning. Oh, Mr. Crewe, it is very good of you, said Rolfe, with the covetousness of the collector shining in his eyes. Nonsense! Why shouldn't you have it? But I didn't come around here solely to talk about stamps, Rolfe. I came to have a little chat about the Riversbrook case. How are you getting on with it? Why, really, said Rolfe, I've not done much with it since, since, since Birchill was acquitted, eh? But you are not letting it drop altogether, are you? That would be a pity, such an interesting case. Whom have you your eye on now as the right man? Rolf, who thought he detected a suspicion of banter in Crewe's remarks, evaded the latter question by answering the first part of Crewe's inquiry. Why, hardly that, Mr. Crewe, but the chief is not very keen on the case. Birchill's acquittal was too much of a blow to him. He reckons that nowadays juries are too soft-hearted to convict a capital charge. It's just as well that they are too soft-hearted to convict the wrong man said Crewe. "'Yes, you told me from the first that we were on the wrong track,' said the reply. "'I haven't forgotten that, and the chief is not allowed to forget it either. All the men at the yard know that you held the opinion that we had got hold of the wrong man when we arrested Birchill, and he has had to stand so much chaff in the office that he's pretty raw about it. Rolfe spoke in the detached tone of a junior who had no share in his chief's mistakes or their attendant humiliation. And he added, That's once more that you've scored over Scotland Yard, Mr. Crewe, and you ought to be proud of it. He glanced covertly at Crewe to see how he took the flattery. So you've done very little about the case since Birchill was acquitted? was his only remark. I've been so busy, replied Rolfe again evading the question, and avoiding meeting Crewe's glance by turning over the leaves of his stamp album. You see, there has been a rush of work at Scotland Yard lately. There is that big burglary at Lord Emden's, and the case of the woman whose body was found in the river lock at Peyton, and a half a dozen other cases, all important in their way. There has been quite an epidemic of crime lately, as you know, Mr. Crewe, I don't seem to get a minute to myself these times. Rolf said Crewe dryly, you protest too much. You don't suppose that after coming over here to see you that I can be deceived by such talk? Rolf flushed at these uncompromising words, but before he could speak, Crewe proceeded in a milder tone. I don't blame you a bit for trying to put me off. It's all part of the game. We're rivals, in a sense, and you are quite right not to lose sight of that fact. But as a detective, Rolf, your methods lack polish. Really, I blush for them. You might have known that I came over here to see you tonight because I had an important object in view, and you should have tried to find out what it was before playing your own cards. And such cards, too. You're sadly lacking in finesse, Rolf. You'd never make a chess player. Your concealed intentions are too easily discovered. You must try not to be so transparent if you want to succeed in your profession. Crewe delivered his reproof with such good humor that Rolf stared at him as if unable to make out what his visitor was driving at. I don't know what you are talking about, Mr. Crewe, he said at length. Oh, yes, you do. You know I'm speaking about your latest move in the Riversbrook case, which you've been so busy with of late, and I've come to tell you in a friendly way that once more you're on the wrong track. What do you mean? asked Rolf quickly. Why, Princess Gate, of course, replied Crewe cheerily. You don't suppose that a fine-looking young man like yourself could be seen in the neighborhood of Princess Gate? without causing a flutter among feminine hearts there, do you? So the servants have been talking, have they? muttered Rolf. They have and they haven't, but that's beside the point. 
What I want to say is that you're on the wrong track in suspecting Mrs. Holymead, and I strongly advise you to drop your inquiries if you don't want to get yourself into hot water. She's as innocent of the murder of Sir Horace Fewbanks as Birchill is, but you cannot afford to make a false shot in the case of a lady of her social standing as you did with a criminal like Birchill. At this rebuke Rolf gave way to irritation. "'Look here, Mr. Crewe, I'll thank you to mind your own business,' he said. "'It's got nothing to do with you where I make inquiries. I'll have you remember that. I don't interfere with you, and I won't have you interfering with me.' "'But I'm interfering only for your own good, man. What do you suppose I'm doing it for?' I tell you, you're writing for a very bad fall in suspecting Mrs. Holymead and shadowing her. Crewe's plain words were an echo of a secret fear which Rolfe had entertained from the time his suspicions were directed towards Mrs. Holymead. But he was not going to allow Crewe to think he was alarmed. If I'm making inquiries about Mrs. Holymead, it's because I have ample justification for doing so he said stiffly. "'And I tell you that you have not.' "'Prove it!' exclaimed Rolf defiantly. Crewe produced from his pocket a revolver and a lady's handkerchief, and handed them to Rolf without speaking. Rolf's embarrassment was almost equal to his astonishment as he examined the articles. In the handkerchief, with its missing corner, he speedily recognized something for which he had searched in vain. He had never confided to Crewe the discovery of the missing corner in the dead man's hand, and therefore the production of the handkerchief by Crewe considerably embarrassed him. He longed to ask Crewe how he had obtained possession of the handkerchief, but he could not trust his voice to frame the question without betraying his feelings. So he picked up the revolver and examined it closely. Then he put it down and again gave his attention to the handkerchief, bending his head over it so the crew should not see his face. "'You do not seem very astonished at my finds, Rolf,' said Crewe quizzically. "'Perhaps you've seen these articles before?' "'No, I haven't,' said Rolf, still avoiding his visitor's eye. "'Well, the torn handkerchief is not exactly new to you,' said Crewe. "'You've got the missing part. You found it in Sir Horace's hand after he was murdered.' "'You're too clever for me, and that's the simple truth, Mr. Crewe,' said Rolf in a mortified tone. "'I did find a small piece of a lady's handkerchief in his hand, and here it is.' He produced his pocket-book and took out the piece. How you found out I had it is more than I know. Mere guesswork, said Crewe. Rolf shook his head slowly. I know better than that, he said. You're deep. You don't miss much. I wish now that I had told you about that bit of handkerchief at the first. But Chippenfield and I wanted to have all the credit for elucidating the Riversbrook mystery. I hunted high and low to get trace of this handkerchief, but I couldn't. And now you've beaten me, although you couldn't have known at first that there was such a thing as a missing handkerchief in the case. I hope you bear me no malice, Mr. Crewe. What for, Rolf? For not telling you about the handkerchief, after I found this piece in Sir Horace's hand. Not in the least, said Crewe. Why should you have told me? I don't tell you everything I find out. It's all part of the game. That piece of the handkerchief was a good find, Rolf, and I congratulate you on getting it. How did you come to discover it? I was trying to force open the murdered man's hand, and I found it clenched between the little finger and the next. Of course, it was not visible with his hand closed. Chippenfield, who missed it, didn't half like my discovery, and all along he underestimated the value of it as a clue. Well, he has had to pay for his folly. He has, and serves him right, replied Rolf viciously. 
He's the most pig-headed, obstinate, vain, narrow-minded man you could come across. It occurred to Rolfe that it was not exactly good form on his part to condemn his superior officer so vigorously in the presence of a rival, so he broke off abruptly and asked Crewe how he came into possession of the revolver and the handkerchief. Crewe's reply was that he had obtained these articles under a promise of secrecy from someone who had assured him that Mrs. Holymead had no connection with the crime. When he was at liberty to tell the story as it had been told to him, Rolfe would be the first to hear it. "'Mrs. Holymead had no connection with the crime?' exclaimed Rolfe impatiently. "'Perhaps you don't know that the morning after the murder was discovered, she went out to Riversbrook and removed some secret papers from the murdered man's desk, papers that he had been in the habit of hiding in a secret drawer. Yes, I know that, said Crewe. Well, doesn't that look as if she knew something about the crime? Not necessarily. Well, to me it does. What were these secret papers? They were letters, I am told. I believe so. And you, Rolf, as a man of the world, know that a married woman would not like the police to get possession of letters she had written to a man of the reputation of Sir Horace Fewbanks. I admit that her action is capable of a comparatively innocent interpretation, but taken in conjunction with other things, it looks to me mighty suspicious. In Hill's statement to us, he told us, that on the night of the murder, Birchill, when hiding in the garden waiting for the lights to go out before breaking into the house, heard the front door slam and saw a stylish sort of a woman walk down the path to the gate. That was not Mrs. Holymead, said Crewe. How do you know? If it was not her, who was it? Do you know? I think I know, and when I am at liberty to speak, I will tell you. Then there is a third point, continued Rolf. Look at this handkerchief you brought. I saw a handkerchief of exactly similar pattern at Mrs. Holymead's house when I called there. Wasn't that the property of her French cousin, Mademoiselle Chiron? Yes, she dropped it on the floor while I was there. But it is probable the handkerchief was one of a set given her by Mrs. Holymead. Quite probably, Rolf. But scores of ladies who are fond of expensive things have handkerchiefs of a similar pattern. You will find, if you inquire among the West End shops, that although it is a dainty expensive article from the man's point of view, there is nothing singular about the quality or the pattern. Perhaps so, said Rolf, but the possession of handkerchiefs of this kind is surely suspicious when taken in conjunction with her removal of the letters. I wish I could get hold of that infernal scoundrel Hill again. I am convinced that he knows a great deal more about this murder than he has yet told us, and a great deal more about Mrs. Holymead and her letters. I've had his shop watch day and night since he disappeared, but he keeps close to his burrow, and I've not been able to get on his track. I'd give up watching for him if I were you, said Crewe, as he flicked the ash of his cigar into the fireplace. You're not likely to find him now. As a matter of fact, he has left the country. Hill left the country, echoed Rolf. I think you are mistaken there, Mr. Crewe. He had no money. How could he get away? Crewe selected another cigar from his case and lighted it before answering. The fact is, I advanced him the money, he said. Technically, it's a loan, but I do not think any of it will be paid back. Rolf stared hard at Crewe to see if he was joking. What on earth made you do that? he demanded at length. Hill may be the actual murderer for all we know. Not at all, was the reply. Before I helped him to leave England, I satisfied myself that he had absolutely nothing to do with the murder. He does not know who shot Sir Horace Fewbanks, though, of course, he still half believes that it was Birchill. When I got in touch with him after his disappearance, 
He was in a pitiable state of fright. Waking or sleeping, he couldn't get his mind off the gallows. There were two or three points on which I wanted his assistance in clearing up the Riversbrook case, and I promised to get him out of the country if he would make a clean breast of things and tell me the truth as far as he knew it. He made a confession, a true one this time. I took it down, and I'll let you have a copy. There are a few interesting points on which it differs materially from the statement he made to the police when you and Chippenfield cornered him. "'What are they?' asked Rolf. "'In the first place, the burglary was his idea, and not Birchill's,' replied Crewe. After the quarrel between Sir Horace and the girl Fanning, he went out to her flat and suggested to Birchill that he should rob Riversbrook. Hill's real object in arranging this burglary was to get possession of the letters which Mrs. Holymead subsequently removed, but he did not tell Birchill this. His plan was to go to Riversbrook the morning after the burglary, and then break open Sir Horace's desk, and open the secret drawer before informing the police of the burglary. To the police and Sir Horace it would look as though the burglar had accidentally found the spring of the secret drawer. With these letters in his possession, Hill intended to blackmail Sir Horace, or Mrs. Holymead, without disclosing himself in the transaction. When Sir Horace returned unexpectedly from Scotland on the 18th of August, Hill had just removed the letters from the desk, being afraid that when Birchill broke into the house he might find them accidentally. He was naturally in a state of alarm at Sir Horace's return. He tried to get an opportunity to put the letters back, as Sir Horace might discover they had been removed, but Sir Horace dismissed him for the night before he could get such an opportunity. Then he went to Fanning's flat and told Birchill that Sir Horace had returned. Birchill was in favor of postponing the burglary, but Hill, who had possession of the letters, and did not know when he would get an opportunity to put them back, urged Birchill to carry out the burglary. He assured Birchill that Sir Horace was a very sound sleeper, and that there would be no risk. In order to arouse Birchill's cupidity, and to protect himself from the suspicions of Sir Horace regarding the letters, he told Birchill that he had seen a large sum of money in his possession when he returned, and that this money would probably be hidden in the secret drawer of the desk, until Sir Horace had an opportunity of banking it. He told Birchill to break open the desk, and explained to him how to find the spring of the secret drawer. "'What a damned cunning scoundrel he is!' exclaimed Rolf, in unwilling admiration of the completeness of Hill's scheme. "'Don't you think, Mr. Crewe, that, after all, he may be the actual murderer? That he told you a lot of lies, just as he did to us? Holymead, in his address to the jury, made out a pretty strong case against him.' "'No one knows better than Holymead that Hill did not commit the murder,' said Crewe. "'Hill is an incorrigible liar, but he has no nerve for murder.' "'Did he put the letters back?' asked Rolf. "'He told me that Mrs. Holymead stole them the day after the murder was discovered, but he is such a liar.' "'I believe he spoke the truth in that case,' said Crewe. He told me he put the letters back in the secret drawer the night after the murder, when he went to Riversbrook to report himself to Chippenfield. He put them back because he was afraid that if the police found them in his possession, they would think he had a hand in the murder. His idea was to remove them from the secret drawer after the excitement about the murder died down, and then blackmail Mrs. Holymead but she acted with the skill and decision that robbed him of his chance to blackmail her. "'How did you get hold of the cunning scoundrel?' asked Rolf. "'I've had his wife's shop watch day and night, as I've said. I made sure he would try to communicate with her sooner or later, but he didn't.' "'It was Joe who found him,' said Crewe. "'I knew you were watching Mrs. Hill's shop, 
so it was superfluous for me to set anybody to watch it. Besides, I didn't think Hill would visit his wife or attempt to communicate with her, for he would think that the police, if they wanted him, would be sure to watch the shop. I tried to consider what a man like Hill would do in the circumstances. He had no money, I knew that, and, so far as I was able to ascertain, he had no friends who were likely to hide him. Without friends or money he could not go very far. Finally it occurred to me that he might be hiding somewhere in Riversbrook, either in that unfinished portion of the third floor, or in one of the outbuildings. He knew the run of the rambling old place so well. Have you ever been over it carefully? No? Well, there are several good places in the upper stories where a man might conceal himself. I put Joe on the job, and after watching for several nights, Joe got him. Hill had made a hiding-place in the loft above the garage. It appears that he subsisted on the stores that had been left in the house. He was able to make his way into the main building through one of the kitchen windows. He was on one of these foraging expeditions when Joe discovered him, emaciated, dirty, and half-demented through terror of the gallows. "'So that is how you got him,' said Rolfe. I never thought of looking for him at Riversbrook. Sometimes I am inclined to agree with you that he had no nerve for murder. But an unpremeditated murder doesn't want much nerve. He might have done it in a moment of passion. Rolfe was endeavoring to take advantage of Crewe's communicative mood, and to arrive by a process of elimination at the person against whom Crewe had accumulated his evidence. "'It was not Hill,' said Crewe. "'The murder was committed in a moment of passion, "'and yet it was far from being unpremeditated. "'You are trying to mystify me,' said Rolfe despairingly. "'No, it is the case itself which has mystified you,' replied Crewe. "'It has,' was Rolfe's candid confession. "'The more thought I give it, the more impossible it seems to see through it.' Was Sir Horace killed before dusk, before the lights were turned on? If he was killed after dark, who turned out the lights? He was killed between ten and ten-thirty at night, said Crewe. The lights were turned out by the woman Birchill saw leaving the house about ten-thirty, but she was not the murderer, and she was not present in the room or even in the house when Sir Horace was shot. She arrived a few minutes too late to prevent the tragedy. Turning out the lights was an instinctive act due to her desire to hide the crime, or rather to hide the murderer. "'How do you know all this?' asked Rolfe, who had been staring at Crewe with open-mouthed astonishment. "'That woman was not Mrs. Holymead,' continued Crewe. I had a visit to-day from the woman who did these things, and, as evidence of the truth of her story, she brought me the revolver and the handkerchief. "'What did she come to you for?' asked Rolfe, with breathless interest. "'What did she want?' "'She came to me to make a full confession,' said Crewe, in even tones. "'A confession!' exclaimed Rolfe. "'She ought to have come to the police.' Why didn't she come to us? Crewe smiled at the puzzled, indignant detective. I think she came to me because she wanted to mislead me, he said. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of the Hampstead Mystery – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Chapter 25 Joe Lever Worn out after nearly a week's work of watching the movements of Mr. Holymead, 
had fallen asleep in an empty loft above a garage which overlooked Verney's Hotel in Mayfair. He had seen Mr. Holymy disappear into the hotel, and he knew from the experience gained in his watch that the K.C. would spend the next couple of hours in dressing for dinner, sitting down to that meal, and smoking a cigar in the lounge. So Joe had relaxed, for the time being, the new task which his master had set him, and had flung himself on some straw in the loft to rest. He did not intend to go to sleep, but he was very tired, and in a few minutes he was in a profound slumber. In his sleep Joe dreamt that he had attained the summit of his ambition, and was being paid a huge salary by an American film company to display himself in emotional dramas for the educational improvement of the British working classes. In his dream he had to rescue the heroine from the clutches of the villains who had carried her off. They had imprisoned her at the top of a skyscraper building and locked the lift. But Joe climbed the fire escape and caught the beautiful girl in his arms. The villains, who were on the watch, set fire to the building, and when Joe attempted to climb out of the window with the heroine clinging round his neck, the flames drove him back. As he stood there, the wind swept a sheet of flame towards Joe until it scorched his face. The pain was so real that Joe opened his eyes and sprang up with a cry. A man was standing over him, a man past middle age, short and broad in figure, whose clean-shaven face directed attention to his protruding jaw. He was wearing a blue serge suit which had seen much use. "'You are a sleeper, Sonny,' said the man, grinning at Joe's alarm. "'But when you wake, why you wake up properly?' "'I'll say that for you. You nearly broke my pipe. You woke up that sudden.' He made this remark with such a malicious grin that Joe, whose face was still smarting, had no hesitation in connecting his sudden awakening with the hot bowl of the man's pipe. It was a joke Joe had often seen played on drunken men in Islington public houses in his young days. "'You just leave me alone, will you?' he said, rubbing his cheek ruefully. "'It's nothing to do with you whether I'm sound sleeper or not.' "'That's just where you're wrong, young fellow,' was the reply. "'It's a lot to do with me. Ain't your name Joe Lever?' Joe nodded his head. "'How did you find out?' he asked. "'Perhaps a friend of mine pointed you out to me.' "'Perhaps it did, and perhaps it didn't,' said Joe. "'Anyway, what's your name?' "'Mr. Kemp is my name, my boy.' and unless you're pretty civil i'll give you cause to remember it what have you got to do with me asked the boy in an injured tone i've never done nothing to you you mind your p's and q's and me and you'll get along all right said mr kemp in a somewhat softer tone when you ask me what i've got to do with you my answer is i've got a lot to do with you for i am your guardian so to speak Joe looked at Mr. Kemp with a gleam of comprehension in his amazement. He had some experience in his Islington days of the strange phenomena produced by drink. "'Rats!' he retorted rudely. "'I've never had a guardian, and I don't want none. What made you a guardian, I'd like to know?' "'Your father did,' was the reply. "'Oh, him,' said Joe in a tone which indicated pronounced antipathy to his parent. "'Do you know him? Are you one of his sort? Now don't try to be insulting, my boy, or I'll take you across my knee. We won't say nothing about where your father is, because in high society Wormwood Scrubs isn't mentioned. All we'll say is that he's been unfortunate like many another man before him.' and that for the present he can't come and go as he likes. But he has still got a father's heart, Joe, and there are times when he worries about his family, and about there being no one with them to keep an eye on them, and see they grow up a credit to him. 
He has been particularly worried about you, Joe. So when I was coming away, he asked me to look you up if I had time and let him know how you was getting on, seeing that no one of his family has gone near him for a matter of three years or so, though there is one regular visiting day each week. I don't want to see him no more, said Joe. He's no good. That's a nice way for a boy to talk about his own father, said Mr. Kemp in a reproving tone. I don't know what the young generation is coming to. If you want to send him word about me, you can tell him that I'm not going to be a thief, said Joe defiantly. No, said Mr. Kemp tauntingly. You'd sooner be a narc. Yes, I would, said the boy. And that's what you are now, declared the man wrathfully. You're a narc for that fellow crew. I know all about you. I'm earning an honest living, said Joe. As a narc, said Mr. Kemp with a sneer. I'm earnest and honest living, said the boy doggedly. So much of his youth had been spent among the criminal classes that he still retained the feeling that there was an indelible stigma attached to those individuals described as narcs. How can anyone earn a respectable, honest living by being a narc? asked Mr. Kemp contemptuously. And more than that, it's one of the best men that ever breathed that you are a spying on. I'll have you know that he's a friend of mine. That is to say, he's done things for me that I ain't likely to forget. There's nothing I won't do for him, if the chance comes my way. I'll see that no harm happens to him through you and your Mr. Crewe. You've got to stop this here spying. Stop it at once, do you understand? For if you don't, by God, I'll deal with you so that you'll do no more spying in this world. And I'll have you and your master know that I'm a man what means what he says. Mr. Kemp shook his fist angrily at Joe as he moved away to the door of the loft after having delivered his menacing warning. My last words to you is, stop it, he said as he turned to go down the stairs. Half an hour later, Mr. Kemp entered the lounge of Verney's hotel as though in quest for someone. Most of the hotel guests had finished their after-dinner coffee and liquors, and the hall was comparatively empty, but a few who remained raised their eyes in well-bred protest at the intrusion of a member of the lower orders into the corridor of an exclusive hotel. Mr. Kemp felt somewhat out of place, and he stared about the luxuriously furnished lounge with a look in which A mingled with admiration. Before he could advance further, a liveried porter of massive proportions came up to him and barred the way. "'Now, now, my man,' said the porter haughtily, "'what do you think you are doing here? This ain't your place, you know.' you made a mistake. Out you go. I want to see Mr. Holymead, said Mr. Kemp in a gruff voice. Vernice was such a high-class hotel that seedy-looking persons seldom dared to put a foot within the palatial entrance. The porter, unused to dealing with the obtrusive, impecunious type to which he believed Mr. Kemp to belong, made the mistake of trying to argue with him. "'Want to see Mr. Holymead?' he repeated. "'How do you know he's here? Who told you? What do you want to see him for?' "'What's that got to do with you?' retorted Mr. Kemp. "'You don't think Mr. Holymead would like me to discuss his business with the likes of you? "'That ain't what you're here for. You go and tell Mr. Holymead that someone wants to see him. Tell him Mr. Kemp wants to see him.' Mr. Kemp drew himself up and buttoned the coat of his faded serge suit. The porter, uncertain how to deal with the situation, looked around for help. The manager of the hotel emerged from the booking office at that moment, and the porter's appealing look was seen by him. The manager approached. He was faultlessly attired, suave in demeanour, and walked with a noiseless step despite his tendency to corpulence. 
It was his daily task to wrestle with some of the manifold difficulties arising out of the eccentricities of human nature as exhibited by a constant stream of arriving and departing guests. But though he approached the distressed porter with full confidence in his ability to deal with any situation, his eyebrows arched in astonishment as he took in the full details of the intruder's attire. "'What does this mean, Hawkins?' he exclaimed in a tone of disapproval. The porter trembled at the implication that he had grievously failed in his duty by allowing such an individual as Mr. Kemp to get so far within the exclusive portals of Verney's, and in his nervousness he relaxed from the polish of the hotel's porter to his native cockney. "'This air party says he wants to see Mr. Holymead, sir.' The manager went through the motion of washing a spotlessly clean pair of hands, and then brought the palms together in a gentle clap. He smiled pityingly at Hawkins, and then looked condescendingly at Mr. Kemp. "'Wants to see Mr. Holymead, does he?' he said, transferring his glance to the worried porter. "'And didn't you tell him that Mr. Holymead has gone to the theatre, and won't be back for some considerable time?' "'That's a lie,' said Mr. Kemp, who had acquired none of the art of dealing with his fellow men, and was too uneducated to appreciate art in any form. "'I've been watching over the other side of the street, and I saw him passing a window not ten minutes ago. I'm going to see him if I wait here all night. I'll soon make myself comfortable in one of them big chairs.' He pointed to an empty chair beside a man in evening dress who was holding a conversation with a haughty-looking matron. "'You tell Mr. Holomid Mr. Kemp wants to see him,' he said to the manager. "'What name did you say?' asked the manager, in a tone which seemed to express astonishment that the lower orders had names. "'Mr. Kemp. You tell him Mr. Kemp wants to see him on important business.' He walked towards the vacant chair and seated himself on it. He dug his toes into the velvet-piled carpet with the air of a man who was trying to take anchor. Fortunately the man on the adjoining chair and the haughty matron were so engrossed in their conversation that they did not notice that the air in their immediate vicinity was being polluted by the presence of a man in shabby clothes and heavy boots. The manager dispatched the porter in search of Mr. Holymead, and then went in pursuit of Mr. Kemp. "'Will you come this way, if you please, Mr. Kemp?' he said with a low bow. He saw that Mr. Kemp was following him, and led the way into an unfrequented corner of the smoking-room, where, with the information that Mr. Holymead would come to him in a few moments, he asked Mr. Kemp to be seated. The manager withdrew a few yards, and then took up a position which enabled him to guard the hotel guests from having their digestions interfered with by the contaminating spectacle of a seedy man. To the manager's great relief, Mr. Holymead appeared, having been informed by the hall porter that a party who said his name was Kemp had asked to see him. The manager hurried towards Mr. Holymead, and endeavoured to explain and apologise, but the K.C. assured him that there was nothing to apologise for. He went over to the corner of the smoking-room, where the visitor who had caused so much perturbation was waiting for him. "'Well, Kemp, what do you want?' There was nothing in his manner to indicate that he was put out by Mr. Kemp's appearance. He spoke in quiet, even tones, such as would seem to suggest that he was well acquainted with this visitor. "'Can I speak to you on the quiet for a moment, sir?' whispered Kemp hoarsely. Holymead looked round the room. The manager had gone back to the booking office, and Hawkins had vanished. The few people who were in the room seemed occupied with their own affairs. "'No one will overhear us if we speak quietly,' he said as he took a seat close to Kemp. "'What is it?' "'You're watched and followed, sir,' said Kemp in a whisper, 
Somebody has been watching this place for days past, and whenever you go out you are followed. By whom? asked Holymead. By a warmint of a boy, a slippery young imp, whose father's in jail for a long stretch. I got hold of him this afternoon and told him what I'd do to him if he kept on with this game. He's living in an old loft at the back of the hotel garage, and he keeps a watch on you day and night. I thought I'd better come here and tell you, as you mightn't know about him. You did quite right, Kemp. What's this boy like? An undersized putty-faced brat with a big head. He's about fourteen or fifteen, I should say. Who is he? Do you know him? Lever is the name, sir. To tell you the truth, I don't know him as well as I know his father. His father is a lifer for manslaughter. I've known him both in and out of jail. And when I was coming out four months ago, Bob Lever, this here boy's father, asked me to look up his family and send him word about them. I went to the address Bob told me, in Islington, but I found they had all gone. The mother was dead, and the kids, a girl and this air boy, had cleared out. The old Jew who had the second-hand clothes shop Mr. Sleever used to keep told me that the boy had gone off with that private detective crew more than two years ago. So it looks to me as if he has turned knock, and crew has put him on to watch you. Can you describe this boy more closely? Ah, oh, well, sir, I don't know if I can say anything more about him, except that he has red hair and big bright eyes that are too large for his face. I thought so, said Holymead, as if speaking to himself. It's the same boy. What did you say, sir? asked Kemp. Nothing, Kemp, except that I think I've seen a boy of this description hanging about the street near the hotel. Holymead rose to his feet as he spoke, as an indication that the interview was at an end. Kemp got up and looked at him anxiously. I beg your pardon, sir, for coming here, he said, fumbling with the rim of his hat as he spoke. I didn't know how you'd take it, but I hope I've done right. They didn't want to let me see you. You did quite right, Kemp. I'm very much obliged to you. He was feeling in his pocket for silver, but Kemp stopped him. No, no, sir. I don't want to be paid anything. I wanted to oblige you like. I wanted to do you a good turn. I'd do anything for you, sir. You know I would. I believe you would, Kemp. Good night. Good night, sir. As Kemp passed down the hall, he met the manager, who was obviously pleased to see such an unwelcome visitor making his departure. Kemp scolded at the manager, as if he were a valued patron of the hotel, and said, it seems to me that you don't know how to treat people properly when they come here. End of chapter 25 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 26 of The Hampstead Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Chapter 26 it was the first occasion on which Mrs. Holymead had visited her husband's chambers in the Middle Temple. Mr. Mattingford, who had been Mr. Holymead's clerk for nearly twenty years, seemed to realize that the visit was important, though as a married man he knew that a meeting between husband and wife in town was usually so commonplace as to verge on boredom for the husband. 
There were occasions when he had to meet Mrs. Mattingford, but these meetings were generally for the purpose of handing over to the lady her weekly dress allowance of ten shillings out of his salary, so that she might attend the sales at the big drapery shops in the West End and inspect the windows containing expensive articles that she could not hope to buy. Mr. Mattingford was an exceedingly thrifty man, and his wife possessed some of the qualities of a spendthrift. Thus it came about that Mr. Mattingford kept up the fiction that he had no savings, and that each week's salary must see him through till the next week. Mrs. Mattingford knew that her husband had saved money, and theoretically she would have given a great deal to know how much. She repeatedly accused him of being a miser, but this is a wifely denunciation which in all classes of life is lightly made when the purchase of feminine finery is under discussion. There are some men who resent it, but Mr. Mattingford was not one of these. Protests and prayers, abuse and cajolery were alike powerless to win his consent to his wife's perpetual proposal that she should be allowed to draw her dress allowance for some months or even some weeks ahead. Mr. Mattingford had a horror of bad debts. He endeavoured to show his wife that the transaction she proposed was unsound from a business point of view and reckless from a legal point of view. She had no security to offer for the repayment of the advance, even if he were in a financial position to make the advance, and he stoutly declared that he was not. She might die at any moment, and then he would be left with no means of redress against her estate, because she had no estate. Of course, if she first insured her life out of her dress allowance and handed the policy to him, it would constitute protection for the repayment of the advance in the event of her death. But it was not any real protection in the event of her continuing to live, for a newly executed policy had no surrender value. As his own legal adviser, Mr. Mattingford strongly urged himself not to consider his wife's proposal, and such was his respect for the law and for those who had been brought up in a legal atmosphere that he had no hesitation in accepting the advice. He was a little man of nearly fifty years, with a very bald head and an extremely long moustache which, when waxed at the ends, made him look as fierce as a clipped poodle. He knew Mrs. Holymead from his having called frequently at his chief's house in Princess Gate on business matters, and he admired her for her good looks, but still more for her good taste in staying away from her husband's chambers. There were some ladies, the wives of barristers, who almost haunted their husbands' chambers, a practice of which Mr. Mattingford strongly disapproved. It seemed to him an insidious attempt on the part of an insidious sex to force the legal profession to throw open its doors to women. As a man who had lived in the mouldy atmosphere of precedent, Mr. Mattingford hated the idea of change and to him the thought of a lady in wig and gown pleading in the law courts indicated not merely change, but a revolution which might well usher in the end of the world. So strict was he in keeping the precincts of the law, sacred from the violating tread of women, that he never allowed his wife to set foot in the middle temple. Their meetings on those urgent occasions when Mrs. Mattingford came to town for her dress allowance in order to go bargain hunting, took place at one of the cheap tea-rooms in Fleet Street. Although Mr. Mattingford was somewhat flustered by the unexpected appearance of Mrs. Holymead, he did not depart from the precedent to the extent of regarding her as entitled to any other treatment than that accorded to clients who called on business. He asked her if she wanted to see Mr. Holymead, placed a chair for her, then knocked deferentially at his chief's door, went inside to announce Mrs. Holymead to her husband, and came out with the information that Mr. Holymead would see her. 
He held open the door leading into his chief's private room, and after Mrs. Holymead had entered, closed it softly and firmly. But the formal business manner of Mr. Mattingford to his chief's wife seemed to her friendly and cordial compared with the strained greetings she received from her husband. He motioned her to a chair and then got up from his own. "'I wrote to you to come and see me here instead of going to the house to see you,' he said, "'because I thought it would be better for both. "'It would have given the servants something to talk about. "'I hope you don't mind.' She looked at him with her large dark eyes in which there was more than a suggestion of tears. What she had read into his note when she received it was his determination not to go to his home to see her, for fear she would interpret that as a first step towards reconciliation. What I wanted to speak to you about is this Detective Crewe, whom Miss Fewbanks has employed in connection with her father's death he continued. Her breath came quickly at this unwelcome information. She noted that he had spoken of Sir Horace's death and not his murder. He began pacing backwards and forwards across the room, as if with the purpose of avoiding looking at her. This man Crew is a nuisance, I might even say a danger. I don't know what he has found out but I object to his ferreting into my affairs. He must be stopped. She nodded her assent, for she could not trust herself to speak. Each time he turned his back on her, as he crossed the room, her eyes followed him, but as he faced her, she turned her gaze on the floor. There is no legal redress, no legal means of dealing with this impertinent curiosity, he went on. He is within his rights in trying to find out all he can. But if he is allowed to go on unchecked, the thing may reach a disastrous stage. I have no doubt that he knows that I was at Riversbrook the night that man was killed. He was not long in getting on the track of that, and the more mysterious my visit seems to him, and the fact that I have not disclosed to the police that I went up to Riversbrook and saw Sir Horace on the night of the tragedy is, to his way of thinking, very significant. The more reason is there for suspecting me of complicity in the crime. When he turned to cross the room, her eyes lingered on him, and she glanced quickly at his face. "'I don't want to dwell on matters that must pain you.' "'That must pain us both,' he said slowly. "'But it is necessary that you should be made acquainted "'with the danger that threatens me from this man. "'I am anxious to avoid anything in the nature of a public scandal. "'I am anxious quite as much, if not more, on your account than my own. "'But if this wretched man is allowed to go on trying to build up a case against me, and I must admit that he would probably obtain circumstantial evidence of a kind which would make some sort of a case for the prosecution. There is grave danger of everything coming out. If he went to the length of having me arrested and charged with the crime, there are bound to be some disclosures, and the newspapers would make the most of them. It is impossible to foresee the exact nature of them. But I do not see how I could adopt any line of defence which would not hint at things that are best unrevealed. You yourself might be so ill-advised as to tell the whole story in the end. Of course I would try to prevent you, and as far as the trial is concerned I think I could use means to prevent you. But if the result was unfavourable, and knowing what eccentric things juries do, we must recognize the possibility of an unfavorable verdict. You might consider it advisable to disclose everything in the hope of having the conviction quashed by an appeal. For the first time since she had sat down, he looked at her, and as he caught her upward gaze, he flushed. I would tell everything if you were arrested, she said in a low voice. Ah, so I thought, he said in a tone of disapproval. 
The question now is, what means can be adopted to prevent a catastrophe? I have thought earnestly about it, and as you are almost as much concerned in preventing public disclosures as I am, I decide to consult you before taking any definite course. It is this man Crewe who is the danger, and the question is, how are we to stop him proceeding to extremes? One way is for me to see him and take him into my confidence, to explain fully to him what happened. He would not be satisfied with less than the full story. If I kept anything back, his suspicions would remain. In fact, they would be strengthened. I would have to explain to him why and how I induced Sir Horace to return unexpectedly from Scotland on that fatal night, and what took place at Riversbrook. You will understand why I have hesitated to adopt that course. I would not suggest it to you now, except that I see it would save you from the danger of something a great deal worse. Of course it could save me from the annoyance of being suspected of knowing something about the actual murder, but it is your interests that come first in the matter. It would be effective in putting an end to all our fears, all my fears. I would bind him to secrecy, of course. I do not ask you to come to a decision immediately, but I do ask you to think it over and let me know. I have been extremely reluctant to put this proposal before you, because I should hate carrying it out, because I should hate telling this man of things which are really no concern of any one but ourselves. But I cannot disguise from myself that it would remove a great danger. I believe the secret would be safe with him. I understand that in private life he is a gentleman and that I would be safe in taking his word of honour. It would not be necessary for him to tell the police, still less to tell Miss Fewbanks. Is there no other way? she asked. Have you thought of any other way? Yes. The only other way out that I have been able to find is for me to see Miss Fewbanks and ask her to withdraw the case from Crewe. I would not tell her everything. I would not bring you into it at all. But I could tell her that I had had an urgent matter to discuss with her father, that he came from Scotland to discuss it with me, and that after I left him he was murdered. I would tell her that it was quite impossible for me to disclose what the business was about, but that Crewe, having learned that I had seen her father that night, was extremely suspicious. I would ask her to accept my word of honour that I had no knowledge of who killed her father, and to relieve me of the annoyance of the attentions of this man Crewe. I think she would agree to that proposal. That is the other way out, and from something which has happened this morning I am inclined to think that it is the better and quicker course to pursue. She was thinking so deeply that she did not reply. At length she became conscious of a long silence. It is very good of you to ask my opinion, to consult with me at all. It is you that have everything at stake. I would like to do my best, but I think if you gave me time... Is there any great urgency? Two days at most is all I want. I cannot give you two days, he replied with a sombre smile. You must decide today, at once, otherwise it will be too late. She looked at him with parted lips and alarm in her eyes. What do you mean? she breathed. What have you hidden? Is the danger immediate? I think so. For some days past my movements have been dodged by a boy in Crewe's employ. Nearly a week ago I decided after the worry and anxiety of this, this unhappy affair, to go away for a short trip. I thought a sea voyage to America and back might do me good and fit me for my work again. 
He sighed unconsciously and went on. Crewe has become acquainted with my intended departure and has placed his own interpretation on it. He assumes that I am seeking safety in flight, that I have no intention of coming back to England. The result has been that the boy Crewe had set to watch my movements has been replaced by two men from Scotland Yard, one watching these chambers from the front and the other from the rear. He walked across to the window and glanced quickly through the curtain. Yes, they are still here. She sprang from her seat and followed him to the window. Where are they? she gasped. Show them to me. There. Do not move the curtain, or they will suspect we are watching them. Look a little to the left by the lamp post. The other you can catch a glimpse of, if you look between those two trees. What does it mean? Why are they waiting? she burst out. Her face had gone very pale and her big dark eyes glared frightedly from the window to her husband. Hush! I beg you not to lose your self-control. It is essential neither of us should lose our heads, he said warningly. She regained command of herself with an effort, and whispered rather than spoke with twitching lips. What does the presence of these men mean? It means that Crewe has already communicated with Scotland Yard. And that you will be arrested for his murder? Her trembling lips could hardly frame the words. I think so. It's almost certain. But apparently the warrant is not yet issued, or those men would come here and arrest me. But they are watching to prevent my escape, if I thought of escaping. We may yet have a few hours to arrange something, but you must come to a prompt decision. Tell me what to do, and I will do it. Oh, let me help you if I can. What is the best thing to do? To see Crewe? No, I forbid you to see Crewe, he said harshly. If we decide on that course, I will see him myself. And you may be arrested the moment you go out of these chambers she returned. Oh, no, no, that is not a good plan. We have not the time. I will go to Mabel Fewbanks at once, and beg her, for all our sakes, not to allow this to go any further. He shook his head. You must not sacrifice yourself, he said. That would be foolish. I will not sacrifice myself. I would tell her just what you have told me, that her father came from Scotland to discuss an urgent matter with you, and that he was murdered after you left. I feel certain this man Crewe is going to extremes without her knowledge or consent, and that she will be the first to bury this awful thing when she learns that you have been implicated. Is not this the best thing to do? It is, he reluctantly admitted but I do not wish you to be mixed up in it at all. I'm not mixing myself up in it. I'm too selfish for that. But I swear to you, if you do not let me do this, I will confess everything. I know Mabel Fewbanks, and I repeat, she's not aware of what this man Crewe has done. She would not, will not, permit it. I shall go down to Delmer at once." Her face was pale and her eyes glittered as she looked at her husband, but she spoke with unnatural self-possession. With feverish energy she pulled on a glove she had taken off when she entered, and buttoned it. "'I will. I shall arrive in time. In two hours. In three at most. You will hear from me.' She passed out into the outer office before her husband could reply, and closed the door behind her. Mr. Mattingford dashed to open the outer door of his room, leading into the main staircase. He thought Mrs. Holymead looked strange as she passed him and descended the stairs, and he rubbed his hands gleefully. He came to the conclusion that she had come in for a cheque for fifty pounds as an advance of her dress allowance, and that her request had been refused. End of chapter 26 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander
Chapter Twenty Seven of The Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Carl, St. Louis, Missouri, June two thousand eight. The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Rees. Chapter Twenty Seven. She left her husband's chambers with her brain in a whirl, hardly knowing where she was going, until she found herself held up with a stream of pedestrians at the island intersection of Waterloo Bridge and the Strand. She thought the policeman who was regulating the traffic eyed her curiously, and, more with the object of evading his eye than with any set plan in her mind, she stepped into an empty taxicab which was waiting to cross the street. "'Where to, ma'am? asked the driver. "'Where to?' she repeated vacantly. With an effort of will she concentrated her thoughts on the task in front of her, and hastily added, T "'To Victoria, as quick as you can. No, wait, driver. First take me to the nearest bookstall.' The taxicab took her to a bookstall in the Strand, where she got out and purchased a railway guide. As the taxicab proceeded towards Victoria, she hastily turned the pages to the trains for Delmere. She had never been to Delmere, but she had heard from Miss Fewbanks that her father's place was reached from a station called Horladine, on the main line to Wensden, and though there were many through trains, comparatively few stopped at Horladine. But she was unused to timetables, and found it difficult to grasp the information she required. There was such a bewildering diversity of letters at the head of the lists of trains for that line, and so many reference notes— on different pages to be looked up before it was possible to ascertain with any degree of certainty that trains stopped at Horladine on weekdays, that, in her shaken frame of mind, with the necessity for hurry haunting her, she became confused and failed to comprehend the perplexing figures. She signaled to the driver to stop, and handed him the book. "'I cannot understand this timetable,' she said in an agitated way. "'Would you find out for me, please, when the next train leaves Victoria for Horladin?' The driver consulted the timetable with a business-like air. "'The next train leaves at twelve-forty, he informed her. "'After that, there isn't another one stopping till four or five. Mrs. Holymead consulted her watch anxiously. "'It's almost half-past twelve now. Can you catch the twelve-forty?' she asked. The driver looked dubious. "'I'll try, ma'am, but it'll take some doing.' It depends on whether I get a clear run at Trafalgar Square. Try, try, she cried. Catch it, and I will double your fare. She caught the train with a few seconds to spare. She had a first-class compartment to herself, and as the train rushed out of London, and the grimy environs of the metropolis gradually gave place to green fields, she endeavoured to compose her mind and collect her thoughts for her coming interview with the daughter of the murdered man but her mind was in such a distraught condition that she could think of no plan but to sacrifice herself in order to save her husband. With cold hands pressed against her hot forehead, she muttered again and again, as if offering up an invocation that gained force by repetition, "'I must save him. I will tell her everything.' The train ran into Horladine shortly after two, and Mrs. Holymead was the only passenger who alighted at the lonely little wayside station, which stood in a small wood, in a solitude as profound as though it had been in the American prairie, instead of in the heart of an English country. The only sign of life was a dilapidated vehicle, with an elderly man in charge, which stood outside the station-yard all day, waiting for chance visitors. "'Cab, ma'am?' exclaimed the driver of this vehicle, with an ingratiating voice, touching his hat. "'No, thank you,' replied Mrs. Holymead. "'I'll walk.' Miss Fewbanks was astonished when the parlour-maid announced the arrival of Mrs. Holymead. She hurried into the drawing-room to meet her visitor, but the warm greeting she offered her was checked by her astonishment at the ill and worn appearance of her beautiful friend. "'Please, don't,' said the visitor, as she held up a warning hand to keep away a sisterly kiss. She looked at Miss Fewbanks with an air of a woman nerving herself for a desperate task, and said quickly, "'I have dreadful things to tell you. You can never think of me again except with loathing, with horror.' The impression Miss Fewbanks received was that her visitor had taken leave of her senses. 
This impression was deepened by Mrs. Holymead's next remark. "'I want you to save my husband.' There was an awkward pause while Mrs. Holymead waited for a reply, and Miss Fewbanks wondered what was the best thing to do. "'Say you will save him!' exclaimed Mrs. Holymead. "'Do what you like with me, but save him! Don't you think, dear, you would be better if you had a rest and a little sleep?' said Miss Fewbanks. "'I am sure you could sleep if you tried. Come upstairs, and I'll make you so comfortable.' "'You think I'm mad,' said the elder woman. "'Would to God that I was!' "'Come, dear,' said Miss Fewbanks coaxingly. She turned to the door and prepared to lead the way upstairs. "'Sleep!' exclaimed Mrs. Holymead bitterly. "'I have not had a peaceful sleep since your father was killed. I have been haunted day and night. I cannot sleep. I know it was a dreadful shock to you, but you must not take it so much to heart. You must see a doctor and do what he tells you. Mr. Holymead should send you away.' At the mention of her husband's name, Mrs. Holymead came back to the thought that had been foremost in her mind. "'Will you save him?' she exclaimed. "'You know I will do anything I can for him,' answered the girl gently. Her intention was to humour her visitor, for she was quite sure that Mr. Holymead was in no danger. "'Will you stop, Mr. Crewe?' "'Stop, Mr. Crewe?' Miss Fewbanks repeated the word in a tone that showed her interest had been awakened. "'Stop him from what? Stop him from arresting my husband! Do you mean to say that Mr. Crewe thinks Mr. Holymead had anything to do with the murder of my father? If I tell you everything, will you stop him? Oh, Mabel, darling, for the sake of the past, before I came on to the scene to mar the lives of both of them, will you save him? It is I, not he, who should pay the penalty of this awful tragedy. Will you save him?' "'Tell me everything.' said the girl firmly. To the stricken wife there was a promise in the demand for light, and in broken phrases she poured out her story of shame and sorrow. With a feeling that everything was falling away from her, the girl learnt, from her visitor's disconnected story, that there had been a liaison between her murdered father and her friend. Mr. Holymead had discovered it after Sir Horace had gone to Scotland, and husband and wife were away in the country. He was at first distracted at finding that his lifelong friend had seduced his wife, then had made her promise not to see or communicate with Sir Horace until he had made up his mind what course of action to take. Three days later he caught an evening train to London and told her he was not returning, but would write to her. It crossed her mind that he had gone to London to meet Sir Horace, and in her distress at the thought of what might happen when they met, she consulted her cousin, Gabrielle, who had always been in her confidence. Gabrielle had offered to go to Riversbrook to see if Sir Horace had returned from Scotland, or was expected back. Her train was delayed by an accident, and when she arrived at Riversbrook it was after half-past ten. She arrived a few minutes too late to prevent the tragedy. She found the front door open and the electric light burning in the hall. She went up the staircase, and in the library she found Sir Horace, who was lying on the floor at the point of death. She tried to lift him into a sitting position, but with a convulsive gasp he died in her arms. She lay him down, and then looked hurriedly around the room with the object of removing any evidence of how or why the crime had been committed, her main thought being to save her friend from the shame of a public scandal. She picked up a revolver which was lying on the floor near Sir Horace, turned out the lights in the library and in the hall so that the house was in darkness, and then closed the hall door after her as she went out. But Mr. Crewe had discovered in some way that Mr. Holymead had visited Sir Horace that night. Only a week ago Gabrielle had gone to him and tried to put him off the track, but it was no use. The wretched woman made a pathetic appeal for her husband's life. She deplored the sinfulness which had resulted in the tragedy. She took on herself the blame for it all. She had sent one man to his death, and her husband stood in peril of a shameful death on the gallows. But it was in the power of Mabel to save him. On her knees she pleaded for his life. She pleaded to be saved from the horror of sending her husband to the gallows. If Mabel's father could have made his wishes known, he too would plead for the life of the friend he had betrayed. The door opened and the parlour maid entered. Miss Fewbanks stepped quickly across the room, so that she should not witness the distress of Mrs. Holymead. 
The servant handed her a card and waited for instructions. Miss Fewbanks looked at the card in an agony of indecision. Then she made up her mind firmly. "'Show him into my study,' she whispered to the girl. She returned to her visitor, who was sitting with her face buried in her hands. "'Mr. Crewe has just motored down,' she said. "'I will save your husband, if I can.'" End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of The Hampstead Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Chapter 28 she was conscious that the revelation that her father had been killed by Mr. Holymead was a less shock than the revelation that her father had dishonoured the great friendship of his life by seducing his friend's wife. Her father had been dead three months, and her grief had run its course. The shock caused by the discovery that he had been murdered had passed away and she had begun to accept his violent death as part of her own experience of life. But the discovery that he had betrayed his best friend, in a way that a pure-minded woman regards as the most dishonorable way possible, was a fresh revelation to her human infamy. The knowledge that her father had been a man of immoral habits was not new to her. His predilection for fast women had long ago made it impossible for her to live in the same house with him for more than a week at a time, but that he had trampled in the mire the lifelong friendship of an honourable man for the sake of an ignoble passion revealed an unexpected depth of shame. That Mr. Holymead had killed him seemed almost a natural result of the situation. It was not that she felt that a just retribution had overtaken her father, but rather that she was glad his shameful conduct had come to an end. As she thought of her dead father, dead these three months, she gave a sigh of relief. The wretched guilty woman, who had shared with him the shame of his ignoble intrigue, had said that if her father could make his wishes known, he would plead for the life of the friend he had dishonoured. But it was not her father's plea for the life of his friend that would have impressed her so much as a plea to bury the whole unsavoury scandal from the light. She had promised to save Mr. Holymead if she could, but that promise had sprung less from the spirit of mercy than from the desire to save her father's name from a scandal which would hold him up to the public obloquy. She greeted Crewe with friendly warmth in spite of the feeling of oppression caused by the consciousness of the situation in front of her. He did not sit down again after greeting her, but stood with one hand resting on an inlaid chest table, with wonderful carved red and white Japanese chessmen ranged on each side, which he had been examining when she entered the room. "'I came down to make my report to you, because I think my work is finished,' he said. "'You have found out who killed my father?' she asked quietly. Crewe had sufficient personal pride to feel a little hurt when he saw the calm way in which she accepted the result of his investigations, instead of congratulating him on his success in a difficult task. "'I think so,' he said. "'Before I tell you who it is, you must prepare yourself for a great shock.' "'I know who it is,' she said. "'Mr. Holymead.' There was no pretense about his astonishment. "'How on earth did you find out?' She smiled a little at such a revelation of his appreciation of his own cleverness in having probed the mystery. "'I did not find it out,' she said. "'I had to be told.' "'And who told you, Miss Fewbanks?' he asked. "'Has he confessed to you? How long have you known it?' "'I have known it only a few minutes,' she said. Will you tell me how you got on the track and all you have done? I am greatly interested. 
You have been wonderfully clever to find out. I should never have guessed Mr. Holymead had anything to do with it. I should never have thought it possible. When you have finished, I will tell you how I came to know. The story is extremely simple and sordid. The fact that the key of the mystery had been in her hands only a few minutes was a solace to Crewe, as it detracted but little from the story he had to tell of patient investigations extending over weeks. He pieced together the story of the tragedy as he had unravelled it. Hill, he said, had conceived the idea of blackmailing her father after he had discovered the existence of some letters in a secret drawer of Sir Horace's desk. The fact that Sir Horace had kept these letters instead of destroying them as he had destroyed other letters of a somewhat similar kind showed that he was very much infatuated with the lady who wrote them. The lady, as doubtless Miss Fewbanks had guessed, was Mrs. Holymead, a lady with whom Sir Horace had been on very friendly terms before she married Mr. Holymead. "'What became of the letters?' asked Miss Fewbanks. "'Have you got them?' I think they are destroyed, he said. Mrs. Holymead removed them from the secret door the day after the discovery of the murder. She removed them when the police had charge of the house, and almost from under the eyes of Inspector Chippenfield. It was a daring plan, and well carried out. Miss Fewbanks heaved a sigh of relief on learning the fate of the letters. It had been her intention to endeavour to obtain them if they were in Crewe's possession and destroy them. Crewe explained that Hill was afraid to take the letters, and then boldly blackmailed Sir Horace. The butler conceived the plan of getting Birchill to break into the house. He did not take Birchill into his confidence with regard to the blackmailing scheme, but in order to induce Sir Horace to believe the burglar had stolen the letters, he told Birchill to force open the desk, as he would probably find money or papers of value there. But in order to prevent Birchill getting the letters, if he should happen to stumble across the secret drawer, Hill removed them the day before. His plan was to go to Riverbrook in the morning after the burglary, and after leaving open the secret drawer which had contained the letters, to report the burglary to the police. When Sir Horace came home unexpectedly, Hill had just removed the letters and had them in his possession. Hill was greatly perturbed at his master's unexpected return, and had to get an opportunity to replace the letters in the secret drawer, but Sir Horace told him to go home, as he was not wanted till the morning. Hill went to the girl's flat in Westminster, and there saw Birchill. He told Birchill that Sir Horace had returned unexpectedly, but he urged Birchill to carry out the burglary as arranged, and assured him that, as Sir Horace was a heavy sleeper, there would be no risk if he waited until Sir Horace went to bed. Hill's position was that if the burglary was postponed, Sir Horace might make the discovery that the letters had been stolen from the secret drawer. In that case, Sir Horace would immediately suspect Hill, who he knew was an ex-convict. It was just possible that Sir Horace, before going to bed, would discover that the letters had been stolen. That is, if he went to bed before Birchill got into the place. But Hill had to take that risk. It was the fact that the burglary Hill had arranged with Birchill took place on the night Sir Horace was killed that had given rise to the false clues, which had misled the police. Crewe, as he himself modestly put it, was so fortunate as to get on the right track from the start. His suspicions were directed to Holymead when he saw the latter carrying away a walking-stick from Riversbrook after its visit of condolence to Miss Fewbanks. Crewe explained what tactics he had adopted to obtain a brief inspection of the stick in order to ascertain for his own satisfaction if it had belonged to Holymead. His suspicions against Holymead were strengthened when he discovered that the latter, when driving to his hotel on the night of the tragedy, had thrown away a glove which was the fellow of the one found by the police in Sir Horace's library. 
The next point to settle was whether Holymead had anything to do with your father's sudden return from Scotland, said Crewe, continuing his story. If that proved to be the case, and if evidence could be obtained on which to justify the conclusion that these two old friends had had a deadly quarrel, the circumstantial evidence against Holymead as the man who killed your father was very strong. I may say that before I went to Scotland I came across evidence of the estrangement of Holymead and his wife. Do you remember when you and Mrs. Holymead were leaving the court after the inquest that Mr. Holymead came up and spoke to you? He shook hands with you and was on the point of shaking hands with his wife as if she were a lady he had met cautiously. Then on the night of the murder... The taxicab driver at Hyde Park Corner drove him to his house at Prince's Gate, but was ordered to drive back and take him to Verney's Hotel. All this was interesting to me, doubly interesting in the light of the fact that Sir Horace had known Mrs. Holymead before her second marriage, and had paid her every attention. I went to Scotland and made inquiries at Craiglace Hall, where Sir Horace had been shooting. My object was to endeavour to obtain a clue to the reason for his sudden journey to London. The local police had made inquiries on this point on behalf of Scotland Yard, and had been unable to obtain any clue. No telegram had been received by Sir Horace, and he had sent none. Of course, he had received some letters. He had told none of the other members of the shooting party the object of his departure for London but he had declared his intention of being back with them in less than a week. It had occurred to me, when the crime was discovered, that his missing pocket-book might not have been stolen by his murderer, but might have been lost in Scotland. I made inquiries in that direction, and eventually found that the man who had attended to Sir Horace on the moors had the pocket-book. His story was that Sir Horace had lost it, the day before his departure for London. He had taken off his coat, owing to the heat on the moor, and the pocket-book had dropped out. He ascertained his loss before he left for London, and told this man Saunders where he thought the pocket-book had dropped out. Saunders was to look for it, and if he found it was to keep it until Sir Horace came back. He did find it, and after learning of your father's death, was tempted to keep it, as it contained four five-pound notes. Saunders is an ignorant man and can scarcely read. He professed to know nothing of the pocket-book when I questioned him, but I became suspicious of him and laid a trap, which he fell into. Then he handed me the pocket-book, which he had hidden on the moor under a stone. In the pocket-book I found a letter from Holymead, asking your father to come to London at once, as there was to be two new appointments to the Court of Appeal, and that Sir Horace had an excellent chance of obtaining one if he came to London and used his influence with the Chancellor and the Chief Justice, who were still in town. The writer indicated that he was doing all that was possible in Sir Horace's interests, and that he would meet Sir Horace at Riversbrook at 9.30 on Wednesday night, and let him know the exact position. There is nothing suspicious in such a letter, but my inquiries concerning new appointments to the Court of Appeal suggest that the statements in the letter are false. Now, let us consider the conduct of Holymead and his wife since the night of the murder. His course of action has not been that of a man anxious to assist the police in the discovery of the murder of his old friend. We have first of all his secrecy regarding his visit to Riversbrook that night, the fact of the visit being established by the stick and the glove he left behind. We have the estrangement of husband and wife. We have Mrs. Holymead's visit to Riversbrook on the morning that the first details of the crime appeared in the newspapers. Ostensibly she came to see you and pay her condolences. But as she knew that you had been away in the country, she ought to have telephoned to learn if you had come up to London. Instead of telephoning, she went to Riversbrook direct, and when she found you were not there, she was admitted to the presence of my old friend Inspector Chippenfield. 
He is an excellent police officer, but I do not think he is a match for a clever woman. And Mrs. Holymead is such a fine-looking woman that I feel sure Chippenfield was so impressed by her appearance that he forgot he was a police officer and remembered only that he was a man. She managed to get him out of the room long enough to enable her to open the secret drawer in Sir Horace's desk and remove the letters. No doubt Sir Horace had shown her where he kept them, as their neat little hiding-place was an indication of the value he placed upon them. She was under the impression that no one knew about the letters, and her object in removing them was to prevent the police stumbling across them, and so getting on the track of her husband. But, as I have already told you, he knew about the letters, and on the night of the murder had them in his possession. On the night after the murder, while Inspector Chippenfield was making investigations at Riversbrook, Hill had managed to obtain the opportunity to put the letters back. He naturally thought that if the police discovered some of Sir Horace's private papers in his possession, they would conclude that he had had something to do with the murder. The next point of any consequence is Holymead's defence of Birchill, and the deliberate way in which he blackened your father's name while cross-examining Hill. If we regard Holymead's conduct solely from the standpoint of a barrister doing his best for his client, his defence of Birchill is not so remarkable. But we have to remember that your father and Holymead had been lifelong friends. His acceptance of the brief for the defence was in itself remarkable. The fee, as I took the trouble to find out, was not large. Indeed, for a man of Holymead's commanding eminence at the bar, it might be called a small one, and he should have returned the brief because the fee was inadequate. We have, therefore, two things to consider. His defence of the man charged with the murder of your father, and his readiness to do the work without regard to the monetary side of it. Much was said at the time in some of the papers about a barrister being a servant of the court and compelled by the etiquette of the bar to place his services at the disposal of anyone who needs them and is prepared to pay for them. A great deal of nonsense has been said and written on that subject. A barrister can return a brief because for private reasons he does not wish to have anything to do with the case. It was Holymead's duty to do his best to get Birchill off, whether he believed his client was guilty or innocent. Could Holymead have done his best for Birchill if he had believed that Birchill was the murderer of his lifelong friend? Would he have trusted himself to do his best? No, Holymead knew that Birchill was innocent. He knew who the guilty man was, and knowing that, knowing that his action in defending the man charged with the murder of an old friend would weigh with the jury, he took up the case because he felt there was a moral obligation on him to get Birchill off. His conduct of the defence, during which he attacked the moral character of your father, was remarkable, coming from him, the friend of the dead man. As the action of defending counsel, it was perfectly legitimate. It gave rise to some discussion in purely legal circles, whether Holymead did right or wrong in violating a long friendship in order to get his man off. The academic point is whether he ought to have violated his personal feelings for an old friend, or violated his duty to his client by doing something less than his best for him. Apart from the circumstantial and inferential evidence against Holymead, there is the fact that his wife knows that he committed the crime. Her acts point to that. Her conduct throughout springs from the desire to shield him. Even the removal of the letters from the secret drawer was prompted more by the desire to save him than to save herself. Their discovery would not have been very serious for her, but it would have put the police on her husband's track. If I remember rightly, she asked you to keep her in touch with all the developments of the investigations of the police and myself. 
You told me that she was greatly interested in the fact that I did not believe Birchill was guilty, and particularly anxious to know if I suspected anyone. At Birchill's trial she did me the honour of watching me very closely. I was watching both her and her husband. When she discovered through her womanly intuition that I suspected her husband, that I was accumulating evidence against him, she sent round her friend Mademoiselle Chiron with some interesting information for me. An extremely clever young woman that, like all her countrywomen, she is wonderfully sharp and quick, with a natural aptitude for intrigue. Of course, the information she gave me was intended to mislead me, intended to show me that Mr. Holymead had nothing to do with the crime. But some of it was extremely interesting when it dealt with actual facts, and some of the facts were quite new to me. For instance, I had not previously known that a piece of a lady's handkerchief was found clenched in your father's right hand after he was dead. The police very kindly kept that information from me. Had they told me about it, I might have been inclined to suspect Mrs. Holymead and to believe that her husband was trying to shield her. His conduct would bear that interpretation if she had happened to be guilty. The police unconsciously saved me from taking up that false scent. I have detained you a long time in dealing with these points, Miss Fewbanks. But I wanted to make everything clear. I have all but reached the end. Let us take in chronological order what happened on the night of the tragedy. We have your father's sudden return from Scotland. Hill was at Riversbrook when he arrived, and having the secret letters in his possession, was greatly perturbed by the unexpected return of Sir Horace. He went to Doris Fanning's flat in Westminster to see Birchill. In his absence, Holymead arrived. It is probable that he took the tube from Hyde Park Corner to Hampstead and walked to Riversbrook. He rang the bell, was admitted by your father, and, leaving his hat and stick in the hall stand, as he had often done before, the two men went upstairs to the library. There was an angry interview. Holymead accusing your father of having wronged him and demanding satisfaction. My own opinion is that there was an irregular sort of duel. Each of them fired one shot. It is quite conceivable that Holymead, in spite of his mission being that of revenge, gave your father a fair chance for his life. A man in Holymead's position would probably feel indifferent whether he killed the man who had ruined his home or was killed by him. But whereas your father's shot missed by a few inches, Holymead's inflicted a fatal wound. When he saw your father fall and realized what he had done, the instinct of self-preservation asserted itself. He grabbed at the gloves he had taken off, but in his hurry dropped one on the floor. He ran downstairs, took his hat from the hall stand, but left his stick. Then he rushed out of the house, leaving the front door open. He made his way back to Hampstead Tube Station, got out at Hyde Park, and took a cab to his hotel. Within a few minutes of Holymead's departure from Riversbrook, the French woman arrived. She may have passed Holymead in Tanton Gardens, or Holymead, when he saw her approaching, may have hidden inside the gateway of a neighbouring house. She had come up from the country on learning that Holymead had come to London. She caught the next train, but unfortunately it was late on arriving at Victoria, owing to a slight accident to the engine. I take it that she was sent by Mrs. Holymead to follow her husband, if possible, and see if he had any designs on Sir Horace. She took a cab as far as the Spaniards Inn, and then got out, and walked to Riversbrook. When she arrived at the house, she found the front door open and the lights burning. There was no answer to her ring, and she entered the house and crept upstairs. Opening the library door, she saw your father lying on the floor. She endeavoured to raise him to a sitting posture, but it was too late to do anything for him. 
With a convulsive movement, he grasped at the handkerchief she was holding in one hand, and a corner of it was torn off and remained in his hand. When she saw he had breathed his last, she laid him down on the floor. Since she had been too late to prevent the crime, the next best thing in the interest of Mrs. Holymead was to remove traces of Holymead's guilt. She picked up the revolver, which she thought belonged to Holymead, turned off the light in the room, went downstairs, turned off the light in the hall, and closed the hall door as she went out. She behaved with remarkable courage and coolness, but she overlooked the glove in the room of the tragedy and Holomid's stick in the hall stand. Later in the night we have Birchill's entry into the house, his alarm at finding your father had been killed, and his return to the flat where Hill was waiting for him. When Crewe had finished, he looked at the girl. She had followed his statement with breathless interest. "'You have been wonderfully clever,' she said. "'It is perfectly marvellous. Crewe's eyes had wandered to the inlaid chess table and the Japanese chessmen set in prim rows on either side. Mechanically he began to arrange a problem on the board. His interest in the famous murder mystery seemed to have evaporated. "'I was very fortunate,' he said absently in reply to Miss Fewbanks. "'Everything seemed to come right for me.' "'You made everything come right,' she replied. "'I do not know how to thank you for giving so much of your time to unravelling the mystery.' "'It was fascinating while it lasted,' he replied, his fingers still busy with the chessman. "'Of course I am pleased with my success, but in a way I am sorry the work has come to an end.' I thought that the knowledge that Holymead was the guilty man would come as a great shock to you. But I am glad you are able to take it so well. A few minutes before you arrived, I learned that it was Mr. Holymead. But what has been more of a shock to me, Mr. Crewe, is the discovery that my father had ruined his home. Oh, Mr. Crewe, it is terrible for me to have to hold my dead father up to judgment. But it is more terrible still to know that he was not faithful even to his lifelong friendship with Mr. Holymead. "'Your nerves are unstrung,' he said. "'You want rest and quiet. You want a long sea voyage.' "'Yes, I want to forget,' she said. "'But there are others who want to forget, too. Cannot we bury the whole thing in forgetfulness?' Crewe's growing interest in the chessboard and his problem suddenly vanished. His eyes became instantly riveted on her face in a keen, questioning look. "'What is it to me or you that Mr. Holymead should be publicly proved guilty of this terrible thing?' she went on passionately. "'Why drag into the light my father's conduct in order to make a day sensation for the newspapers?' For his sake, what better thing could I do than let his memory rest? Do you mean that Holymead should be allowed to go free? he asked in astonishment. Yes. I'm extremely sorry, he said slowly. Won't you let it all drop? she pleaded. I could not take upon myself the responsibility of condoning such a crime the responsibility of judging between your father and his murderer, he said solemnly. But even if I could, it is too late to think of doing so. There is already a warrant out for Holomid's arrest. End of chapter 28 Of the Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander. Chapter twenty nine of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Carl, St. Louis, Missouri, June two thousand eight. The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Rees. 
Chapter Twenty Nine. The newspapers made a sensation out of the announcement of Holy Mead's arrest on a charge of having murdered Sir Horace Fewbanks. They declared that the arrest of the eminent K.C. on a capital charge would come as a surprising development of the Riversbrook case. It would cause a shock to his many friends, and especially to those who knew what a close friendship had existed between the arrested man and the dead judge. The papers expatiated on the fact that Holymead had appeared for the defense when Frederick Burchill had been tried for the murder. As the public would remember, Burchill had been acquitted owing to the great ability with which his defense was conducted. It was somewhat remarkable, said the Daily Record, that in his speech for the defense Holymead had attempted to throw suspicion on one of the witnesses for the prosecution. The journal hinted that it was the result of something which counsel for the defense had let drop at this trial, that Inspector Chippenfield had picked up the clue which had led to Holymead's arrest. The papers had very little information to give the public about this new development of the Fewbanks mystery, but they boldly declared that some startling revelations were expected when the case came before the court. In the absence of interesting facts apropos the arrest of the distinguished K.C., some of the papers published summaries of his legal career and the more famous cases with which he had been connected. These summaries would have been equally suitable to an announcement that Mr. Holymead had been promoted to the peerage, or that he had been run over by a London bus. There were people who declared, without knowing anything about the evidence the police had in their possession, that in arresting the famous barrister, the police had made a far worse blunder than in arresting Burchill. It was even hinted that the arrest of the man who had got Burchill off was an expression of the police desire for revenge. To these people the acquittal of Holymead was a foregone conclusion. The man who had saved Burchill's life by his brilliant forensic abilities was not likely to fail when his own life was at stake. But when the case came before the police court and the police produced their evidence, it was seen that there was a strong case against the prisoner. The whispers as to the circumstances under which the prisoner had taken the life of a friend of many years appealed to a sentimental public. These whispers concerned the discovery by the prisoner that his friend had seduced his beautiful wife. In the police court proceedings there were no disclosures under this head, but the thing was hinted at. In view of the legal eminence of the prisoner, and the fear of the police that he would prove too much for any police officer who might take charge of the prosecution, the direction of public prosecutions was sent to Mr. Waters, K.C., to appear at the police court. The prisoner was represented by Mr. Lethbridge, K.C., an eminent barrister to whom the prisoner had been opposed in many civil cases. Inspector Chippenfield, who realized that the important position the prisoner occupied at the bar, added to the importance of the officer who had arrested him, gave evidence as to the arrest of the prisoner at his chambers in the Middle Temple. With a generous feeling, which was possibly due to the fact that he was entitled to none of the credit of collecting the evidence against the prisoner, Inspector Chippenfield allowed Detective Rolfe a subordinate share in the glory that hung round the arrest by volunteering the information in the witness box that when making the arrest he was accompanied by that officer. He declared that the prisoner made no remark when arrested and did not seem surprised. Mr. Walters produced a left-hand glove, and witness duly identified it as the glove which he found in the room in which the murder took place. Inspector Selden gave formal evidence of the discovery of the body of Sir Horace Fewbanks on the 19th of August. Dr. Slingsby repeated the evidence that he had given at the trial of Burchill as to the cause of death, and again was professionally indefinite as to the length of time the victim had been dead when he saw the body. Thomas Taylor, taxicab driver, gave evidence as to driving the prisoner from Hyde Park Corner on the night of the 18th of August, and the finding of the glove. Crewe went into the witness box and swore that on the second day after the discovery of the murder he was present at Riversbrook when the prisoner visited the house and saw Miss Fewbanks. When the prisoner arrived he was not carrying a walking stick, but he had one in his hand when he took his departure from the house. Witness followed the prisoner, and a boy who collided with the prisoner knocked the stick out of his hands. Witness picked up the stick and inspected it. 
he identified the stick produced in court as the one which the prisoner had been carrying on that day. The most difficult and most important witness as far as new evidence was concerned was Alexander Saunders, a big, broad, red-faced Scotchman, whose firm grasp on the tam o shanter he held in his hands seemed to indicate a fear that all the pickpockets in London had designs on it. With great difficulty he was made to understand his part in the witness-box, and some of the questions had to be repeated several times before he could grasp their meaning. Mr. Lethbridge humorously suggested that his learned friend should have provided an interpreter so that his pure English might be translated into lowland Scotch. By slow degrees, Saunder was able to explain how he had found the pocket-book which Sir Horace Fewbanks had lost while shooting at Craigleth Hall. Witness identified a letter produced as having been in the pocket-book when he found it. The letter, which had been written by the prisoner to Sir Horace Fewbanks, urged Sir Horace to return to London at once, as if he did so there was a good possibility of his obtaining promotion to the Court of Appeal. The writer promised to do all he could in the matter, and to call on Sir Horace at Riversbrook as soon as he returned from Scotland. Percival Chambers, an elderly well-dressed man with a grey beard and wearing glasses, who was secretary of the Master of Rolls, swore that he knew of no prospective vacancies on the Court of Appeal bench. Were any vacancies of the kind in view, he believed he would be aware of them. This closed the case for the police, and Mr. Lethbridge immediately asked for the discharge of the prisoner on the ground that there was no case to go before a jury. The magistrate shook his head and merely asked Mr. Lethbridge if he intended to reserve his defense. Mr. Lethbridge replied with a nod, and the accused was formally committed for trial at the next sittings at the Old Bailey. The newspapers reported at great length the evidence given in the police court, and the reports were eagerly read by a sensation-loving public. Even those people who, when Holymead's arrest was announced, had ridiculed the idea of a man like Holymead murdering a lifelong friend, had to admit that the police had collected some damaging evidence. Those people who, at the same time of the arrest, had prided themselves on possessing an open mind as to the guilt of the famous barrister, confessed after reading the police court evidence that there could be little doubt of his guilt. The only thing that was missing from the police court proceedings was the production of a motive for the crime, but it was whispered that there would be some interesting revelations on this point when the prisoner was tried at the Old Bailey. Fortunately, he had not long to wait for his trial. As the next sittings of the Central Criminal Court had previously been fixed a week ahead of the date of his commitment, that week was full of anxiety for Mr. Lethbridge, for he realized that he had a poor case. What increased his anxiety was the fact that Holymead insisted on the defense being conducted on the lines he laid down. It was a new thing in Lethbridge's experience to accept such instructions from a prisoner, but Holymead had threatened to dispense with all assistance unless his instructions were carried out. He was particularly anxious that his wife's name should be kept out of court as much as possible. Lethbridge had pointed out to him that the prosecution would be sure to drag it in at the trial in suggesting a motive for the murder, and that, for the purposes of the defense, it was best to have a full and frank disclosure of everything, so that an appeal could be made to the jury's feelings. Holymead's beautiful wife, who was almost distraught by her husband's position, implored his counsel to allow her to go into the box and make a confession. But that course did not commend itself to Lethbridge, who realized that she would make an extremely bad witness, and would but help to put the rope round her husband's neck. He put her off by declaring that there was a good prospect of her husband being acquitted, but that if the verdict unfortunately went against him, her confession would have more weight in saving him, when the appeal against the verdict was heard. It amazed Lethbridge to find that the prisoner expressed the view that Burchill had committed the murder. This view was based on his contention that Sir Horace Fewbanks was alive when he, holy me, left him about ten o'clock. The interview between them had been an angry one, but Holymead persisted in asserting that he had not shot his former friend. He declared that he had not taken a revolver with him when he went to Riversbrook. 
Lethbridge was one of those barristers who believed that a knowledge of the guilt of the client handicapped counsel in defending him. He had his private opinion as to the result of the angry interview between Holymead and Sir Horace Fewbanks, but he preferred that Holymead should protest his innocence even to him. That made it easier for him to make a stirring appeal to the jury than it would have been if his client had fully confessed to him. His private opinion as to the author of the crime was strengthened by Holymead's admission that Birchill had not confessed to him, or to his solicitor at the time of his trial, that he had shot Sir Horace Fewbanks. He was astonished that Holymead had taken up Birchill's defense, but Holymead's explanation was the somewhat extraordinary one that the man who had killed the seducer of his wife had done him a service by solving a problem that had seemed insoluble without a public scandal. There was no doubt that although Sir Horace Fewbanks was in his grave, Holymead's hatred of him for his betrayal of his wife burned as strongly as when he had made the discovery that wrecked his home life. Neither death nor time could dim the impression, nor lessen his hatred for the dead man who had once been his closest friend. Lethbridge, feeling that it was his duty as counsel for the prisoner to try every avenue which might help to an acquittal, asked Mr. Tomlinson, the solicitor who was instructing him in the case, to find Birchill and bring him to his chambers. Birchill was found and kept an appointment. Lethbridge explained to him that he had nothing further to fear from the police with regard to the murder of Sir Horace Fewbanks. Having been acquitted on this charge, he could not be tried on it again, no matter what discoveries were made. He could not even be tried for perjury, as he had not gone into the witness-box. Having allowed these facts to sink home, he delicately suggested to Birchill that he ought to come forward as a witness for the defense of Holymead. He ought to do his best and try to save the life of the man who had saved his life. "'What do you want me to swear?' asked Birchill, in a tone which indicated that although he did not object to committing perjury, he wanted to know how far he was to go. "'Well, that Sir Horace Fewbanks was alive when you went to Riversbrook,' suggested Lethbridge. "'But I tell you, he was dead,' protested Birchill. He seemed to think that reviving a dead man was beyond even the power of perjury. "'That was your original story, I know,' agreed Lethbridge, suavely. "'But as you were not put into the witness-box to swear it, you can alter it without fear of any consequences.' "'You want me to swear that he was alive?' said Birchill, meditatively. "'If you can conscientiously do so,' replied Lethbridge. "'That he was alive when I left Riversbrook,' asked Birchill. "'Well, not necessarily that.' said Lethbridge. Birchill sprang up in alarm. "'Dear God, do you want me to swear that I killed him?' he demanded. Lethbridge endeavoured to explain that he would have nothing to fear from such a confession in the witness-box, but Birchill would listen to no further explanations. He felt that he was in dangerous company, and that his safety depended on getting out of the room. "'You've made a mistake.' he said, as he reached the door. If you want a witness of that kind, you ought to look for him in Colney Hatch. End of chapter 29。Chapter 30 of the Hampstead Mystery。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde. The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Rees. Chapter 30 The impending trial of Holymead produced almost as much excitement in staid legal circles as it did among the general public. It was rumored that there was a difficulty in obtaining a judge to preside at the trial, as they all objected to being placed in the position of trying a man who was well known to them, and with whom most of them had been on friendly terms. There was a great deal of sympathy for the prisoner among the judges. Of course, they could not admit that any man had the right to take the law into his own hands, but they realized that if any wrong done to an individual could justify this course, it was the wrong Sir Horace Fewbanks had done to an old friend. 
when it became known that mr justice hudson was to preside at the old bailey during the trial of holymead legal rumour concerned itself with statements to the effect that there was now a difficulty in obtaining a k c to undertake the prosecution when it was discovered that mr walters k c was to conduct the prosecution it was whispered that he had asked to be relieved of the work and had even waited on the attorney-general in the matter but that the latter had told him that he must put his personal feelings aside and act in accordance with that high sense of duty he had always shown in his professional career in newgate street a long queue of people waited for admission to old bailey on the day the trial was to begin they were inspected by two fat policemen to decide whether they appeared respectable enough to be entitled to a free seat at the entertainment in number one court when the doors opened at ten fifteen a m the first batch of them were admitted but on reaching the top of the stairs where they were inspected by a sergeant they were informed that all the seats in the gallery of number one court had been filled but that he would graciously permit them to go to numbers two three four or five courts those who were not satisfied with this generosity could get out the way they had come in and be quick about it what the sergeant did not explain was that so many people with social influence had applied to the presiding judge for permission to be present at the trial that it had been found necessary to reserve the gallery for them as well as most of the seats in the body of the court fashionably dressed ladies and well-groomed men drove up to the main entrance of the old bailey in motors and taxicabs the scene was as busy as the scene outside a west end theatre on a first night the services of several policemen were necessary to regulate the arrival and departure of taxicabs and motor-cars and to keep back the staring mob of disappointed people who had been refused admission to the court by the fat sergeant but were determined to see as much as they could before they went away elderly ladies and young ladies were assisted from smart motor-cars by their escorts and greeted their friends with feminine fervor some of the younger ones exchanged whispered regrets as they swept into the court that such a fine-looking man as holymead should have got himself into such a terrible predicament the legal profession was numerously represented among the spectators in the body of the court so many distinguished members of the profession had applied for tickets of admission that there was little room for members of the junior bar it was many years since a trial had created so much interest in legal circles when mr justice hodson entered the court followed by no fewer than eight of the sheriffs of london those present in the court rose the members of the profession bowed slowly in the direction of his honor the prisoner was brought into the dock from below and took the seat that was given to him beside one of the two warders who remained in the dock with him he looked a little careworn as though with sleepless nights but his strong clean-shaven face was as resolute as ever and betrayed nothing of the mental agony which he endured his keen dark eyes glanced quietly through the court and though many members of the bar smiled at him when they thought they had caught his eye he gave no smile in return as he looked at mr justice hodson the distinguished judge inclined his head to what was almost a nod of recognition but the prisoner looked calmly at the judge as though he had never seen him before and had never been inside a court in his life till then among the persons standing in the body of the court were crewe and inspector chippenfield and detective rolfe inspector chippenfield displayed so much friendliness to crewe as he drew his attention to the number of celebrities in court that it was evident he had buried for the time being his professional enmity this was because crewe had allowed him to appropriate some of the credit of unravelling holymead's connection with the crime 
As the jury were being sworn in, Crewe and Chippenfield made their way out of the court into the corridor. As they were to be called as witnesses, they would not be allowed in court until after they had given their evidence. Mr. Walters, in his opening address, paid tribute to the exceptional circumstances of the case by some slight show of nervousness. Several times he insisted that the case was what he termed unique. The prisoner in the dock was a man who, by his distinguished abilities, had won for himself a leading position at the bar, and had been honored and respected by all who knew him. It was not the first occasion that a member of the legal profession had been placed on trial on a capital charge, though he was glad to say, for the honor of the profession, that cases of the kind were extremely rare. But what made the case unique was that it was not the first trial in connection with the murder of Sir Horace Fewbanks, and that at the first trial, when a man named Frederick Birchill had been placed in the dock, the prisoner now before the court had appeared as defending counsel, and by his brilliant conduct of the defense had materially contributed to the verdict of acquittal which had been brought in by the jury. Some evidence would be placed before the jury about the first trial and the conduct of the defense. He ventured to assert that the jury would find in this evidence some damaging facts against the prisoner, that they would find a clear indication that the prisoner had defended Birchill because he knew himself to be guilty of this murder, and felt an obligation on him to place his legal knowledge and forensic powers at the disposal of a man whom he knew to be innocent. At the former trial, the prisoner, as counsel for the defense, had attempted to throw suspicion on a man named Hill, who had been butler to the late Sir Horace Fewbanks, but evidence would be placed before the jury to show that in doing so the prisoner had been smitten by some pangs of conscience at casting suspicion on a man who he knew was not guilty. It was not incumbent on the prosecution to prove a motive for the murder, continued Mr. Walters, though where the motive was plainly proved the case against the prisoner was naturally strengthened. In this case there was no doubt about the motive, but the extent of the evidence to be placed before the jury under that head would depend upon the defense. The prosecution would submit some evidence on the point, but the full story could only be told if the defense placed the wife of the prisoner in the witness-box. It was impossible for the prosecution to call her as a witness, as English law prevented a wife giving evidence against her husband. She could, however, give evidence in favor of her husband, and doubtless the defense would take full advantage of the privilege of calling her. The evidence which he intended to call would show that for years past very friendly relations had existed between the prisoner and the murdered man. They had been at Cambridge together, and had studied law together in chambers. Their friendship continued after their marriages. The prisoner had married a second time, and at that time Sir Horace Fewbanks was a widower. Sir Horace Fewbanks was what was known as a ladies' man, and at the previous trial, prisoner, as defending counsel, had tried to bring out that Sir Horace was a man of immoral reputation among women. There was no doubt that the prisoner, during Sir Horace's absence in Scotland, became convinced that Sir Horace had been paying attention to his wife. There was no doubt that, being a man of a jealous disposition, his suspicions went beyond that. At any rate, he wrote a letter to Sir Horace at Craigleith Hall, where the latter was shooting, asking him to come to London at once. In order to induce Sir Horace to return, and in order not to arouse suspicion as to his real object, he concocted a story about a vacancy in the Court of Appeal Bench, to which it appeared Sir Horace Fewbanks desired to be appointed. In this letter, which would be produced in evidence, the prisoner pretended to be working in Sir Horace's interests, 
and offered to meet him on the night of his return at Riversbrook, and let him know fully how matters stood. Sir Horace apparently wrote to the prisoner, making an appointment with him, for the night of the 18th of August. The prisoner kept that appointment, charged Sir Horace with carrying on an intrigue with his wife, and then shot him. That is the case for the prosecution, which I will endeavor to establish to the satisfaction of the jury, said Mr. Walters, in concluding his speech. Of course, it is impossible to produce direct evidence of the actual shooting, but I will produce a silent but indisputable witness in the form of a glove which belonged to the prisoner that he was present in the room in which the murder took place. I will produce evidence to show that the prisoner left his stick behind in the hat-stand in the hall on the night of the murder. These things prove conclusively that he left Riversbrook in a state of considerable excitement. The fact that after the murder was discovered, he kept hidden in his own breast the knowledge that he had been there on that night, instead of going to the police and, in the endeavor to assist them to detect the murderer of his lifelong friend, informing them that he had called on Sir Horace, shows conclusively that he went there on a mission on which he dared not throw the light of day. Those witnesses who had given evidence at the police court were called and repeated their statements. Inspector Selden was closely cross-examined by Mr. Lethbridge as to the way in which the dead body was dressed when he discovered it. He declared that Sir Horace had been wearing a light lounge suit of grey colour, a silk shirt, wing-collar, and black bow-tie. Dr. Slingby's cross-examination was directed to ascertaining as near as possible the time the murder was committed, but this was a point on which the witness allowed himself to be irritatingly indefinite. The murder might have taken place three or four hours before midnight, on the 18th of August, and, on the other hand, it might have taken place any time up to three or four hours after midnight. Hill, who had not been available as a witness at the police court, being then on the way back from America in response to a cablegram from Crewe, reappeared as a witness. He looked much more at ease in the witness box than on the occasion when he gave evidence against Birchill. He had fully recovered from his terror of being arrested for the murder, and obviously had much satisfaction in giving evidence against the man who, according to his impression, had tried to bring the crime home to him. He gave evidence as to the unexpected return of his master from Scotland on the 18th of August, and also in regard to the relations between his master and Mrs. Holymead. On several occasions he had seen his master kiss Mrs. Holymead, and once he had heard the door of the room in which they were together being locked. The new witnesses were called to testify to the suggestion of the prosecution that illicit relations had existed between Sir Horace Fewbanks and Mrs. Holymead. These were Philip Williams, who had been the dead man's chauffeur, and Dorothy Mason, who had been housemaid at Riversbrook. The chauffeur gave evidence as to meeting Mrs. Holymead's car at various places in the country. He formed the opinion from the first that these meetings between Sir Horace and the lady were not accidental. The last of the prosecution's witnesses was the legal shorthand writer who had taken the official report of the trial of Birchill. In response to the request of Mr. Walters, he read from his notebook the final passage in the opening address delivered by the prisoner at that trial as defending counsel. It is my duty to convince you that my client is not guilty, or, in other words, to convince you that the murder was committed before he reached the house. It is only with the greatest reluctance that I take upon myself the responsibility of pointing an accusing finger at another man. In crimes of this kind you cannot expect to get anything but circumstantial evidence. 
but there are degrees of circumstantial evidence and my duty to my client lays upon me the obligation of pointing out to you that there is one person against whom the existing circumstantial evidence is stronger than it is against my client mr lethbridge was unexpectedly brief in his opening address he ridiculed the idea that a man like the prisoner trained in the atmosphere of the law would take the law into his own hands in seeking revenge for a wrong that had been done to him according to the prosecution the prisoner had calmly and deliberately carried out this murder he had sent a letter to sir horace fewbanks with the object of inducing him to return to london and had subsequently gone to riversbrook and shot the man who had been his lifelong friend could anything be more improbable than to suppose that a man of the accused's training intellect and force of character would be swayed by a gust of passion into committing such a dreadful crime like an immature ignorant youth of unbalanced temperament the discovery that his wife and his friend were carrying on an intrigue would be more likely to fill him with disgust than inspire him with murderous rage he would not deny that accused had gone up to riversbrook a few hours after sir horace fewbanks returned from scotland he would admit that when the accused sought this interview he knew that his quondam friend had done him the greatest wrong one man could do another but he emphatically denied that the prisoner killed sir horace fewbanks or threatened to take his life his learned friend had asked why had not the prisoner gone to the police after the murder was discovered and told them that he had seen sir horace at riversbrook that night the answer to that was clear and emphatic he did not want to take the police into his confidence with regard to the relations that had existed between his wife and the dead man he wanted to save his wife's name from scandal was not that a natural impulse for a high-minded man the prisoner had believed that in due course the police would discover the actual murderer and that in the meantime the scandal which threatened his wife's name would be buried with the man who had wronged her if the prisoner could have prevented it his wife's name would not have been dragged into this case even for the purpose of saving himself from injustice but the prosecution in order to establish a motive for the crime had dragged the scandal into light he did not blame the prosecution in the least for that in fact he was grateful to his learned friend for doing so for it had released him from a promise extracted from him by the prisoner not to make any use of the matter in his conduct of the case the defence was that although the accused man had gone to riversbrook on the night of the eighteenth of august to accuse sir horace fewbanks of base treachery he went there unarmed and with no intention of committing violence no threats were used and no shots were fired during the interview and in proof of the latter contention he intended to call witnesses to prove that sir horace fewbanks was alive after the prisoner had left the house the name of daniel kemp was loudly called by the ushers and when kemp crossed the court on the way to the witness-box chippenfield and crewe who had returned to the court after giving their evidence looked at one another he's a dead man whispered chippenfield nodding his head towards the prisoner if this is a sample of their witnesses kemp had brushed himself up for his appearance in the witness-box he wore a new ready-made tweed suit his thick neck was encased in a white linen collar which he kept fingering with one hand as though trying to loosen it for his greater comfort and his hair had been plastered flat on his head with plenty of cold water his red and scratched chin further indicated that he had taken considerable pains with the razor to improve his personal appearance in keeping with his unwanted part of a respectable witness in a place which knew a more sinister side of him as he stood in the witness-box 
awkwardly avoiding the significant glances that the Scotland Yard men and the police cast at him, he appeared to be more nervous and anxious than he usually was when in the dock. But Crewe, who was watching him closely, was struck by the look of dog-like devotion he hurriedly cast at the weary face of the man in the dock before he commenced to give his evidence. He told the court a remarkable story. He declared that Birchill had told him on the 16th of August that he had a job on at Riversbrook, and had asked him to join him in it. When Birchill explained the details, witness declined to have a hand in it. He did not like these put-up jobs. Mr. Lethbridge interposed to explain to any particularly unsophisticated jurymen that a put-up job meant a burglary that had been arranged with the connivance of a servant in the house to be broken into. Kemp declared that the reason he had declined to have anything to do with the project to burgle Riversbrook was that he felt sure Hill would squeak if the police threatened him when they came to investigate the burglary. He happened to be at Hampstead on the evening of the 18th of August, and he took a walk along Tanton Gardens to have another look at the place which Birchill was to break into. It had occurred to him that things might not be square, and that Hill might have laid a trap for Birchill. That was about 9.30 p.m., he was just able to catch a glimpse of the house through the plantation in front of it. The mansion appeared all in darkness, but while he looked, he was surprised to see a light appear in the upper portion of the house, which was visible from the road. He went through the carriage gates with the intention of getting a closer view of the house. As he walked along, he heard a quick footstep on the gravel walk behind him, and he slipped into the plantation. Looking out from behind a tree, he could discern the figure of a man walking quickly towards the house. As he drew near him, the man paused, struck a match, and looked at his watch, and he saw that it was Mr. Holymead. Witnesses' suspicions in regard to a trap having been laid for Birchill were strengthened, and he decided to ascertain what was in the wind. He crept through the plantation to the edge of the garden in front of the house. From there he could hear voices in a room upstairs. He tried to make out what was being said, but he was too far away for that. In about a half an hour the voices stopped, and a minute later a man came out of the house and walked down the path through the garden and entered the carriage drive close to where Witness was concealed in the plantation. As he passed him, Witness saw that it was Mr. Holymead. About five minutes afterwards the window upstairs, in the room where the voices had come from, was opened, and Sir Horace Fewbanks leaned out and looked at the sky as if to ascertain what sort of a night it was. He was quite certain that it was Sir Horace Fewbanks. He was well acquainted with that gentleman's features, having been sentenced by him three years ago. Sir Horace seemed quite calm and collected. Witness was so surprised to see him, after having been told by Birchill that he was in Scotland, that he did not take his eyes off him during the two or three minutes that he remained at the window, breathing the night air. Sir Horace was fully dressed. He had on a light tweed suit, and he was wearing a soft shirt of a light color, with a stiff collar and a small black bow tie. When Sir Horace closed the window, Witness jumped over the fence back into the wood and made his way to the Hampstead tube station with the intention of warning Birchill that Sir Horace Fewbanks was at home. He waited at the station over an hour, and as he did not see Birchill, he then made his way home. During the time he was in the garden at Riversbrook listening to the voices, he heard no sound of a shot. He was certain that no shot had been fired inside the house from the time the prisoner entered the house until he left. Had a shot been fired, witness could not have failed to hear it. There could be no doubt that the effect produced in court by the evidence of the witness was extremely favorable to the prisoner. Kemp had told a plain, straightforward story. 
the fact that he had shown no reluctance in disclosing in his evidence that he was a criminal and the associate of criminals seemed to add to the credibility of his evidence it was felt that he would not have come to court to swear falsely on behalf of a man who was so far removed from the class to which he belonged while kemp was giving his evidence crewe had dispatched a messenger to his chambers in holborn for joe when the boy returned with the messenger kemp was still in the witness-box undergoing an examination at the hands of the judge sir henry hodson seemed to have been impressed by the witness's story for he asked kemp a number of questions and entered his answers in his notebook joe whispered crewe as the boy stole noiselessly behind him look at that man in the witness-box have you ever seen him before rather governor whispered the boy in reply why it's him who tried to frighten me in the loft if i didn't promise to give up watching mr holymead you are quite certain joe certain sure governor there ain't no chance of me mistaken a man like that crewe listened intently to kemp's evidence and he watched the man's face as he swore that he had seen sir horace fewbanks leaning out of the window after holymead had left the house he hastily took out a notebook scribbled a few lines on one of the leaves tore it out and beckoned to a court usher take that to mr walters he whispered the man did so mr walters opened the note adjusted his glasses and read it he started with surprise read the note through again then turned around as though in search of the writer when he saw crewe he raised his eyebrows interrogatively and the detective nodded emphatically mr lethbridge sat down having finished his examination of kemp mr walters with another glance at crewe's note rose slowly in his place i ask your honour that i may be allowed to defer until the morning my cross-examination of this witness i am of course in your honour's hands in this matter but i can assure your honour that it is desirable highly desirable in the interest of justice that the cross-examination of the witness should be postponed i protest your honour against the cross-examination of the witness being deferred said mr lethbridge there is no justification of it i would urge your honour to accede to my request said mr walters it is a matter of the utmost importance is your next witness available mr lethbridge asked the judge surely your honour you are not going to allow the cross-examination of this witness to be postponed protested mr lethbridge my learned friend has given no reason for such a course sir henry hudson looked at the court clock it is now within a quarter of an hour of the ordinary time for adjournment he began i think the fairest way out of the difficulty will be to adjourn the court now until to-morrow morning there was a loud buzz of conversation when the court adjourned after asking chippenfield and rolfe to wait for him crewe made his way to mr walters and after a few whispered words with that gentleman mr mathers his junior and mr salter the instructing solicitor he returned to chippenfield and rolfe and asked them to accompany him in a taxicab to riversbrook what do you want to go out there for asked inspector chippenfield you don't expect to discover anything there this late in the day do you i want to find out whether this man kemp is lying or telling the truth of course he is lying replied the positive police official when you've had as much experience with criminals as i have had mr crewe you won't expect a word of truth from any of them well let us go to riversbrook and prove that he is lying said crewe we'll go with you said inspector chippenfield speaking for rolfe and himself he did not understand how crewe expected to obtain any evidence at riversbrook about the truth or falsity of kemp's story but he did not intend to admit that 
"'But you can set your mind at rest. "'No jury will believe Kemp "'after we've given them his record in cross-examination.' Rolfe, whose association with Crewe in the case had awakened in him a keen admiration for the private detective's methods and abilities, permitted himself to defy his superior officer to the extent of saying that the best way to prove Kemp a liar is to prove that his story is false. During the drive to Hampstead from the Old Bailey, the three men discussed Kemp and his past record. It was recalled that less than twelve months ago, while he was serving three years for burglary, his daughter had provided the newspapers with the sensation by dying in the dock while sentence was being passed on her. According to Inspector Chippenfield, who had been in charge of the case against her, she was a stylish, good-looking girl, and when dressed up might easily have been mistaken for a lady. She got in touch with the flash gang of railway thieves from America, said Inspector Chippenfield, helping himself to a cigar from Crewe's proffered case. They used to work the express trains, robbing the passengers in the sleeping berths. She was neatly caught at Victoria Station in calling for a dressing case that had been left at the cloakroom by one of the gang. Inside the dressing case was Lady Sinclair's jewel case, which had been stolen on the journey up from Brighton. The thief, being afraid that he might be stopped at Victoria Station when the loss of the jewel case was discovered, had placed it inside his dressing case, and had left the dressing case at the cloak room. He sent Dora Kemp for it a few days later, as he believed he had outwitted the police. But I'd got on to the track of the jewels, and after removing them from the dressing case in the cloak room, I had the cloak room watched. When Dora Kemp called for the dressing case and handed in the cloak room ticket, the attendant gave my men the signal, and she was arrested. She died of heart disease while on trial, didn't she? asked Crewe. Yes, replied Inspector Chippenfield. Sir Horace Fewbanks was the judge. He gave her five years, and no sooner were the words out of his mouth than she threw up her hands and fell forward in the dock. She was dead when they picked her up. She was as game as they make them, put in Rolf. We tried to get her to give the others away, but she wouldn't, though she would have got off with a few months if she had. The gang got frightened and cleared out. They left her in the lurch, but she wouldn't give one of them away. It was Holymead who defended her, said Chippenfield. It was a strange thing for him to do. Leading barristers don't like touching criminal cases, because, as a rule, there is little money and less credit to be got out of them. But Holymead did some queer things at times, as you know. He must have taken up the case out of interest in the girl herself, for I'm certain she hadn't the money to brief him. And I did hear afterwards that Holymead undertook to see that she was decently buried. "'Why, that explains it!' exclaims Crewe, in the voice of a man who had solved a difficulty. "'Explains what?' asked Inspector Chippenfield. "'Explains why her father has taken the risk of coming forward in this case to give evidence for Holymead.' gratitude for what Holymead had done for his girl while he was in prison. My experience of criminals is that they frequently show more real gratitude to those who do them a good turn than people in a respectable walk of life. Besides, you know what a sentimental value people of his class attach to seeing their kin buried decently. If Holymead hadn't come forward, the girl would have been buried as a pauper in all probability." "'But I don't see that old Kemp is taking much risk,' said Inspector Chippenfield. "'He is only perjuring himself, and he is too used to that to regard it as a risk.' "'Don't you think he will be in an awkward position if the jury were to acquit Holymead?' asked Crewe. "'One jury has already said that Sir Horace Fewbanks was dead when Birchill broke into the house.' And if this jury believes Kemp's story, and says Sir Horace was alive when Holymead left it, don't you think Kemp will conclude that it will be best for him to disappear? 
Someone must have killed Sir Horace after Holymead left, and before Birchill arrived. Phew! I never thought of that, said Rolfe candidly. Kemp is a liar from first to last, said Inspector Chippenfield decisively. End of chapter 30「Chapter thirty one of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Carl, St. Louis, Missouri, July two thousand eight. The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Reese. Chapter thirty one. When they reached Riversbrook, they entered the carriage drive and traversed the plantation until they stood on the edge of the Italian garden facing the house. The gaunt, irregular mansion stood empty and deserted, for Miss Fewbanks had left the place after her father's funeral, with the determination not to return to it. The wind whistled drearily through the nooks and crannies of the unfinished brickwork of the upper story, and a faint evening mist rose from the sodden garden and floated in a thin cloud past the library window, as though the ghost of the dead judge were revisiting the house in search of his murderer. The garden had lost its summer beauty, and was littered with dead leaves from the trees. The gathering grayness of an autumn twilight added to the dreariness of the scene. "'Kemp didn't say how far he stood from the house,' said Crewe, "'but we'll assume he stood at the edge of the plantation, "'about where we are standing now, to begin with. "'How far are we from that library window, Chippenfield?' "'About fifty yards, I should say,' said the inspector, measuring it with his eye. "'I should say seventy, said Rolfe. "'And I?' "'Say somewhere midway between the two, said Crewe with a smile. "'But we will soon see. "'Just hold down the end of this measuring tape, one of you.' "'He produced a measuring tape as he spoke, and started to unwind it, "'walking rapidly towards the house as he did so. Sixty-two yards,' he said as he returned. "'He made a note of the distance in his pocket-book. "'So much for that,' he said. "'But that's not enough.' I want you to stand under the library window, Rolf, by that chestnut tree in front of it, and act as pivot for the measuring tape while I look at that window from various angles. My idea is to go in a semicircle right round the garden, starting at the garage by the edge of the wood, so as to see the library window and measure the distance at every possible point at which Kemp could have stood." "'You're going to a lot of trouble for nothing. "'If your object is to try and prove that he couldn't have seen into the window,' "'grunted Inspector Chippenfield in a mystified voice, "'why, I can plainly see into the window from here.' "'Crew smiled, but did not reply. "'Followed by Rolfe, he went back to the tree by the library window, "'where he posted Rolfe with the end of the tape in his hand. "'Then he walked slowly back across the garden in the direction of the garage, "'keeping his eye on the library window on the first floor "'from which Kemp, according to his evidence, "'had seen Sir Horace leaning out after Holymead had left the house. "'He returned to the tree, noting the measurement in his book as he did so and then repeated the process, walking backwards with his eye fixed on the window, but this time taking a line more to the left. Again and again he repeated the process, until finally he had walked backwards from the tree in narrow segments of a big semicircle, finishing up on the boundary of the Italian garden on the other side of the grounds, and almost directly opposite to the garage from which he had started. "'There's no use going further back than that,' he said." turning to Inspector Chippenfield, who had followed him round, smoking one of Crewe's cigars, and very much mystified by the whole proceedings, though he would not have admitted it on any account. At this point we practically lose sight of the window altogether, except for an oblique glimpse. Certainly Kemp would not come as far back as this. He would have no object in doing so. "'I quite agree with you,' said Inspector Chippenfield. "'He would stand more in front of the house. "'The tree in front of the house doesn't obstruct the view of the window to any extent.' 
The tree to which Inspector Chippenfield referred was a solitary chestnut tree, which grew close to the house a little distance from the main entrance, and reached to a height of about forty feet. Its branches were entirely bare of leaves, for the autumn frosts and winds had swept the foliage away. Rolf, who had been watching Crewe's maneuvers curiously, walked up to them with the tape in his hand. He glanced at the library window on the first floor as he reached them. "'Kemp should have seen the library window if he had stood here,' he said. "'I should say that if the blind were up it would be possible to see right into that room.' "'What do you say, Chippenfield?' asked Crewe, turning to that officer. Inspector Chippenfield had taken his stand stolidly on the center path of the Italian garden, directly in front of the window of the library. "'I say Kemp is a liar,' he replied, knocking the ash off his cigar. "'A d d liar,' he added emphatically. "'I don't believe he was here at all that night.' "'But if he was here, do you think he saw Sir Horace leaning out of the window?' "'I don't see what was to prevent him,' was the reply. "'But my point is that he was a liar, and he wasn't here at all.' "'And you, Rolf, do you think Kemp could have seen Sir Horace leaning out of the window if he had been here?' "'I should say so,' remarked Rolf in a somewhat puzzled tone. "'I am sorry I cannot agree with either of you,' said Crewe. "'I think Kemp was here, but I am sure he couldn't have seen Sir Horace from the window.' "'Kemp has been up here during the past few days in order to prepare his evidence, "'and he's been led astray by a very simple mistake. "'If a man were to lean outside the library window now, "'there would not be much difficulty in identifying him. "'But when the murder took place, it would have been impossible to see him "'from any part of the garden or grounds. "'Why?' demanded Inspector Chippenfield. "'Because it was the middle of summer when Sir Horace Fewbanks was murdered.' At that time the chestnut tree would be in full leaf, and the foliage would hide the window completely. Look at the number of branches the tree has. They stretch all over the window, and even round the corners of that unfinished brickwork on the first floor by the side of the library window. A man could no more see through that tree in summer time than he could see through a stone wall. "'What did I tell you?' exclaimed Inspector Chippenfield, in a voice of a man whose case has been fully proved. "'Didn't I say Kemp was a liar? "'We'll call evidence in rebuttal to prove that he is a liar, and he couldn't have seen the window. "'And after Holymead is convicted, I'll see if I cannot get a warrant out for Kemp for perjury.' "'And yet Kemp did see Sir Horace that night.' said Crewe quietly. "'How do you know? What makes you say that?' The inspector was unpleasantly startled by Crewe's contention. "'He was able to describe accurately how Sir Horace was dressed, for one thing,' responded Crewe. "'He might have got that from Selden's evidence,' said Inspector Chippenfield thoughtfully. "'He may have had someone in court to tell him what Selden said.' "'You do not think Lethbridge would be a party to such tactics,' said Crewe. "'Oh, no. One could tell from the way he examined Selden and Kemp on the point that it was in his brief. "'But the fact that Kemp knew how Sir Horace was dressed doesn't prove that he saw Sir Horace after Holymead left the house,' said Rolf. "'Kemp may have seen Sir Horace before Holymead arrived.' "'Quite true, Rolf,' said Crewe. "'I haven't lost sight of that point.' "'I think you will agree with me that there is a bit of mystery here which wants clearing up.' They drove back into town, and, in accordance with the arrangement Crewe had made with Mr. Walters before leaving the court, they waited on that gentleman at his chambers in Lincoln's Inn. There Crewe told him of the result of their investigations at Riversbrook. Mr. Walters was professionally pleased at the prospect of destroying the evidence of Kemp. He was not a hard-hearted man, and personally he would have preferred to see Holymead acquitted, if that were possible, but as the prosecuting counsel he felt a professional satisfaction in being placed in a position to expose perjured evidence. "'Excellent! Excellent!' he exclaimed, rubbing his hands with gratification as he spoke. "'Knowing what we know now, it will be a comparatively easy task to expose the witness Kemp under cross-examination, and show his evidence to be false.' Mr. Walters looked as though he relished the prospect. 
It was arranged that Inspector Chippenfield should be called to give evidence and rebuttal as to the impossibility of seeing the library window through the tree, and that an arboriculturist should also be called. Mr. Walters agreed to have the expert in attendance at the court in the morning. But Crewe had something more on his mind, and he waited until Chippenfield and Rolfe had taken their departure in order to put his views before the prosecuting counsel. Then he pointed out to him that to prove that Kemp's evidence was false was merely to obtain a negative result. What he wanted was a positive result. In other words, he wanted Kemp's true story. "'Do you not think, then, that Kemp is merely committing perjury in order to get Holymead off?' asked Walters meditatively. "'You think he is hiding something?' Crewe replied, with his faint, inscrutable smile, that he had no doubt whatever that such was the case. He thought Kemp's true story might be obtained if Walters directed his cross-examination to obtaining the truth instead of merely to exposing falsehood. It was evident to him that Kemp had come forward in order to save the prisoner. How far was he prepared to go in carrying out that object? When he was made to realize that his perjury, instead of helping Holymead, had helped to convince the jury of the prisoner's guilt, would he tell the true story of how much he knew? "'My own opinion is that he will,' continued Crewe. "'I studied his face very closely while he was in the box today, and I am convinced he would go far, even to telling the truth, in order to save the only man who was ever kind to him.' Walters was slow in coming round to Crewe's point of view. He had a high opinion of Crewe, for in his association with the case he had realized how skillfully Crewe had worked out the solution of the Riversbrook mystery. But he took the view that now the case was before the court, it was entirely a matter for the legal profession to deal with. He pointed out to Crewe the professional view that his own duty did not extend beyond the exposure of Kemp's perjury. It was not his duty to give Kemp a second chance, an opportunity to qualify his evidence. He believed the defense had called Kemp, in the belief that his evidence was true, but the defense must take the consequences if they built up their case on perjured evidence which they had not taken the trouble to sift. Crewe entered into the professional view sympathetically, but he was not to be turned from his purpose. He felt that too much was at stake and he lifted the discussion out of the atmosphere of the professional procedure and into that of their common manhood. "'Walters, I know you are not a vain man,' he said earnestly. "'A personal triumph in this case means even less to you than it does to me. I have built up what I regard as an overwhelming case against Holymead, but it is based on circumstantial evidence, and I would willingly see the whole thing toppled over if by that means we could get the final truth. This man, Kemp, knows the truth, and you are in a position in which you can get the truth from him. It may be the last chance anyone will have of getting it. Apart from all questions of professional procedure, isn't there an obligation upon you to get at the truth? If you put it that way, I believe there is replied Walter slowly and meditatively. There was a pause, and then he spoke with a sudden impulse. Yes, Crewe, you can depend on me. I'll do my best. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 of The Hampstead Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees. Chapter 32. The public interest in the Holymead trial on the second day was even greater than on the first. It was realized that Kemp's evidence had given an unexpected turn to the proceedings and that if it could be substantiated, the jury's verdict would be not guilty. There were confident persons who insisted that Kemp's evidence was sufficient to acquit the prisoner, but everyone grasped the fact that the counsel for the prosecution, by his action in implying for an adjournment of the cross-examination of Kemp, clearly realized that his case was in danger if the evidence of the first witness for the defense could not be broken down. 
The public appetite for sensation, having been whetted by sensational newspaper reports of the latest phase of the Riversbrook mystery, there was a great rush of people to the Old Bailey early on the morning of the second day to witness the final stages of the trial. The queue in Newgate Street commenced to assemble at daybreak, and grew longer and longer as the day wore on but it was composed of persons who did not know that there was not the slightest possibility of their gaining admittance to number one court. The policeman who was invested with the duty of keeping the queue close to the wall of the building forbore to break this sad news to them. Being faithful to the limitations of the official mind, he believed that the right thing to do was to let the people in the queue receive this important information from the sergeant inside. How was he to know, without authority from his superior officer, that any of these people wanted to be admitted to number one court? So the policeman pared his nails, gallantly minding the places of pretty girls in the queue, who, worn out by hours of waiting in the cold, desired to slip away to a neighbouring tea-shop to get a cup of tea before the court opened, and sternly rebuking enterprising youths who endeavoured to wedge themselves in ahead of their proper place. The body of the court was packed before the proceedings commenced. The number of ladies present was even greater than on the first day, and the resources of the ushers were severely taxed to find accommodation for them all. In the back row, Crewe noticed Mrs. Holymead, accompanied by Mademoiselle Chiron. They had not been in court on the previous day. Mrs. Holymead seemed anxious to escape notice, but Crewe could see that although she looked anxious and distressed, she was buoyed up by a new hope, which doubtless had come to her since Kemp had given his evidence. There was an expectant silence in the court when Mr. Justice Hodson took his seat, and the names of the jurymen were called over. Kemp entered the witness-box with a more confident air than he had worn the previous day. Mr. Walters rose to begin his cross-examination, and the witness faced the barrister with the air of an old hand who knew the game, and was not to be caught by any legal tricks or traps. "'You said yesterday, witness,' commenced Mr. Walters, adjusting his glasses and glancing from his brief to the witness, and from the witness back to the brief again, that you saw the prisoner enter the gate at Riversbrook about 9.30 on the night of the 18th of August.' Yes. The monosyllable was flung out as insolently as possible. The speaker watched his interrogator with the lowering eyes of a man at war with society, and who realized that he was facing one of his natural enemies. Did he see you? No. Nope. You are quite sure of that. Haven't I just said so? Do not be insolent, witness. It was the judge's warning voice that broke into the cross-examination. Answer the questions. How long was it after the prisoner entered the carriage drive that you went to the edge of the plantation and heard voices upstairs? Continued Mr. Walters. I went as soon as Mr. Holomid passed me. How far were you from the house? About sixty yards. And from that distance you could hear the voices? Yes. Plainly? Not very. I could hear the voices but I couldn't hear what they were saying. Were they angry voices? They seemed to me to be talking loudly. Yet you couldn't hear what they were saying? No, I was sixty yards away. You said in your evidence, in chief, that the talking continued half an hour. Did you time it? No. Then what made you swear that? I said about half an hour. I smoked out a pipe full of tobacco while I was standing there, and that would be about half an hour. Kemp disclosed his broken teeth in a faint grin. What happened next? I heard the front door slam, and I saw somebody walking across the garden, and go into the carriage drive towards the gate. Did you recognize who it was? Yes, Mr. Holymead. Kemp looked at the prisoner as he gave the answer. You swear it was the prisoner? I do. Let me recall your evidence in chief witness. You swore that you identified Mr. Holymead as he went in, because he struck a match to look at the time as he passed you, and you saw his face. Did he strike matches as he went out? No. 
Then how are you able to swear so positively as to his identity in the dark? Kemp considered a moment before replying. Because I know him well, and I was close to him, he said at length. I was close enough to him almost to touch him. I knew him by his walk and by the look of him. It was him right enough. I'll swear to that. I put it to you, witness, persisted counsel, that you could not positively identify a man in a plantation at that time of night. Do you still swear it was Mr. Holymead? I do, replied Kemp doggedly. What did you do then? I stayed where I was. What for? I don't know. I didn't have any particular reason. I just stayed there watching. Did you think the prisoner might return? No, replied the witness quickly. Why should I think that? How long did you stay watching the house? It might be a matter of ten minutes more. And the prisoner didn't return during that time? No, replied the witness emphatically. What did you do after that? I went to the tube station. The prisoner might have returned after you left. I suppose he might, replied the witness reluctantly. Well, now, witness, you say you stayed ten minutes after Holymead left, and during that time Sir Horace opened the window and leaned out of it. Yes. You saw him distinctly? Yes. You are sure it was Sir Horace Fewbanks? Yes. Now, witness, said Mr. Walters, suddenly changing his tone to one of more severity than he had previously used, you have told us that you heard Sir Horace Fewbanks and the prisoner in the library while you stood in the wood by the garage, and that subsequently you saw Sir Horace leaning out of the window after the prisoner had gone. You are quite sure you were able to see and hear all this from where you stood? Yes. Are you aware, witness, that there is a large chestnut tree at the side of the library, in front of the window? Kemp considered for a moment. Yes, he said. And did not that tree obstruct your view of the library window? No. Witness, said Mr. Walters solemnly, listen to me. This tree did not obstruct your view when you went to Riversbrook a week or so ago to decide on the nature of the evidence you would give in this court. It is bare of leaves now, and you could see the library window and even see into the library from where you stood. But I put it to you that on the 18th of August, when this tree was covered with its summer foliage, you could no more have seen the library window behind its branches then you could have seen the inhabitants of Marsh. What answer have you got to that, witness? There was a slight stir in court, an expression of the feeling of tension among the spectators. Kemp drew the back of his hand across his lips, then moistened his lips with his tongue. Come, witness, give me an answer, thundered prosecuting counsel. I tell you I saw him after Mr. Holymead had left, declared Kemp defiantly. His voice had suddenly become hoarse. To the surprise of the members of the legal profession who were in court, Mr. Walters, instead of pressing home his advantage, switched off to something else. "'I believe you have a feeling of gratitude towards the prisoner?' he asked in a milder tone. "'I have,' said Kemp. His defiant, insolent attitude had suddenly vanished, and he gave the impression of a man who feared that every question contained a trap. He did something for a relative of yours, which at that time greatly relieved your mind. He did, and I'll never forget it. Well, we won't go further into that at present, but it is a fact that you would like to do him a good turn. Yes. You came here with the intention of doing him a good turn? Kemp considered for a moment before answering. Yes. You came here with the intention of giving evidence that would get him off? Yes. You came here with the intention of committing perjury in order to get him off? Mr. Walters waited, but there was no reply to the question, and he added, You see what your perjured evidence has done for him? "'What has it done?' asked Kemp sullenly. "'It has established the prisoner's guilt beyond all reasonable doubt in the minds of men of common sense. 
You did not see Sir Horace Fewbanks that night after the prisoner left him. You could not have seen him even if he had leaned out of the window. But your whole story is a lie, because Sir Horace was dead when the prisoner left him. He was not, shouted Kemp. I saw him alive. I saw him as plain as I see you now. The man in court who was most fascinated by the witness was Crewe. He had watched every movement of Kemp's face, every change in the tone of his voice. "'I wonder what the fool will say next,' whispered Inspector Chippenfield to Crewe. "'He will tell us how Sir Horace Fewbanks was shot,' was Crewe's reply. Mr. Walters approached a step nearer to the witness-box. "'You saw him as plainly as you see me now,' he repeated. "'Yes,' declared Kemp, who it was evident was labouring under great excitement. "'You say I came here to commit perjury if it would get him off,' he pointed with a dramatic finger to the man in the dock. "'I did, and I came here to get him off by telling the truth, if perjury didn't do it. You say I've helped to put the rope round his neck. "'But I'm man enough to tell the truth. "'I'll get him off, even if I have to swing for it myself.' This outburst from the witness-box created a sensation in court. Many of the spectators stood up in order to get a better view of the witness, and some of the ladies even jumped on their seats. Mr. Justice Hodson was momentarily taken aback. His first instinct was to check the witness and to ask him to be calm but the witness took no notice of him. He displayed his judicial authority by an impressive descent of an uplifted hand which compelled the unruly spectators to resume their seats. It was on Mr. Walters that Kemp concentrated his attention. It was Mr. Walters whom he set himself to convince, as if he were the man who could set the prisoner free. Of the rest of the people in court, Kemp, in his excitement, had become oblivious. "'Listen to me.' said Kemp, and I'll tell you who shot this scoundrel. He was a scoundrel, I say, and he ought to have been in jail himself instead of sending other people there. I went up to the house that night to see if everything was clear, or whether that Kerr Hill had laid a trap. That part of my evidence is true. And from behind a tree in the plantation I saw Mr. Holomead pass me. He struck a match to look at the time, and I saw his face distinctly. A few minutes afterwards I heard loud angry voices coming from somewhere upstairs in the house. I thought the best thing I could do was to find out what he was about. I said to myself that Mr. Holomid might want help. I walked across the garden and found that the hall door was wide open. I went inside and crept upstairs to the library. The light in the hall was turned on, as well as a little lamp on the turn of the staircase behind a marble figure holding some curtains, which led the way to the library. The library door was open an inch or two, and I listened. I could hear them quite plainly. Mr. Holomid was telling him what he thought of him. And no wonder. It made my blood boil to think of such a scoundrel sitting on the bench and sentencing better man than himself. I thought of the way in which he had killed my girl by giving her five years. It was the shock that killed her, five years for stealing nothing, for she didn't handle the jewels. And here he had been stealing a man's wife, and nothing said except what Mr. Holomead called him. I stood there listening in case they started to fight, and I might be wanted. But they didn't. I heard Mr. Holomead step towards the door, and I slipped away from where I had been standing. I saw the door of another room near me, and I opened it and went in quickly. I closed the door behind me, but I did not shut it. I looked through the crack and saw Mr. Holomead making his way downstairs. He walked as if he didn't see anything, and I watched him till he went through the curtains on the stairs at the bend of the staircase, and I could see him no more. Then I heard a step, and looking through the crack I saw the judge coming out of the library. He walked to the head of the stairs and began to walk slowly down them. But when he reached the bend, where the curtains and the marble figure were, he turned round and walked up the stairs again. He walked along as though he was thinking with his hands behind his back, and nodding his head a little, 
and a little cruel, crafty smile on his face. He passed so close to me that I could have touched him by putting out my hand, and he went into the library again, leaving the door open behind him. Then, suddenly as I stood there, the thought came over me to go in to him and tell him what I thought about him. I opened the door softly so as not to frighten him, and walked out into the passage and into the library, and as I did so I took my revolver out of my pocket and carried it in my hand. I wasn't going to shoot him, but I meant to hold him up while I told him the truth. He was standing at the opposite side of the room with his back towards me and a book in his hand, but a board creaked as I stepped on it, and he swung round quickly. He was surprised to see me and no mistake. "'What do you want here?' he said in a sharp voice, and I could see by the way he eyed the revolver that he was frightened. Then I opened out on him and told him off for the damned scoundrel he was, and he didn't like that either. He edged away to a corner, but I kept following him round the room, telling him what I thought of him. And seeing him so frightened, I put the revolver back in my pocket and walked close to him while I told him all the things I could think of. As I thought of my poor girl that he'd killed, I grew savage, and I told him that I had a good mind to break every bone in his body. He threatened to have me arrested for breaking into the place, but I only laughed and hit him across the face. He backed away from me with a wicked look in his eyes, and I followed him. He backed quickly towards the door, and before I knew what game he was up to, made a dart out of the room. But I was too quick for him. I got him at the head of the stairs and dragged him back into the room, and shut the door and stood with my back against it. I told him I hadn't finished with him. I had mastered him so quickly, and was able to handle him so easily, that I didn't watch him as closely as I ought to have done. He had backed away to his desk with his hand behind him, and suddenly he brought it up with a revolver in his hand. "'Now it's my turn,' he said to me with his cunning smile. "'Throw up your hands.' I saw then it was man for man. If I let him take me, I was in for a good seven years. I'd sooner be dead than do seven years for him. "'Shoot and be damned,' I said. I ducked as I spoke, and as I ducked I made a dive with my hand for my hip pocket, where I had put my revolver. He fired and missed. He fired again, but his toy revolver missed fire, for I heard the hammer click. But that was his last chance. I fired at his heart, and he dropped beside the desk. I didn't wait for anything more. I bolted. I got tangled in the staircase curtains and fell down the stairs. As I was falling, I thought what a nice trap I would be in if I broke my leg and had to lie there until the police came. But I wasn't much hurt, and I got up and dashed out of the house and over the fence into the wood, the way I came. He stopped, and his gaze wandered round the hushed court till it rested on the prisoner, who, with his hands grasping the rail of the dock, had leaned forward in order to catch every word. Kemp turned his gaze from the man in the dock to the man in the scarlet robe on the bench, and it was to the judge that he addressed his concluding words. You can call it murder. You can call it manslaughter. You can call it justifiable homicide. You can call it what you like. But what I say is that the man you have in the dock had nothing to do with it. It was me that killed him. Let him go and put me in his place. He held his hands outstretched with the wrists together, as though waiting for the handcuffs to be placed on them. End of chapter 32 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter thirty three of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde. The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Rees. Chapter thirty three. 
An hour after the trial, Crewe entered the chambers of Mr. Walters, K.C. "'I congratulate you on the way you handled him in the witness-box,' said Crewe, who was warmly welcomed by the barrister. "'You did splendidly to get it all out of him, and so dramatically, too.' "'I think it is you who deserves all the congratulations,' replied Walters. "'If it had not been for you, there would not have been such a sensational development at the trial, and in all probability Kemp's evidence would have got Holymead off.' "'Yes, I'm glad to think that Holymead would have got off even if I hadn't seen through Kemp,' replied Crewe thoughtfully. "'I made a bad mistake in being so confident that he was the guilty man.' The completeness of the circumstantial evidence against him was extraordinary, said Walters, to whom the legal aspects of the case appealed. Personally, I am inclined to blame Holymead himself for the predicament in which he was placed. If he had gone to the police after the murder was discovered, told them the story of his visit to Sir Horace that night, and invited investigation into the truth of it, all would have been well. No, said Crewe, in a voice which indicated a determination not to have himself absolved at the expense of another. The fact that he did not do what he ought to have done does not mitigate my sin of having had the wrong man arrested. The mistake I made was in not going to see him before the warrant was taken out. If I had had a quiet talk with him, I think I would have been able to discover a flaw in my case against him. What made me confident it was flawless was the fact that both his wife and her French cousin believed him to be guilty. Mademoiselle Chiron followed Holymead from the country on the 18th of August with the intention of averting a tragedy. She arrived at Riversbrook too late for that, but in time to see Sir Horace expire, and naturally she thought that Holymead had shot him. When Mrs. Holymead realized that I also suspected her husband, and had accumulated some evidence against him, she sent Mademoiselle Chiron to me with a concocted story of how the murder had been committed by a more or less mythical husband belonging to Mademoiselle's past. Ostensibly the reason for the visit of this extremely clever French girl was to induce me to deal with Rolf who had begun to suspect Mrs. Holymead of some complicity in the crime, but the real reason was to convince me that I was on the wrong track in suspecting Holymead. Of course she said nothing to me on that point. She produced evidence which convinced me that she was in the room when Sir Horace died, and, as I was quite sure that she believed Holymead to be guilty, I felt that there could be no doubt whatever of his guilt. It is one of the most extraordinary cases on record, one of the most extraordinary trials, said Walters. You blame yourself for having had Holymead arrested, but you have more than redeemed yourself by the final discovery, when Kemp was in the witness-box, that he was the guilty man. That was an inspiration. Hardly that, said Crewe with a smile. I knew when he swore that he had seen Sir Horace leaning out of the library window that he was lying. After the murder was discovered, I inspected the house and grounds carefully, and one of the first things of which I took a mental note was the fact that the foliage of the chestnut tree completely hid the only window of the library. Ah, but there is a difference between knowing Kemp was committing perjury and knowing that he was the guilty man. There is at least a distinct connection between the two facts, said Crewe, who, after his mistake in regard to Holymead, was reluctant to accept any praise. Kemp's description of the way in which Sir Horace was dressed showed that he had seen him. The inference that Kemp had been inside the house was irresistible. Sir Horace had arrived home at seven o'clock, and it was not likely that Kemp would hang about Riversbrook the scene of a prospective burglary, until after dark, which at that time of the year would be about eight-thirty. He must have seen Sir Horace after dark, and, in order to be able to say how the judge was dressed, he must have seen him at close quarters. The rest was a matter of simple deduction. 
Kemp, inside the house, listening to the angry interview between Holymead and Fewbanks, Kemp, with his hatred of the judge who had killed his daughter in the dock, and with his desire to do Holymead a good turn. I had previously had proof of that from my boy Joe, whom you have seen. Besides, Kemp fitted into my reconstruction of the tragedy on the vital question of time. How long did Sir Horace live after being shot? The medical opinions I was able to obtain on the point varied, but after sifting them I came to the conclusion that though he might have lived for half an hour, it was more probable that he had died within ten minutes of being hit. "'How is that vital?' asked Walters, who was keenly interested in understanding how Crewe had arrived at his conviction of Kemp's guilt. Holymead's appointment with Sir Horace at Riversbrook was for 9.30 p.m. The letter found in Sir Horace's pocket-book fixed that time. It was exactly 11 p.m. when he got into a taxi at Hyde Park Corner after his visit to Riversbrook. On that point the driver of the taxi was absolutely certain. I was so anxious for him to make it 11.30 that I went to see him twice about it. Assuming that Holymead arrived at Riversbrook at 9.30, I allowed half an hour for his angry interview with Sir Horace, half an hour for the walk from Riversbrook to Hampstead Tube Station, and half an hour for the journey from Hampstead to Hyde Park Corner, which would have involved a change at Leicester Square. As I could not induce the driver of the taxi to make Holymead's appearance at Hyde Park Corner 11.30 instead of 11, I had to admit that Holymead must have left Riversbrook at 10. But it was 10.30, according to Mademoiselle Chiron, when she found Sir Horace dying on the floor of the library. Therefore, if Holymead did the shooting, the victim's death agonies must have lasted half an hour or more. Medically, that was not impossible, but somewhat improbable. But a meeting between Kemp and Sir Horace, after Holymead had gone, filled in the blank in time. That came home to me yesterday, when Kemp was in the witness-box, committing perjury, in his determination to get Holymead off. I take it that the interview between Kemp and his victim lasted about twenty minutes. Therefore, Sir Horace was shot about ten-twenty, certainly before ten-thirty, for Mademoiselle heard no shots while nearing the house. "'You have worked it out very ingeniously,' said Walters. "'You must find the work of crime detection very fascinating. I am afraid that if I had been in your place, that is, if I had known as much about the tragedy as you do when Kemp was in the witness-box yesterday, I would not have seen anything more in his evidence than the fact that he was committing perjury in order to help Holymead. "'I think you would,' said Crewe. "'These discoveries come to one naturally as the result of training one's mind in a particular direction.' "'They come to you, but they wouldn't come to me,' said Walters, with a smile. "'But do you think Kemp's story of how Sir Horace was shot is literally true?' Do you think Sir Horace got in the first shot and then tried to fire again? If that is so, I don't see how they can hope to convict Kemp of murder. A jury would not go beyond a verdict of manslaughter in such a case. You handled Kemp so well that he was too excited to tell anything but the truth, said Crewe. Sir Horace fired first and missed. The bullet which Chippenfield removed from the wall of the library shows that, and he pulled the trigger again, but the cartridge which had been in the revolver for a considerable time, probably for years, missed fire. Here is a silent witness to the truth of that part of Kemp's story. Crewe produced from a waistcoat pocket one of the four cartridges he had removed from the revolver Mademoiselle Chiron had handed to him, and he placed it on the table. On the cap of the cartridge was a mark where the hammer had struck without exploding the powder. End of chapter 33 and end of the Hampstead Mystery